Section twenty four of The Life of Mozart, Volume One by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn, Section twenty four, Chapter ten, Part two. This opera takes an unquestionably higher rank both as to originality, technical skill, and vivid characterization than any that had preceded it. The seven personages, all drawn in firm outline with a sure hand, are not all comic characters. The part of Ramiro is avowedly written for a male soprano, probably for the celebrated Tommaso Consoli, who entered the Munich Capelle in 1744, and was summoned to Salzburg for the approaching festival performance. The part is throughout a serious one. Ramiro is the sentimental, unfortunate lover, who only becomes comic by his alternate hopes and fears, as, true to his first inclinations, he opposes Arminda's jealous resentment. In his first unimpassioned song he declares that, being scarcely healed from his first unhappy attachment, he recoils from all fresh enticements. He has not yet seen his faithless beloved again, the sight of whom afterwards causes him to forget all in the desire to win her. The cavatina renders the sentiment of true and hopeful love simply and tenderly. Finally, the resentment against his faithless mistress is expressed in an agitated air with strongly accentuated declamation and rapid changes of harmony. All three songs render consistently the exalted mood of a man of sentiment, whose passions, nevertheless, are not consumed by their own intensity. The individuality of the singer may doubtless have lent itself to this treatment of the part. This individuality is also evident in the fact that Ramiro's songs pay chief regard to the singer in the passages, and adhere closely to the older forms. But there is unmistakable progress in the richer and freer grouping of the subjects, and in the delicate feeling with which the digression in the middle movement is treated, and gradually led back to the main subject. Arminda stands next to Ramiro. As an imperious, passionate girl who ill-uses her faithful lover and runs after another man, she is more repulsive than comic. Musical characterization, by giving her violence an air of pettishness, has introduced a comic element into her first air, which brings the noble lady very near the soubrette. The air in which she threatens the Count with vengeance for his inconstancy has a caricatured expression of the pathetic, which parodies the manner of the opera seria, and might, therefore, produce a comic effect. The absence of all bravura in this part, in spite of the style of the songs, which seems to call for it, was no doubt to suit the particular singer, a seconda donna. The part of Sandrina was expressly written for Rosa Manservisi, who was highly thought of both as a singer and an actress. It is comic neither in intention nor fact. An unhappy woman of deep and delicate feelings, injured and deceived, is forced by adverse fate to dissimulate. The difficulties into which she is led by her disguise are not ludicrous but painful, and excite only sympathy. It was common at the time to introduce persons in situations of a sentimental character into opera buffa without any regard to the incongruity of different styles. The principal scena given to Sandrina at the close of the second act quite oversteps the boundary of opera buffa. Left deserted in the dark and gloomy forest, she gives vent to her despair in a song which strikingly expresses the breathless anguish of a tender, timid maiden in the face of unknown dangers. A characteristic passage for the violins. The agitated nature of which is increased by syncopated notes in the accompaniment, and by the strong accent thrown on the last fourth of every bar, goes through the whole movement of the allegro agitato in varied modulation. The voice comes in with detached exclamations, and once a melodious phrase silences the accompaniment for a moment, until the orchestra again takes up its restless movement. The song passes immediately into an expressive, accompanied recitative, in which Sandrina becomes calmer and assures herself, by looking round, of her forsaken condition. This is followed by the cavatina. Ah, dal pianto, dal singhiozzo, respirar io posso appena, non ho voce, non ho lena, l'alma in sen mancando va. Which carries the expression of long-restrained feeling to its highest point. Throughout a restless, hurrying, allegro agitato, the voice has almost always interrupted passages, and seldom tries its powers in a sustained note or a melodious phrase. The orchestra remains in continual motion. At first a tender violin passage is introduced, then the oboes and bassoons alternate with each other, and with the voice. The whole is a single, continuous thread of lovely melody, and richly varied harmony, with one fundamental idea as to its starting point, and upon it rests the magic of grace and beauty. To the expression of excited passion follows that of resignation. Both are manifestations of a tender nature, and noble indeed, but neither grand nor strong. Mozart's correct judgment led him to moderate the expression of passion in Sandrina to a degree befitting the heroine of a comic opera while giving due prominence to her dignity and grace when she appears as the gardener's girl. She displays her true self most unreservedly in the cavatina in which she bewails her unhappy love. 
gemme la tortorella lungi dalla compagna del suo destin si lagna e par che in sua favela vogli destar pietà io son la tortorella etc san leitner has noted the happy effect produced by the entrance of the voice not at the beginning of the theme but a little behind it as if roused from abstraction A gentle spirit, not altogether lost in sadness, yet not able entirely to throw it off, is, in Sandrina, united to tender womanly grace, and both find due expression in the music. Even when she plays the gardener's girl, she does it with pleasant mirth, never sinking to vulgarity. The air in which she undertakes the defense of women against men to Ramiro, a rondo with a lively coda, is gay and sparkling, but not very pronounced in tone. When she seeks by her cajoleries to appease the sulky podesta without exactly telling him that she loves him, she reveals a certain amount of coquetry, and in her exaggerated expressions of dismay at his reproaches, approaches the buffo character. But even here the moderation, delicacy, and grace of Sandrina's character is in strong contrast to that of Serpetta. Both the comic and the pathetic aspects are combined in the Contino Belfiore, whose burlesque character appears to have been excellently represented by the buffo Rossi. His attempt on Violante's life sets him before us as a man of passion. The wavering of his inclinations between Arminda and Violante is the less comical, since he expresses his admiration of Arminda's beauty with simple and manly dignity, but gives vent to his love for Sandrina, whom he recognizes as Violante, in a fine outburst of true emotion. The conclusion of this song, being buffo in character, readjusts the situation. He has not remarked that Sandrina has gone out, and the podesta taken her place, and he seizes the hand of the podesta to kiss it. His confusion and annoyance required comic expression. He takes part elsewhere in comic scenes and situations, but his first appearance as a vain, supercilious coxcomb is misleading and inconsistent, and only intended to give occasion for a grand buffo air. The pride and loquacity with which Belfiore details his genealogy are wittily rendered by Mozart, but as a buffo song this evident concession to the taste of the singer and the public is without marked individuality. Still less happy is the idea of making the contino, and afterwards Sandrina, go crazy. Madness is only representable in music in so far as sympathy with it as a misfortune can be aroused, which deprives it of any comic effect. The absurdities which excite to laughter cannot be rendered musically, and only in rare cases can music produce an analogous effect. In the second finale, when Sandrina and Belfiore, surrounded by bitter enemies, suddenly imagine themselves Arcadian shepherds and sing shepherd songs, a contrast might be produced which would at least support the idea of insanity. But their mythological illusions— io son medusa orribile io son alcide intrepido could not be expressed by the music in the tercet nardo in order to escape the importunities of the crazy pair points towards heaven and tells them with increasing animation how the sun and moon quarrel and the stars engage in love adventures when he has set the pair gazing fixedly upwards he makes off broadly represented this gay lively tercet must have made an effect but it would have been equally comic had nardo fixed their attention on anything else since the effect depends on the vivacity and humour with which the composer grasps the situation and withdraws the attention of the audience from the nonsense which the poet has put into the mouths of the characters but even this was impossible in the accompanied recitative during which belfiore loses his senses before the eyes of the audience at first when he is beset by contending emotions music is in its place when he believes himself to be dead in an elysium Mozart has certainly constructed a characteristic, well-rounded movement, but a specific expression of the illusion, it is not, and cannot be. The song in which, restored to his senses, he expresses his joy at still living, in tempo diminuito, is lively, and appears to the senses like dance music. But after what has gone before, it makes no comic impression. The first bar of this... reminds us, as San Leitner has remarked, both of the minuet and trio of the symphony in D major, Kirschel number 385, and a couple of bars in the first allegro of the symphony in E flat major, Kirschel number 543. The podesta is a genuine buffo, proud, amorous, consequential in virtue of his office, easily excited, easily perplexed, but good-natured at bottom, the genuine type of a comic old man. There was probably a personal reason for making this character tenor instead of bass, though the course was not an unusual one. The musical conception of the character is that of the traditional buffo. The first air depicts, according to a fashion of the time, different instruments, which are heard in the orchestra in a concerted accompaniment. This song has nothing in common with the situation or with the character of the podesta, and is an interpolation for the German version. The Italian text contains a song for Sandrina, 
dentro mio petto io sento which mozart composed as we learn from a letter of his father's who had it copied for chicaneder the other two songs are genuine buffo lively rapidly uttered a continual struggle between false dignity anger vexation and perplexity the servants are also according to custom comic personages serpetta contrasts with sandrina in want of refinement disappointed in her hopes of the podesta she becomes envious and spiteful to every one and especially to her lover nardo besides a neat pretty little song of which each character sings a verse she has two songs of a distinctly soubrette character gay and pleasing not without grace but as yet without the delicate wit with which mozart later endowed his soubrettes nardo as the attached and faithful servant of violante displays an address which is inconsistent with his role of the simple lover who pursues serpetta in spite of all her ill-treatment the first words of the mock heroic air a forza di martelli il ferro si riduce have suggested an accompaniment which gives the song a peculiarly rhythmical character in the second air the rondo form is employed with striking effect nardo seeks to win serpetta's hand by compliments in different languages and styles which form alternating interludes to the main theme this is pretty enough but the other jokes are obsolete the ensembles are of a far higher character than the solos both as regards characterization and musical execution the introduction is immediately connected with overture and borrows its lively chorus from the third movement but its development is completely independent the overture itself consists of an allegro molto precise in its subjects and execution but fresh and cheerful and of a somewhat tedious andante grazioso sandrina serpetta ramiro the podesta and nardo are discovered in the garden awaiting the arrival of the wedding guests and their festive mood is expressed by a joyous choral movement then each character in a short soliloquy explains the position of affairs and indicates the main elements of the plot in these soli which pass from one to the other in the same tempo and without a pause mozart has displayed his rare power of individualization and without the sacrifice of interdependence in the parts of a great whole the moonstruck ramiro the amorous podesta the excitable prying serpetta each is admirably touched off without any disregard to unity of tone the repetition of the first chorus with which the piece concludes is led up to by the accompaniment and the whole forms as complete a musical rendering of the text as was possible the later ensembles belong immediately to the action of the piece at the close of the third act sandrina and belfiore awake from refreshing sleep healed of their madness belfiore seeks acceptance of sandrina who now acknowledges herself to be violante but she abashed at his declarations of love bids him depart and prepares to go herself neither however can summon resolution to part and after several attempts they sink at last in one another's arms forgetful of all but their newly found happiness this situation somewhat coarsely rendered by the poet has been transformed by the composer into an admirable piece of character painting a long accompanied recitative passes into an elaborate and effective andaggio in which professions of love alternate with reproaches the andantino which follows is lighter in tone and well expresses alternations of repulsion and attraction the oboes are employed with a charming effect of longing appeal to the words continuo lei mi chiama sandrina signor no lei ritoma continuo oi bo oi bo finally the joy of the united pair flows forth in an allegro which gives full opportunity for displays on the part of the singers especially to be admired is the art with which the intense and genuine expression of emotion is tempered by the timidity of the count and the coquetry of sandrina in a happy union of the pathetic and the comic which keeps the whole within the limits of opera buffa the rapid winding up of the plot in the recitative dialogue and the short animated ensemble with which the opera concludes are no doubt intended not to weaken the effect of the great duet the finales of the first and second acts are masterpieces the separate characters act and react on each other in a way which is admirably true to life two conditions are essential to the elevation of such pieces into musical works of art important points in the action or the characters must be brought out by prominent motifs and the fundamental idea of the situation must be grasped and maintained in one motif which shall serve as a clue to the whole the task of the musician is the combination and elaboration of the detached elements into an interdependent whole in which the laws of musical and dramatic art are in unconscious harmony the master makes good his claim to the title by the depth with which he grasps the idea by the delicacy with which he apportions the claims of individuals to independence and by the strength and truth with which he gives life to his creations mozart's genius amply satisfies all these conditions when there are few characters and they are consequently brought nearer together the characteristics of each are sharper and more detailed but when the relations of the characters to each other are more involved the musical grouping becomes more careful 
so that, just as in an architectural masterpiece, the parts are merged in the whole. Each motif has its own peculiar expression, but is capable of such manifold effects of light and shade that an oft-used motif in a new combination is as effective as if it appeared for the first time. The form and style of opera buffa are maintained in all essential points, but with great freedom of treatment. The usual means are employed of the repetition of a short phrase with increasing intensity, the parlando while the orchestra carries on the motif, the comic effect produced by rapid speaking, sudden pauses, strong contrasts, etc. But to these are added many traits of original invention. In the earlier operas, the boy's skill in the management of accepted forms was what we had chiefly to notice. Here, for the first time, we are amazed at the originality of his musical powers. The wealth of characteristic, well-molded, well-rounded melodies is quite as surprising as the organic dependence in which they mutually stand related to each other, not merely joined together. This fertility is, of course, more prominent as the development of the plot renders the musical elements more complicated. Especially admirable is Mozart's power of giving character and suggestiveness to his melodies in their first and simplest form. One subject from the last allegro, but one of the first finale. Will not fail to remind the reader of one almost identical from the first finale of Figaro. But if the mode of treatment of the simple motif in the two instances be compared, it will be clearly seen that inventive power does not consist merely in the combination of notes. That of the later opera is of course by far superior, but even the earlier leaves little to wish for in its wealth of harmonic variety, in its union with other subjects, and in the effect of climax produced by imitation in the several parts. It may finally and with justice be maintained of the melodies of this opera that they, as well as the whole intellectual conception, are high above the ordinary level. Their grace, delicacy, and purity, in short, their beauty, belongs to Mozart and to him alone. The orchestra is treated quite otherwise than in the opera seria. The individual peculiarity of each instrument is brought out, and tone coloring as a means of characterization is delicately and skillfully employed. In Sandrina's Cavatina, for instance, the fine effect of the oboe and bassoon in contrast to the violin is due to the individualities of the instruments. In Ramiro's song, the treatment of the bassoon is original, and in the first finale an oboe comes in with startling effect. The Munich oboist, Secchi, was very famous. The horns are also frequently made the means of effective tone coloring. Twice four horns are employed in a minor key to heighten the effect of a dramatic climax. More important than these detached instances is the altered relation of the orchestra to the whole work. It no longer serves as an accompaniment in the sense of sustaining the voices and filling up necessary pauses. It is no longer a mere adjunct to the vocal parts, but takes its share in the effective working of the whole, filling out details which the vocal parts leave imperfect, and obeying not so much the requirements of the vocalist as the conditions of artistic perfection. This altered relationship required an altered organization. Each component part of the orchestra must have a distinct existence, so that each, according to its place and kind, might contribute to the general effect. The single example of the treatment of the basses will serve to make this clear. Hitherto the basses had served merely as the fundamental of the melody, indispensable indeed, but often clumsy and insignificant. But here, without losing their character as the groundwork of harmonic elaboration, they have an independent movement. They serve not only to support the superincumbent mass, but their quickening power sets in motion and gives the impulse to its formation. By the side of these many excellencies, the too great length of most of the pieces, especially of the songs, is felt as a defect throughout a defect due, no doubt, to the taste of the time and to the youth of the composer. The influence of the broader form of the opera seria and the pleasure of the public in the mere hearing of music were combined with the fact that Mozart was not yet capable of that self-criticism which rejects all that is superfluous, even when it is good in itself. It may well be conceived that the opera was performed with extraordinary success in Munich, 1775, and that it soon attained preeminence among the most admired contemporary comic operas. Niesen informs us that it made little effect in Frankfurt, 1789. The clumsy German adaptation may have been in part to blame for this, but the chief cause was doubtless the altered taste of the public, brought about by the French operettas and Mozart's and Furong. End of section 24, chapter 10, part 2. Section 25 of The Life of Mozart, volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn, Section 25, Chapter 11. The last opera of the series we have been considering is the festival opera Il Re Pastore, composed in honor of the Archduke Maximilian at Salzburg in 1775, to the text of Metastasio, Kershaw number 208. The characters and plot are as follows. Alessandro, re di Macedonia. Aminta, pastorello, amante de Lisa, che, ignoto a se stesso, si scuopre poi l'unico legittimo rede del regno di Sidone. Elisa, nobile ninfa di Fenicia, dell'antica stirpe di Cadmo, amante d'Aminta. Tamiri, principessa fuggitiva, figliola del tiranno Stratone, in abito di pastorella, amante di Agenore. Agenore, nobile di Sidone, amico di Alessandro, amante di Tamiri. Alexander, having conquered Sidon and slain the tyrant Strabo, determines to place on the throne Abdalamanus, son of the last rightful king, who has been secretly brought up as a shepherd under the name of Aminta by a faithful dependent of his father. At the opening of the piece we find him in the midst of his flocks, while Elisa brings him the joyful tidings of the probable consent of her parents to their union. She has scarcely left him when Alexander, conducted by Agenore, enters, in order to convince himself if Aminta is worthy of the throne he intends to offer him. Aminta's virtuous moderation stands every test. While he is watering his flocks, there enters Tamiri, Strabo's daughter, disguised as a shepherdess. Agenore extols to her Alexander's generosity, and promises to intercede on her behalf. The assurance of his faithful love consoles her, and she resolves to await his answer, concealed by Elisa. Elisa now enters, bearing to Aminta her father's full consent to their union. In the midst of their transport, Agenore makes Aminta acquainted with his destiny, hands him the crown, and summons him to the presence of Alexander. The lovers pledge their faith anew with much rejoicing. In the second act, Elisa and Tamiri come to the camp of Alexander in order to see their lovers. Tamiri, unable to overcome her fear, withdraws. Elisa seeks in vain to speak to Aminta, Agenore informing her that Aminta is occupied with more important concerns, at the same time that he respectfully reminds Aminta, who is impatient to find Elisa, of his duties as a monarch. At last Alexander appears and receives the grateful homage of Aminta, who expresses most virtuous resolutions for his future rule. On Alexander expressing regret that Tamiri should shun his presence, Agenore takes the opportunity of acquainting Alexander with her near approach. To Agenore's dismay, Alexander resolves to unite her with Aminta. With the idea, however, that this will conduce to Tamiri's happiness, Agenore controls his desires and counsels Aminta to renounce Elisa. Before the unwilling lover is convinced, Tamiri and Elisa enter, and, seeing their lovers stand confused and silent, believe them to be faithless. At the opening of the third act, Aminta, after many scruples, informs Agenore of his determination to fulfill the duty which he believes himself to owe to Alexander. These tidings are carried by Agenore to Elisa, who refuses to doubt Aminta's truth, and will not be persuaded that submission to her fate will best prove her love for Aminta. Agenore's own constancy is put to a severer test when Tamire vehemently accuses him of having deserted her for Aminta's sake, but he remains firm. Then there appears before Alexander, who is preparing for the celebration of the union, First Tamiri, who declares her love for Agenore, and refuses to break her faith with him, even for the sake of a throne. Then Elisa, who tells the claims she has on Aminta's heart. And finally Aminta himself, dressed as a shepherd, returns his crown to Alexander, being unable to renounce Elisa's love. Moved by all this nobleness and devotion, Alexander unites the lovers, reinstates Aminta as king of Sidon, and promises to conquer another realm for Agenore. Metastasio wrote this opera in 1751 for performance at court by four maids of honor and a cavalier. He paid due regard to fitting costumes, and to the virtue and nobility of each character. The pains he took at the rehearsals were requited. Bono's music was excellent, the scenery and costumes most brilliant, the noble performers acquitted themselves to perfection, and all was applause and approbation. No wonder that he recommended the piece to Farinelli as a suitable festival opera. It has, in fact, been composed very often since. It was considerably curtailed for representation at Salzburg. The second and third acts were compressed into one, whereby not only was the dialogue abridged, but several songs were omitted without serious injury to the text. There were other small alterations and some few additions, but nothing essential was disturbed. Instead of Aminta's first air, Act One, Scene Two, another was introduced with an accompanied recitative, and before the duet at the end of the first act, an accompanied recitative was omitted. Instead of the short concluding chorus, a kind of finale was inserted, 
in which soli and tutti alternate. The part of Agenore was given to a tenor, a minta to the male soprano consoli. Beyond this we know nothing of the cast or of the performance. Mozart's composition, of which the original score in two volumes of 284 pages has been preserved, has the same finish of execution and invention which was so marvelously seen in the Finta Giardiniera, but the conventionalities of form are far more of a hindrance here than in the previous work. No scope was allowed for dramatic force or true passion. The work must be kept strictly within the limits of the festival opera. The Salzburg singers, too, seem to have preferred the beaten track to any extraordinary displays of skill. This is most apparent in the tenor part of Alexander. His three songs, whose commonplace virtuous reflections give little scope for musical treatment, have, like the regular bravura songs, a long ritornello, bravura passages, the shake at the end, and the usual cadenza. In details, the effort to metamorphose the form is apparent. The second part appears as a second subject, and the passages are made more interesting by their harmonic treatment, and by the prominence given to the accompaniment. The melodies are better built up. They have more musical substance. The accompaniment takes up detached portions of the chief melodies, and gives a firmer connection to the parts. The words of the first air give occasion for some of the then-favorite musical painting. Lightning, thunder, and rain are depicted by the orchestra, but without undue prominence. The second air is interesting through the obligato treatment of the wind instruments. The flute competing with the voice in passages. Johann Baptist Becker, born in 1743, who had been trained under Wendling to become an admirable flautist, was summoned from Munich for this performance. The third air is in the serious conventional style, not wanting in dignity. More individuality is given to the parts of Aminta and Elisa. At first the prevailing element is pastoral, as was usual in festival operas. The overture, consisting of one movement, molto allegro, leads directly to Aminta's first song, by a pleasant pastoral melody. It is a simple shepherd song, characterized by its six-eight time, and by the flute and horn accompaniment. For the better contentment of the singer, the soprano consuli from Munich, his second song is a genuine bravura, and its division into a brilliant allegro aperto and an elegant grazioso, as well as in details, the old style is apparent. But all is so much freer, fuller, and in spite of its fragmentary construction, so much more connected, that one feels a new spirit floating through the obsolete forms. Aminta's last air, when he declares himself true to his love, shakes itself quite loose from the fetters. It has the rondo form. The principal theme, twice relieved by an interlude, recurs three times, and winds up with a coda. The beauty of this cantilene is enhanced by a violin solo, written doubtless for Brunetti, equally simple and tuneful in style. The muted strings accompany the principal subject with a slightly agitated passage, the wind instruments, two flutes, two English horns, two bassoons, and two horns, are treated independently, and as delicately and tenderly as the tone of the piece requires. Elisa's first song unites in a singular degree the pastoral with the bravura character. The noble lady depicts the happiness of living as a shepherdess near her beloved Aminta. The traditional form has been so skillfully modified, and an almost playful grace is so freshly and charmingly expressed that this song may justly be placed on a level with some of Mozart's later concert songs. The second air is more strictly according to rule. The situation does not lend itself to freedom of treatment, and Mozart has contented himself with composing a harmonious and effective song. The duet between Elisa and Aminta at the close of the first act is light and pleasing, surpassing former efforts of the same kind in its clever management of the voices and in the originality of its subject. It is a charming idea and an appropriate one to carry on the subject of the andante with altered rhythm into the allegro. The parts of Tamiri and Agenore are quite secondary, scarcely more than stop-gaps. Tamiri's first air is a bravura song of the ordinary type. The second is almost soubrette-like in its airy lightness. Agenore's first air is tender and pleasing, not much in accord with the situation. His second air is pathetic, in a minor key, and stands alone of its kind. Restless agitation is portrayed by a varied and striking harmony, emphasized by strongly accented chords for the wind instruments, four horns besides oboes and bassoons. But neither the character of Agenore nor the moralizing words give any opening for pathos. The finale consists of a brilliant four-part tutti movement, which is repeated entire or in part several times. Passages for single voices are inserted, alternating cleverly and with a pleasing effect. Mozart's evident longing to break loose from the fetters of conventionality and tradition is nowhere more apparent than in the accompaniment and in the orchestral movements, where we find a fullness and freedom of thought hitherto only shown in detached passages. Even when the old fashion is retained of employing only oboes and horns, there is an evident appreciation of the special powers of the instruments expressed 
it may be, in a few notes. The orchestra has its own significance, and Mozart turns to account his intimate knowledge of the orchestra of opera seria. Trifling as these instrumental effects may appear, the main point, the instrumental music was henceforth to take an active part both in serious and comic opera, was one of great importance in the history of their development. End of section 25, chapter 11. Section 26 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart, by Otto Jahn. Section 26, Chapter 12. We must here cast a glance at a number of separate songs composed by Mozart, either for insertion in operas or for performance at concerts. The earliest of them, composed for the two Licenze at Salzburg, and those belonging to the first Italian journey, call for no special remark. Yet there occurs in the air composed at Rome, Se tutti mali miei, Kerschel number 183, a change of key produced by enharmonic progression which deserves to be noticed. Such songs are known to belong to the years immediately following, but in 1775 we find several composed at Salzburg, probably for performance by foreign vocalists visiting the city. Two tenor airs belong to May 1775. In one of them, described as Aria Buffa, Kerschel number 210, the singer is supposed to be flattering someone to his face with the greatest fluency, while he makes all sorts of rude remarks aside. Con osequio con rispetto, io mi anch'io e mi profondo ad un sapiente si sì perfetto che l'egual non ve nel mondo e l'eguale non verrà per l'orgoglio e l'ignoranza e la gran bestialità the orchestra maintains a single theme allegro assai without intermission and the voice is almost throughout parlando in rapid vivacity the union of a certain amount of dignity with burlesque fluency of tongue is very comical, the whole song being simply conceived and easily and consistently worked out. This song could only have been meant for performance on the stage, and the second, Kerschel number 209, Si mostra la sorte propizia l'amante, is scarcely of importance enough for a concert room. It is the complaint of a bashful lover, but has so little pathos as to be only suitable for opera buffa. It is simple both in design and execution, and may have been inserted to suit the powers of some singer in the place of another song. It was no doubt also for insertion in an opera buffa that an air for Dorina, Kerschel number 217, Voi avete un cor fidele, was composed, October 26, 1775. It is in the style of a soubrette superior to those of its kind in the Finta Giardiniera, and equal to Despina's songs in Così fan tutte. An andantino grazioso and an allegro, the latter considerably elaborated, are both repeated, then a few bars of the andantino recur, and the whole is wound up by a rather long coda in allegro. The exact repetition of both movements makes the effect of the whole somewhat stiff, but the details are fresh, animated, and very characteristic. The tone of melting tenderness at the beginning, the mocking parlando of the questions, and the final fervency of the words, ah, non credo, are so strikingly expressed, and the whole effect is so cheerful and even droll, that we cannot fail to recognize the hand of a master of his art. The subjects and the passages in the allegro are neat and graceful, and the orchestral parts are lively and appropriate. A tenor song, Kerschel number 256, Clarice cara mia sposa, composed for Signor Palmini, September 1776, is a true theatrical buffo air, and bears lively testimony to Mozart's comic talent. A capitano prates nonsensically, with much swagger, of how he will have his own way in spite of everybody. A Don Timoteo seeks in vain to interrupt the flow of his talk, which seems to run over in an unintermittent succession of triplets falling like heavy rain and, as it were, drenching the hearer in an instant. The monotonous parlando is provided with just so much of melody as to indicate that it is sung, not spoken. The orchestra maintains a very simple subject. With varied harmonies, in a light, even sketchy manner, but with considerable musical interest. Even the few words in recitative, thrown in by Don Timoteo, do not allow the singer to take breath, and only serve to make the next paroxysm still more comical. Another song, composed in the same month for the Alto Fortini, may have been intended for performance at a concert. Mozart justly considered this song worthy to live, for he writes from Vienna, April 12, 1783, to beg that the rondo for an alto voice, 
may be sent to him which he had composed when the Italian troop were at Salzburg. The idea is the usual one of leave-taking of a disconsolate lover. The introduction is a not very long but an expressive recitative. The transition from this to the air itself is charming and very touching. It is the involuntary expression of the pain of parting welling out from the innermost depths of the heart. of the song andante moderato and allegro assai are repeated then the andante recurs for the third time makes its way through an allegretto to the allegro assai and from this a subject is selected which leads through an effective crescendo to a pause on the seventh then the opening bars of the andante are repeated stop short and the song is rapidly concluded by the allegro the hesitation and irresolution of the lover who cannot bring himself to depart find ready expression in this change of movement a deep calm and restrained emotion corresponding admirably to the character of an alto voice, is well portrayed by the simple, unornamented song, interrupted only by the stronger accents of intense grief. The orchestral accompaniment is so managed as skillfully to heighten the peculiar effect of an alto voice. Repeated mention is made in the letters of the year 1777, and afterwards, of a scena composed for Madame Duchec. In the summer of 1777, Josepha Dolchec, a singer and pianoforte player of celebrity, and a young, vivacious woman, came for a visit from Prague to Salzburg. The foundation was laid for a friendship with Wolfgang, of which we shall frequently have occasion to speak. The scena in question is probably the grand aria of Adromeda, Kerschel number 272, Ah, lo previdi, belonging to August 1776, not long before his departure from Salzburg, in one of the greatest compositions of the kind. An agitated recitative is followed by a long, elaborate allegro, expressive of the passion of a brave and noble mind, scorn for perfidy overpowers even pain at the loss of the beloved one tones which seem to scorch and wither pour forth like glowing metal on the betrayer then comes a subject which has already made itself heard more than once in the orchestra as a cry of suppressed pain and this leads to a gentler mood grief for the lost love is expressed in a beautiful recitative and dies away into calm and composed melancholy with a cavatina which concludes the scena the psychological truth of the details the blending of the transitions, the unity of the tone, are qualities quite as much to be admired in this song as the musical originality and skill displayed in its composition. The last movement is perhaps a little spun out, although the train of long-continued violent emotion seems to require a correspondingly gradual cessation. The orchestra is as simply managed as in the earlier songs. For wind instruments, only horns, bassoons, and oboes are employed, with, more seldom, flutes. In the recitatives, there are only stringed instruments. It is indicative of the taste of the time that among so many vocal compositions the song proper seldom or never appears. Five very simple leader with clavier accompaniments belong to the earlier Salzburg epoch, Kerschel numbers 147 to 151. They are more pedantic than any other of the compositions and interest us chiefly through the words by Gunther and Kanitz, which Mozart has selected for composition. The years of Mozart's development at Salzburg were fruitful not only of operatic compositions, but of others which arose from the circumstance of his residence there. First among these stands church music. Church music had long been fostered at Salzburg, and was especially encouraged by Archbishop Sigismund. His severe and world-condemning piety caused him to keep the service of the church continually before the eyes both of singers and composers. The prospect of a moderate pension induced many clever artists to settle in Salzburg, in spite of the poor payment they received for their services. Sigismund's successor, Hieronymus, extended his parsimony even to the members of the Capelle, whom he estranged by his overbearing manners. On the whole, music rather declined than advanced under his rule, although he cared more than Sigismund for the splendor of his court. End of section 26, chapter 12section 27 of the life of mozart volume 1 by otto jan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the life of mozart by otto jan section 27 chapter 13 part 1 15 choristers were maintained at the cost of the archbishop in the capel house and educated by special instructors they afterwards entered the choir as singers or passed into the service of the court if they showed extraordinary talent, they were sent to finish their training in Italy, and then took their place as solo-singers. 
Archbishop Sigismund allowed the male sopranos to die out and did not replace them with others. On the other hand, he sent the daughter of the cathedral organist, Maria Magdalene Lipp, to be educated as a singer in Italy, and on her return in 1762 he appointed her court singer. She soon afterwards married Michael Hayden, lately arrived at Salzburg. In 1778, Hieronymus again took a male soprano into his service, Antonio Ceccarelli, a singer of moderate powers and bad moral character. The orchestra belonging to the choir was an ample one for the time, and was strengthened by a trumpet band for the support of the voices in the church. There were further two bands of six trumpets and drums, which did not properly belong to the court, but to the chamberlain's office, and which ranked between the equerries and the lackeys. But no one was taken into this service who could not also, at need, strengthen the stringed instruments. In 1762, when Lully was Kapellmeister, and Leopold Mozart vice-Kapellmeister, John Michael Hayden, 1737 to 1806, the younger brother of Joseph, was appointed concertmeister and director of the orchestra on the recommendation of a nephew of Archbishop Sigismund, at Grossverdein, where Hayden had been Kapellmeister since 1757. The personal intercourse between the families of Hayden and Mozart was not overly friendly. Hayden was fond of sitting over a glass of beer or wine, which was all the more reprehensible in the sight of the temperate and conscientious Mozart, since it caused frequent neglect of duty. "'Who do you think,' he writes to Wolfgang, December ninth, 1777, "'is appointed organist at the Holy Trinity? Herr Hayden! Everyone laughs. He is an expensive organist. After every litany he drinks a quartern of wine.' and he sends a lip to the extra services, who drinks too. June ninth, 1778. This afternoon Hayden played the organ for the litany in the Te Deum, at which the archbishop was present, but so badly that we were all horrified. Hayden will drink himself to death soon, or at least being lazy enough already, he will become still lazier the older he gets. The conduct of Frau Hayden also must have been objectionable. Wolfgang writes mockingly to Bullinger, August seventh, 1778, it is quite true that Hayden's wife is ill. She has carried her rigors too far. There are few like her. I only wonder that she has not lost her voice long ago through her constant scourgings, wearing of sackcloth, prolonged fasts, and midnight prayers. Neither was Hayden's cultivation such as to cause Leopold Mozart to wish for nearer intercourse between the families. I should like to hear him speak Italian in Italy, he writes, December 4, 1777. The people would certainly say, Questo è un vero tedesco. Personal difference and trifling jealousies, such as easily arise in small communities, may have had some influence on this unfavorable criticism of Michael Hayden. It did not extend, however, to his merits as an artist. It is true that Leopold Mozart was of opinion, when Michael Hayden, in 1787, composed the opera Andromeda e Perseo, that he had no talent for dramatic music, and that his principal songs might have been written for a choir-boy. But he praised in strong terms the entracte music for Zaire which Hayden had composed in 1777, and analyzed it carefully, telling his son that the archbishop had done him the honor to say to him at table that he could not have believed Hayden capable of composing such music, and that instead of beer he should drink nothing but burgundy. Hayden received a reward of six Krontaler, October 1st and October 9th, 1777, but when Leopold Mozart writes to his son, Herr Hayden is a man whose musical merits you will not deny, September 24th, 1778, he is referring to his church music, which Wolfgang was in the habit of copying for study. Writing from Vienna, he asks for small paper, Eberlin's counterpoint, bound in blue, and some of Hayden's things. And shortly after, March 12, 1783, the Tres Sunt, Monsieur Hayden's, is in score in my handwriting. He wanted these things for the Sunday performances at Van Sveeten's, and asked also for Michael Hayden's latest fugue. The Lauda Scion, he writes, March 12, 1783, was a great success. The fugue, In te domine speravi, was much admired, as also the Ave Maria in the Tenebre. Among Mozart's remains were found two fugues, Pinus Fiture Gloriae, copied by his own hand from Michael Hayden's litanies. The cathedral organist, appointed in 1751, was Anton Cayetan Adelgasser, 1728 to 1777, a pupil of Eberlin, who had been sent by the archbishop to study in Italy, a first-rate organ player and accompanist, whose sacred compositions were afterwards performed and highly appreciated at Salzburg, Less remarkable was the second organist, Franz Ignatius Lipp, Hayden's father-in-law. The Kapellmeister and organist did not confine themselves to conducting performances of church music. They made it a point of honor to provide suitable music for special festival occasions. At such time, new compositions were considered indispensable. Indeed, throughout the year, a constant variety of music was sought to be provided. 
this activity in church music was of the greatest service to young composers who never wanted an opportunity for bringing out new compositions nor for learning by hearing and comparing it was not the less beneficial in the way of training that they were obliged to keep within the limits of certain clearly defined forms and to be content with the often scanty means which they found ready to hand through the influence of transmitted customs and individual peculiarities as well as the taste of those in authority local traditions grew up whose narrow rules hindered freedom of development such control is most irksome in church matters wherein all even what is in itself unimportant must be considered as partaking of the sanctity of the whole the counterbalancing gain of such training is technical finish the indispensable foundation for the development of genius with which alone can any effort to break loose from what is false in tradition be successful mozart found the rules and forms of church music as clearly defined as those of the opera both had been formed in the neapolitan school and the impulses given up each had been in the same direction the turning point was the introduction of melodies which had their own significance as expressions of emotion without regard to their harmonic or contrapuntal treatment no sooner had melody gained recognition in opera and cantata as the natural and legitimate form of musical expression than it made a way for itself into the church by means of oratorio the simple grandeur of the older church music particularly that of the roman school with palestrina as its representative depended chiefly on the fact that the chorus of voices was treated as an organic whole of which no one part could be recognized as a distinct entity apart from the rest the impression made by such music resembles that of the sea wave follows upon wave and each one seems to be like the last yet underlying the apparent monotony there exists an ever varied life an invincible strength manifesting itself alike in peaceful calm and raging storm and filling the mind with a sense of sublimity and grandeur without satiety and without fatigue but so soon as one melody was distinguished above the rest the union and equality of the voices was disturbed separate voices became more or less prominent as occasion required and it could not fail to follow that the other voices should be employed merely to fill up and support the principal melody a certain amount of independence and character might indeed be given to the accompanying voices by skilful management but the principle remains unaltered so long as a melody and its accompaniment are in question the change became more marked when instrumental music gained admission into the church at first the organ and trumpets were employed merely to support and strengthen the voices but when stringed instruments and by degrees the various wind instruments of the orchestra came into use in churches they gradually adopted in church music as in secular the part of accompaniment to the voices this tendency was most apparent of course in solo singing but a manner of orchestral accompaniment to the choruses was gradually elaborated which could not fail to influence the treatment of the voice parts the use of the severest contrapuntal method had hitherto been considered an essential condition in embellishment of church music but on this point also an alteration of opinion and taste gained gradual ground the perfection of contrapuntal treatment consisting in the absolute freedom and independence of the several parts with their due correlation can only be obtained by strict obedience to well-defined laws added to which must be a firm conception of some fundamental idea whose many-sided development shall give unity and cohesion to the whole work this form of composition is therefore peculiarly appropriate to the delivery of serious and weighty ideas it is however but a form and can be endued with life and significance only by the matter which it contains and by the spirit which animates it in old times the madrigal served to illustrate contrapuntal forms in secular music and even in the present day canons and fugues sometimes with comic effect sometimes giving expression to very varied emotions are often so skilfully constructed that the uninitiated have no suspicion of the artistic learning with the effect of which they are charmed although counterpoint is in itself neither spiritual nor ecclesiastical it is conceivable that in proportion as secular music freed itself from the trammels the error should arise of imagining severity of form and structure to be peculiarly appropriate to church music this identification of counterpoint with ecclesiastical ideas caused its development to proceed side by side with those other forms which had made good their footing in church music the opposition which was felt to exist between severe methods and methods not severe led to a compromise certain parts of the liturgical text were treated contrapuntally and others freely their proportions depended greatly on personal and local influences but the main points of the division were decided by the neapolitan school the moral tendency of this change of construction must not be overlooked the free treatment of melody gave to subjective emotion with its ever varying alternations a suitable method of musical expression and an art which was developing in this direction must have had extraordinary influence the effort to make church music subject to this influence was the necessary consequence of a newly awakened life and art the musician felt himself impelled to represent religious emotion in its full strength and truth and with all the means at his command 
the liturgy called forth the expression of the liveliest and most passionate emotion it offered opportunities for representing the most vivid dramatic situations even the glory of worship called on its votaries to bring the splendor of music as well as of painting and sculpture into the divine service but the direction taken by the intellectual progress of that time especially in italy was fraught with the dangers which invariably threaten an art which is struggling to free itself from tradition the church was tolerant towards the aspirations of art so long as they afforded an effective means for her glorification but she sternly repressed any efforts to break loose from the fetters of her ordinances and customs on the other hand men rejoiced in what had been so easily and rapidly gained and satisfied themselves with the superficial freedom which they had attained proportionally was the development of a formalism in accordance with the italian character which seeks for beauty always in set forms and demanded the adoption of such forms by church music the opera was the model thence sprang the moral and artistic element which became manifest in the forms of church music appealing not so much to the faith of the congregation as to the taste of musical connoisseurs any attempt to transport operatic forms directly into church music was forbidden by the liturgical form of divine service to which the music must be subordinate but the connection was severed with the old church modes from which ancient church music borrowed its subjects treating them after a long since obsolete tone system and the merely devotional musical symbolism was renounced for the freedom of original creation for those subjects were borrowed in later times from the old church modes they lost their significance when detached and were besides treated according to the new lights finally the sway of the singer was mighty in church music as elsewhere the habit of delighting in the finished performances of the vocalist was united with the idea that he who could most fully satisfy the prevailing taste was also the most worthy to serve the most high and to exalt the glory of worship we shall therefore find the church music of the latter half of the eighteenth century composed of the same materials as operatic music and exercising much the same effect the same influence which had been won by italian operatic music in germany penetrated to the churches of catholic germany and attained to complete sovereignty but there was a difference important though not at the time generally or consciously felt the conception and mode of expression of italian church music was although secularized yet in its essence national and in its appeals to religious emotion it might count upon universal comprehension and sympathy but transplanted to germany both the ideas and their mode of execution were strange and could only be adopted after a preliminary artistic training what in italy had grown up in the course of national development was transmitted to germany as mere form the delicate sense of beauty and of grace the excitable passionate nature of the italians could not be transplanted and the external adjuncts were even more superficially treated than on the soil from which they sprang contrapuntal work especially the fugue was haunted by the school traditions of church usages which conduced to a spiritless formalism of routine thus carelessness and pedantry superficiality and dullness were combined and church music declined more rapidly and visibly than the opera the difference between the true essence and its extinct form is the more apparent and significant the deeper it lies into this must be added the fact that the continuous demand for church music gave rise to the production of a mass of inferior work from which the opera was preserved in deference to the taste of the public under these circumstances it was impossible even for a surpassing genius to do more than distinguish himself in some particulars the efforts of an individual after a thorough-going reform could only be successful supported by the spirit of the age and of the nation this general position held by church music was modified in different regions by local peculiarities of the liturgy and by the tastes of church authorities and by the differences in the musical forces at command the peculiar circumstances under which mozart wrote in salzburg are described by himself in a letter to padre martini september fourth seventeen seventy six i live in a place where music prospers but little although we have some good musicians and some especially good composers of thorough knowledge and taste the theatre suffers for want of singers we have few male sopranos and are not likely to have more for they require high pay and over liberality is not our weak point i busy myself with writing church and chamber music and we have two capital contrapuntists hayden and algasser my father is kapellmeister at the metropolitan church which gives me the opportunity of writing as much as i like for the church but as my father has been thirty-six years in the service of the court and knows that the archbishop does not care to have people of an advanced age about him he takes things quietly and devotes himself chiefly to literature which has always been his favorite study our church music differs widely and increasingly from that of italy a mass with kyrie gloria credo the sonata at the epistle the offertorium or motet sanctus and agnus dei must not last longer than three-quarters of an hour even on festivals when the archbishop himself officiates this kind of composition requires special study and yet the mass must have all the instruments trumpets drums etc 
Ah, if we were not so far from each other, how much I should have to tell you. We have further information on the arrangements made for church music in the cathedral. The cathedral contains a large organ at the back of the entrance, four side organs in front of the choir, and a little choir organ below the choir where the choristers sit. The large organ is only used on grand occasions and for preludes. During the performance, one of the four side organs is played, generally that next to the altar on the right side, where the solo singers and basses are. Opposite, by the left side organ, are the violinists, etc., and on the two other sides are two choruses of trumpets and drums. The lower choir organ and double bass join in when required. Among Mozart's compositions for the church, his masses, by reason of their importance and divine service, take the first place. In the divisions of the several parts, we find him following in the beaten track of the Neapolitan school. The different parts of the text coincide with the prescribed pauses made by the officiating priest, but are very differently worked out. Where the composer has free scope, the separate sections are usually treated as independent pieces, with regular alternations of solo and chorus. But such elaborate masses were only performed on solemn occasions, misa solemnis, or through the preference of an influential personage. They took up too much time for the regular service. In the short mass, misa brevis, the larger divisions were treated in the main as a connected musical movement, of which the separate sections were detached indeed, but not independent of each other. The degree of connection is, of course, very varied. The thrice-repeated cry, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, is regularly developed into a lengthy movement. It was formerly the custom to prefix a short, slow, and solemn movement on the words Kyrie eleison to an agitated, more elaborate one, Kirschel numbers 49, 65, and 66, but afterwards the whole became one movement. The prayer for the mercy of God is animated, and though devoid of depth, never sinks to mere trifling. A more serious mood is generally indicated by the severe contrapuntal treatment of the voices. Kirschel numbers 192, 194, and 262. The words Christe eleison are regularly accentuated, usually with an expression of beseeching melancholy, and often by solo voices. The solo voices and choruses generally alternate in the Kyrie. End of section 27, chapter 13, part 1. Section 28 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart, by Otto Jahn. Section 28. Chapter 13. Part 2. The Gloria is divided into several movements, conformably to the successive invocations of which it consists. The character of the whole is one of exalting praise, the tone being indicated by the opening words, Gloria in excelsis Deo. The effort to express the solemn dignity of divine worship by external splendor is apparent in the animated, fervent, and often stately progress of this movement. The opening subject is revived at appointed places, usually at the quoniam, and forms a connecting thread throughout the piece. A solo is often introduced at the words la damus te, and, even without much intentional expression, the four commas of the words la damus te, benedicimus te, adoramus te, Glorificamus te. Form natural pauses, and regulate the musical and rhythmical division of the passage. But the contrast of the solo and chorus is determined less by the sense of words than by the necessities of art, requiring variations of light and shade. As a rule, the words of highest import are given to the chorus. The solos serve for ornament, or as a preparation for a chorus of renewed and increased strength. The central point of this part of the mass is formed by the thrice-repeated cry, Qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis, qui tolis peccata mundi, suscipe deprecationem nostram, qui sedes ad dexteram patris, miserere nobis. Here we have a mood expressed of deep agitation, offering excellent opportunity for musical treatment, both in feeling and form. The qui tolis is the nucleus of all Mozart's glorias. He enunciates it simply enough through the chorus, relying for effect on the charm of rich and original harmonies as bold in conception as they are clear and decided in rendering. The words which follow, quoniam tu solus sanctus, tu solus dominus, tu solus altissimus, Jesu Christe, are treated as a song of praise. In order to relieve the gloom of the qui tolis, and to give stronger emphasis to what is to follow. For the last words, cum sancto spiritu in gloria de patris, amen, are treated without regard to the context, as an independent fugue. In Mozart's early masses the fugue is short, 
Kirschel numbers 49 and 65, but they soon become long and often elaborate. Kirschel numbers 60, 115, 139, 137, 192, and 269. Archbishop Hieronymus, however, had an aversion to fugues, and in Mozart's later masses the Gloria came to an end in a short choral passage. Kirschel numbers 220, 257, 258, and 259. The Credo offered the greatest difficulties to musical treatment. A long movement, whose several parts are dependent on one emphatic verb placed at the beginning, cannot be musically rendered in such a way that the connection remains apparent to the hearer. Each phrase disturbs the grammatical construction of the period. In order to overcome this difficulty, the word credo was repeated at fitting points, Kirschel numbers 192 and 257. But although logical requirements are thus to a certain degree satisfied, the repeated credo does not fit into the grammatical structure, and the contrast between the spoken and the musical expression is in reality only intensified. In close connection with this is the further difficulty that the declarations of faith belong essentially to the domain of speculation, and can rarely work directly on the feelings. Neither does the form into which they are thrown incite the fancy to musical expression. These difficulties might be surmounted at a time when music with all her powers and capacities placed herself unreservedly at the disposal of worship, accepting the prescribed words, with perfect faith in their sanctity, and only anxious to give them their fullest and truest expression. There was as little question of individuality in art as in faith. The unquestioned law of ecclesiastical infallibility impressed on every work the stamp of the subjection of art to religion. Even the forms of the music followed the ancient and hollow traditions of the cultus, and embodied ecclesiastical formulas in strict counterpoint. But as by degrees subjective emotion and expression gained ground in church music, and as the old severity of form gave place to a wealth of means and expedients, the ecclesiastical text fell under the criticism of the musicians, who subjected it to the test of the conditions required for the production of a perfect work of art. Composers learned to look upon the credo as material to be worked up into an artistic musical form, even when it did not lend itself easily to the process. A sort of type was gradually evolved, that was closely adhered to in many particulars. One such, for instance, is the strong accentuation of death in the words judicare vivos et mortuos, and resurrectionem mortuorum, the tone painting of the descendite coelis, the repetition of the non in the words cuius regni non erit finis, and others of the same kind. Such an evident tendency to emphasize details at the cost of the whole only shows how composers took refuge in whatever was capable of musical expression, in order to extricate themselves as far as they could from the burden of the rest. The main passages on which the musical strength of the credo was concentrated are those in which the mention of the Incarnation, Crucifixion, and Resurrection of Christ appeal most vividly to the senses and the imagination. It had become customary to connect the words qui propter nos homines et propter nostram salutem descendit de coelis, whether made prominent by solo singing or not, with those which preceded them, and to make a pause with et incarnatus. These words are generally rendered by a tender solo voice, as if they would fain hover round the cradle of the heavenly child to express the gratitude of mankind for his incarnation. Then solemnly and sadly the chorus depicts the deep pain of crucifixus etiam pro nobis sub pontio pilato, passus et sepultus est, breaking out at et resurrexit, etc., into joyful trust in the resurrection. In all this, Mozart's wonderful genius succeeded in awakening imagination and emotion, which, again, his artistic moderation knew how to calm, his firm grasp of his art enabling him to produce the most striking effect with the simplest means, and to gather up the details, so that each sustains and elevates the other without injuring the consistency of the whole credo. This unusual combination of qualities gives to this part of the mass a high degree of artistic finish, even when the treatment is most simple and confined. The words, et in spiritum sanctum, are usually given to a solo voice, more, however, from custom than for any special signification of their own, Kirschel numbers 49, 65, and 139. They are introduced by a long instrumental prelude, Kirschel number 262. Apart from the interests of the Church, which might have some influence here, the necessity could not but be felt for a strong contrast between this and the following passages. For what follows, et unum sanctum catholicum et apostolicum ecclesiam, etc., is given by the whole strength of the chorus. The last words, et vitam venturi seculi, amen, is again treated as a fugue. Here again we find first a short fugues movement, Kirschel numbers 49, 65, and 192, but later a long and cleverly worked out fugue, Kirchel numbers 139, 167, and 262, until the influence of Archbishop Hieronymus led to the conclusion of the credo, like the Gloria, in a short animated chorus, 
Kirschel numbers 257, 258, 259, and 275. Various methods were employed to gather the phrases of the creed into a consistent musical work. The repetition of the word credo, Kirschel numbers 167 and 257, even in places where it somewhat disturbs the grammatical construction, serves to combine the musical texture of the movements. The periodical recurrence of the musical phrase conduces to careful mechanism and gives opportunity for variety and increased intensity in the treatment of the subject. Apart from this, unity is provided for by a pregnant rhythmical passage or a carefully finished subject which marks the beginning of the credo and underlies its several divisions, forming a sort of background from which the more impressive images stand out. The appropriate elaboration of this subject is the special task of the artist, and the text is to be considered only as a point de départ to it. The mode of treatment varies and is sometimes contrapuntal, sometimes harmonic. In one part the voices predominate, in another the instruments, in which latter case the then favorite running passage for the violins is frequently employed. The general character of church music was more prominently displayed in the creed than elsewhere. An animated and elevated frame of mind was vividly portrayed, with more cheerfulness and brilliancy than solemnity or earnest devotion, and only at moments does the music show a consciousness of the deep significance of the text. Mozart pays tribute to his time, but his artistic nature did not allow him to sink into triviality or commonplace. Symmetry, beauty, and delicacy are never found wanting. The remaining sections of the Mass lend themselves more readily to musical treatment. They express deep and universal sentiments in words as simple as those of the Kiri, and musical both in sound and suggestion. The Sanctus falls naturally into three well-defined parts. The first words, Sanctus Dominus Deus Saboeth, intended to convey an impression of the most exalted sublimity, are generally treated as a solemn introduction to the more animated and fervent words, Pleni sunt coli et terra gloria tua. Agitation rises into joyful emotion in the Hosanna, to which the form of a short fugal movement is usually given. The Benedictus, on the other hand, strives to express the secret thanksgiving of the heart at the coming of the Lord. A mild fervor penetrates the simple words, which seem to cast illumining beams on every side. Mozart's artistic originality has so clearly stamped the impress of his genius on the traditional form of the Benedictus that his interpretation of it has become the customary one. It is, as a rule, given to solo voices, to which more prominence is given here than elsewhere. Now and then single voices, Kirschel numbers 65, 139, and 194, but more often all the four, now alternately, now in unison, announce the message of consolation. Obligato organ accompaniments serve still further to mark the prominence given to this movement, Kirschel number 259. It has a charming effect, Kirschel number 258, when the chorus recurring at intervals during the solos enunciates with sustained expression the word benedictus. The Hosanna is usually repeated either entire or abridged from the Sanctus, but it is sometimes interwoven into the Benedictus, Kirschel numbers 139 and 262. The last movement falls naturally into two strongly contrasting sections. The first, expressing the sentiments of contrition, of anguished appeal for mercy, was treated with great partiality. The cry, Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, and the prayer, Miserere nobis, furnish a natural grouping not seldom employed for alternations of solo and chorus. The mood expressed is very favorable to musical treatment. The Dona Nobis Pacem is in complete contrast, and in no movement of the mass is the alteration in the spirit of church music more apparent. The peace which is prayed for is vividly represented, and just as vivid is the tone of cheerful confidence with which the prayer is offered. The devout hearer was to be dismissed with a pleasant impression on his mind, and therefore the deep earnestness of this petition for peace was sacrificed in order to produce a feeling of self-satisfied enjoyment. The music of the Dona maintains throughout this cheerful tone, and though Mozart's variety and grace are as marked and effective here as elsewhere, even with him earnestness and depth are rarely to be met with. We may now conclude this general description with a glance in detail on Mozart's masses. We have already spoken of his first attempts. Some unfinished masses, presumably the result of his studies under Padre Martini, exist, bearing the date 1771 and 1772. The furthest advanced, in C major, Kirschel number 115, breaks off at the ninth bar of the Sanctus, it is accompanied only by a figured organ bass, and is strictly treated with the exception of the two fugues. It is worked out in severe contrapuntal form almost throughout, as the Kiri, introduced by five bars of adagio, will serve to show.
whole work reminds us forcibly of Padre Martini's church compositions, and it is not surprising that the hand of a learner should be here apparent. A mass in F major, Kirschel number 116, which breaks off at the words, Sedit ad dexterum patris, is of the same kind, as well as a Kiri in C major, Kirschel number 221, an Osana in C major, Kirschel number 223, and a Credo in Remissionem, two Mortuorum, belonging to it, seem also to have been studies in counterpoint. A Mass in C major, Kirschel number 139, probably belonging to the year 1772, is an effort in quite another direction. Every means is employed to produce an extraordinary effect, and it may be conjectured that this, like the Pater Domenicus Mass, was composed for some special occasion. Every section is treated as a detached, independent movement. The Kyrie begins with a slow, pathetic passage in C minor, followed by an animated allegro in C major, three to four, and by the Criste Eleison as a solo quartet, after which the Kyrie is repeated. The solo voices are much used in different combinations, apart from the short passages inserted between the choruses. Laudamus is a duet for soprano and alto, Domine a duet for tenor and bass, Quoniam a soprano solo, Et Incarnatus a duet for soprano and alto, Et in Spiritum a tenor solo, and Benedictus a soprano solo, to which the chorus sings Osanna. Even the Agnus Dei begins with a tenor solo, followed by a chorus. The last appeal before the Donna is given to the solo quartet. These solo movements are well-rounded, and are both preceded and followed by long symphonies. The effort to produce a pleasing effect is apparent in the whole work, and a moderate amount of operatic bravura is not disdained. This brings into stronger relief the pathos which is given to every passage capable of it. The Quitolis, Crucifixus, and Agnus, as well as the Kyrie, are in the minor key. Striking harmonies are emphasized by means of the accompaniment, and three trumpets contribute to the orchestral effects. The solemn crucifixus, follows an evident contrast immediately upon the soprano solo. Whereupon the chorus and orchestra with three trumpets fall in. But the youthful master does not neglect the display of his skill in counterpoint. Besides some few instances of more or less elaborate imitation, the two customary fugues, the first on the theme, The second, et vitam, are furnished with two subjects and every requisite for complete fugues. It is true that the strongly contrasting original ideas exist only as such, and form no united whole, so that we are all the more struck by the conventional treatment of the greater part of the work. But it must be conceded, notwithstanding, that progress has been made, and that the power is making itself felt which, with a wider field, shall produce better and more original work. The mass composed in 1773, in honorum sanctu dignitatis, Kirschel number 167, is for chorus alone, without any solo movements. It displays no very high aim, but earnestness and ability throughout. The Kyrie is long and elaborate, without any sustained subject. In the Gloria, the voices sustain the harmony, accompanied by a lively violin passage. The Credo is interesting through the persistent attempt to mould it into a firm musical organism. Three motifs occur quite at the beginning, apportioned in different combinations to the voices. For instance, a rhythmical, characteristic passage... A more melodious phrase, and a running passage. These three subjects form the essential substance of the credo, the first with changing harmonies forming the root whence the others spring at fitting places, by which means the due expression of the words and the musical exigences of the composition are alike provided for. The continuous agitation is only once interrupted, at the short but grave and dignified et incarnatus est, and at the words et in spiritum sanctum. These points are emphasized by their separation from the rest through a long symphony, 
and by a digressive mode of treatment which reminds one of a solo. Towards the end of the broadly elaborated fugue, et vitam, the violins return to the first motif of the credo. The voices take up the second motif with the amen, and the violins, asserting the supremacy of the first, bring the whole to a conclusion. The benedictus is unusually grave for a chorus, but is relieved by the easy grace of the violins. The thematic treatment of the principal subject of the donna, gives it firmness and consistency. The accompaniment becomes more prominent in the middle, and the admirably well-sustained conclusion is dignified in mood and expression. The Mass in F major, Kirschel number 192, composed on June 24, 1774, is the work of a finished artist, and has rightly been placed next after the Requiem. The whole Mass, which reminds us of the finest examples of the older Neapolitan school, is in the strictest form of composition, none of the smaller sections forming an independent movement. The most delicate use is made of the simplest materials. The chorus and solos alternate throughout, the solo voices, never concerted, supplying the finer shadows to the chorus, which in return serves for response or repetition and conclusion. The accompaniment consists only of a bass, figured for the organ, and two violins, but it is independently worked out and effective both in tone coloring and as a contrast to the voices. Every section of the mass is in counterpoint, and shows the firm hand of a master. The unity of the whole and of the several parts, which is the necessary consequence of this musical method, is apparent here to a surprising degree. The parts combine to express and dilate upon a well-defined idea, the separate features of which are not thrown together arbitrarily or by chance. A subject which in one place is merely indicated or foreshadowed becomes in another the main subject. In short, the independence of each separate part produces the uniform clear texture of the whole. Thus the Gloria begins with an important subject for the soprano. which is the groundwork of the whole movement, and, now entire and unaltered, now abridged or modified, appears in different positions as cantus firmus, while the remaining parts, treated contrapuntally, give due emphasis to each change of mood, until the whole concludes with a grand amen in unison. The same thing occurs in the credo. The link here is a motif. Which, borrowed from the intonation of the Magnificat, or of the gloria in the third tone has often been employed by alessandro scarlatti for instance in a mass and by michael hayden in a gradual qui sedis number three as alleluia mozart has made frequent use of it we find it again in the sanctus of another mass kirschel number two hundred fifty seven in a symphony in b flat major kirschel number three hundred nineteen composed in seventeen seventy nine in a pianoforte sonata in e flat major composed in seventeen eighty five each time easily treated as a connecting subject, until it finally appears as the theme of the last movement of the symphony in C major, Kirschel number 551. In the present work it recurs again and again as cantus firmus, or, in imitation, always the bond and support of the detached articles of faith. Then it becomes the root of the subjects for single phrases, such as the magnificent crucifixus, or the confitior, and the fugued et vitam. We scarcely know whether to admire most the masterly skill which makes light of difficulty, or the inventive imagination which can develop an idea from so many and such varied points of view, making the same subject express calm faith in the credo, bitter pain in the crucifixus, and joyful confidence in the et vitam. The sanctus and benedictus are short, fine, contrapuntal movements, the benedictus especially simple and full of grace. The agnus dei is freer in form. Three solo voices make the appeal, which the chorus answers with, miserere nobis the harmonic successions and the beautiful violin passage in the accompaniment give a peculiarly affecting character to this movement which suggests a comparison with the requiem the donna is fine and pure but the effort to give it a cheerful and agreeable tone has robbed it of depth and significance even the accompaniment of this mass has an importance of its own and there is more art and beauty contained in the two violin parts than in many a fuller score not content with giving an independent course to the voices Mozart allows the accompaniment also to go its own way, usually with a subject proper to it, treated freely, often in counterpoint, and always with visible partiality. Inventive genius, technical scholarship, and deep, clear comprehension are more evidently displayed by Mozart in this mass than ever before. The subjects have an intensity, a charm of beauty, which had scarcely yet been suggested, 
here for the first time we become aware of that wonderful beauty mozart's most special endowment which we may designate sweetness if we mean by that the perfect harmony of a naturally developed artistic organism the maiden freshness of its manifestation here only increases the charm and points to future expansion the mass in d major Kirschel number one hundred ninety four composed on august eighth seventeen seventy four has been rightly placed next to the one we have been considering the whole plan the strict form the flowing treatment contrapuntal throughout the mature beauty offer many points of resemblance but the effort after gracefulness is more apparent in the later mass and is achieved at the sacrifice of gravity and ideality the kiri displays a very similar conception with the opening words of the soprano the foundation is laid on which the whole structure of the movement is built in part in imitative combinations in part extended into a longer subject and in part connected with opposing subjects for the voices and the violins this short theme is elaborated into a fine long movement as interesting as it is expressive the gloria and the credo do not reach the same height the contrapuntal elaboration is only apparent in isolated passages the solos are expressive but over graceful the music proceeds in a fine flow and delights the listener but only now and then stirs deeper feelings on the other hand the sanctus benedictus a solo quartet agnus alternate solo and chorus are highly finished and tersely composed movements in which beauty of form and sentiment combine the somewhat lengthy donna preserves its pleasing character without degenerating into trifling the effort to please by mere gracefulness is most predominant in the mass in b flat major kirschel number two hundred seventy five the date of which is not known the commencement with the soprano solo is characteristic of the whole mass the solo element predominates and a wealth of lovely seductive and expressive melodies is scattered around but neither the conception nor the execution takes a deep hold on the mind the chorus is generally full one might almost say merry where harmonic or contrapuntal treatment comes to the front it is executed with masterly ease and such passages stand out in all the clearer relief against their surroundings the principal passage of the credo is striking according to lorenz it is a reminiscence perhaps an accidental one of a favorite volkslied bauer hang den pumer an the introduction of the following theme after a highly original and striking harmonic progression cannot fail to injure the effect the sanctus is a short fugued movement the benedictus an unusually melodious soprano solo with an original accompaniment the agnus goes deepest and is serious in feeling as well as wonderfully sweet works like the masses in f and d major prove what mozart was capable of in church music if his genius could have had free scope but the rapid advance of ecclesiastical reformation in salzburg under the wise and immortal prince archbishop hieronymus von coloredo had its effect on the treatment of the mass the limitation of its duration and the abolition of solo singing proper and of fugues might appear to be the result of ecclesiastical rigor but hieronymus was far more inclined to favor secular taste in church music and he was fond besides of displaying a royal magnificence and splendor this external influence is apparent in the conception and treatment of the later masses composed after seventeen seventy five more particularly the one belonging to seventeen seventy six kirschel number two hundred sixty two with the kyrie and counterpoint and two elaborate fugues especially earnest and beautiful both as to technical workmanship and expression are the movements on which the musical treatment was becoming more and more concentrated the quitolis of which the accompaniment recalls the fugue quam olim abrahai in the requiem the et incarnatus est and agnus dei even the benedictus where the chorus answers the benedictus of the solos by osanna and the donna are sustained in style how fundamentally this mass differs from that in f major is clearly shown by the ground tones of the gloria and the credo which are animated and brilliant but without any intensity or depth of meaning the same tendency is still more marked in the remaining masses Kirschel numbers two hundred twenty two hundred fifty two two hundred fifty eight and two hundred fifty nine increasing maturity is manifest in the firm and skilful handling of all available means and the subjects display uncommon fertility of invention but real creative inspiration is crushed by the obligation to compose after a set fashion end of section twenty eight chapter thirteen part two Section twenty nine of the Life of Mozart, Volume One by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn, Section twenty nine, Chapter thirteen, Part three. 
we do not need to look further than such church music to become aware that the archbishop loved to bring the pomp and glitter of his royal station into the services of the church such a task obliges the artist to use his art more and more consciously as a means to an end the inevitable result is inequality and exaggeration his genius and his work being often at variance the charm of mere grace leads to the danger of softness and effeminacy and fluent animation becomes meaningless superficiality the effort to be light and pleasing is manifest in these masses by their superfluity of detail we find an overabundance of beautiful melodies and harmonies combined with great freedom in the treatment both of voices and orchestra and in the working out of the subjects there are isolated instances of deeper sentiment and more poetic conception which are heightened in effect by the earnest technical skill displayed in their working out and which give glimpses of happy inspiration not belonging of necessity to the fundamental conception of the work unhappily it is on these masses in the composition of which mozart's genius could only move within very confined limits that his fame as a composer of church music chiefly rests and musicians who have taken him as their model have striven most to imitate these his least satisfactory works the great resemblance in plan and mechanism to the masses of contemporary composers such as haas nauman joseph and michael hayden proves a strict adherence to the rules of composition then in force a consideration of their work serves to heighten the effect of mozart's higher and nobler conceptions of his poetical sentiment and of that sense of proportion which regards a work of art as a whole and recognizes the limits imposed on it from without as the necessary conditions of artistic production many excellent qualities may be conceded to these musicians but none of them attain to the harmonious beauty of mozart the artist of a later age who imitated and exaggerated the cramped and obsolete forms which had been the result of many circumstances as if they were in themselves an all-sufficient musical method judged mozart's works by their own standard and found them in many respects unsatisfactory before condemning mozart's readiness to adapt his compositions to external conditions we must consider the mode of thought of the time all art more especially music stood in the closest connection with the ordinary affairs of life operas masses instrumental works were composed when where and how they were required for particular occasions and particular performers occasions of the kind were eagerly sought for and furnished an impulse and incitement to the composer even when they somewhat hampered his productive powers exaggerated as the reference to external circumstances and mechanical resources became it formed the groundwork rightly understood of thorough artistic production the demand for church music was one that came with peculiar authority at salzburg since the priest who commanded it was considered as the mouthpiece of the church he also stood in the place of the sovereign arranging the performances and paying for them respect for his position was both natural and proper mozart was by nature easily led so long as his deeper feelings of antagonism were not stirred then he was firm and decided trained under the discipline of his father to fulfil every duty conscientiously and to turn to the best account whatever was inevitable he endeavoured as long as circumstances made it advisable to satisfy the demands of the archbishop and to make them conducive to his own improvement in this he was guided by a nature so completely that of an artist as not to feel cramped or bound even by real restrictions composition was a joy and necessity to him and a trifling impulse only was needed to set his poetical activity in motion this once accomplished external conditions served him for tools and their just and appropriate use soon became second nature to him the statement often made and for the most part with a very imperfect knowledge of the subject that mozart's masses are his weakest works cannot be accepted without large reservations and we have it in our power to give a decided contradiction to Thibault's assertion that mozart thought little of his masses and often when a mass was ordered he objected that he was only made for opera but he was offered one hundred louis d'or for every mass and that he could not refuse only he used to say laughing that he would take whatever was good in his masses and use it in his next opera the apparent particularity of this story is pure invention employed as so often happens to give a colour to mere conjecture and the invention is clumsy mozart only wrote for the church in salzburg in vienna he did not compose a single mass to order and only one the unfinished one in c minor on his own account such fees as that above mentioned never put his constancy to the test we know that he received one hundred ducats for an opera again thoughtlessness in the composition of church music is imputed to mozart he had strongly biased opinions but they were honest convictions and his church work was always thoroughly earnest rochlitz tells us that at leipzig in conversation on church music mozart declared that a protestant could not possibly conceive the associations which the services of the church awoke in the mind of a devout catholic nor the powerful effect which they had on the genius of an artist mozart's education was calculated to make him a good catholic a conscientious observer of all that the church prescribes and reverence for her usages were combined in him with a clear and penetrating intellect 
After his betrothal, he wrote to his father, August 17th, 1782, that he had heard Mass and been to confession with his Constanze. It seems to me that I have never prayed so earnestly or confessed and communicated so devoutly as by her side, and it is the same with her. I find no trace whatever of Mozart's having looked with disdain upon church music. His way of expressing himself to Padre Martini directly disproves the assertion. He took his church music with him on his journeys, expecting to gain credit by it, and sent for some of it from Vienna that it might be heard by von Swieten, a severe critic. So far from giving himself out as a mere operatic composer, who has a mean opinion of church compositions, he recommends himself for the post of under Kapellmeister, by saying, The learned Kapellmeister Salieri has never devoted himself to church music, while I have made it my particular study from my youth up. It is an unjust reproach also that Mozart robbed his masses for his operas, among his numerous compositions of both kinds, a single Agnus Dei, Kerschel number 317, a soprano solo, contains in its opening bars a slight suggestion of the aria Dove Sono from Figaro. Next in importance to masses must be reckoned litanies and vespers, and here we find the influence of the opera much more decided. The words did not readily lend themselves to musical expression, nor to the arrangement of the movements. If the severity of ecclesiastical form was once relaxed, the easier and more pleasing forms were more likely to be employed in those places where the words were most opposed to musical expression. The dissimilarity of the different parts was increased by the supposed necessity of also representing the severe style, and of balancing a tour de force of counterpoint by a tour de force of execution. In this way certain conventional rules had become law, leaving little scope for variety or originality. Common to all litanies are the kiri with which they begin, and the agnus dei with which they close. That which lies between, the petitions varying according to the circumstances under which the litany was composed, determines its musical character. In the Kyrie, other petitions are added to the Kyrie Eleison and Christe Eleison, which give scope for a broader and more varied treatment, whereby the Kyrie becomes one of the most important and impressive movements. The Agnus Dei does not close with Dona Nobis Pacem, but with Miserere Nobis, which prevents any suggestion of cheerfulness. The expression of anxious beseeching was generally softened into deep solemnity at the close. The invocations which form the substance of litanies are too numerous, disconnected, and wanting in climax to be well adapted for composition, and most of the petitions recited by the priest are equally incapable of definite musical expression. The musical setting of the service, to be appropriate, must be strictly liturgical. In the recurring refrain stamps it with a typical formulistic character. Should this tradition once be forsaken, its place must be taken by a setting full of lights and shades, often heterogeneous in treatment, and accentuated in accordance with form rather than reason. The distinguishing refrain could only be used to link together conflicting elements, or else as a vehicle for shades of sentiment, and a variety of expression would be given to the simple petitions ora pro nobis, miserere nobis, which would be quite foreign to their nature. The litanies to the Virgin, litaniae laurentanae, were, on the whole, cheerful and pleasing. When the devout worshipper turned to the Virgin Mother, the image that rose to his mind was that of a pure and holy maiden, in the veneration for all that is womanly, which her worship induced, was apparent in the music as elsewhere. The tone of the litanies sung in Italy before the images of the Virgin in the streets is echoed in the compositions of most of the Italian musicians, and is perceptible in many parts of Mozart's litanies. The first litany, in B-flat major, Kerschel number 109, composed in May 1771, is precise in form and firmly and ably treated, although in no very elevated strain. The Kyrie, as in short masses, is composed of a single animated choral movement without any definite development of the subject. The first part of the litany proper is divided between the chorus and solo voices, the soprano being most prominent. The whole work is interesting, melodious, and simple in its harmonies, and singularly popular in tone. Upon the delivery of the solemn Salus Infirmorum by the chorus follows a quick, vigorous choral passage to the words Auxilium Christianorum. The solo voices raise the appeal Regina Angelorum to the Queen of Heaven, who seems to shed the glory of her manifestation upon the minds of her worshippers. In the last movement, the chorus comes in with Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi. The solo voices answer with the prayer, and the chorus winds up with the miserere nobis. The tone is composed, more serious than melancholy, and rising in intensity towards the close. The actual mechanism is simple, the voices are seldom in true counterpoint, the modulations are freely and firmly handled, the accompaniment makes little attempt at independent significance. Far more important is the second litany in D major, Kerschel number 195, belonging to the year 1774, the same in which the masses in F and D major and the Finta Giardiniera were written. 
the maturity of its conception and the carefulness of its execution make it worthy to take a place beside these works the curie is a grand lovingly elaborated movement a solemn adagio followed by a serious sustained allegro the parts are throughout in strict counterpoint principal and accessory subjects kept well in hand and carefully elaborated the orchestra too is independently treated the expression is appropriate and dignified and over the whole is spread a peaceful calm bespeaking the nature of the music to which it forms the introductory movement the first section of the litany proper gives us the impression of a cheerful one might almost say sensuous spirit pervading each petition but always with a tone of delicate moderation the musical formation betrays the unmistakable influence of the opera both in the solo soprano passages and in the aria-like treatment of the principal subject refrain is used with happy effect in the chorus and the accompaniment is easy and flowing throughout the whole movement is melodious and full of tender grace and harmony in quite another style is the adagio next following where the words salus in firmorum refugium peccatorum consolatrix afflictorum auxilium christianum are taken together the construction of this movement the arrangement and gradations of the details the alternations of solo and chorus the characteristically careful elaboration of the accompaniment are all so admirably calculated and balanced and the whole movement is pervaded with so much earnestness and depth of sentiment that beauty and grandeur seem here indeed to be wedded together the following section regina angelorum is again in a lighter vein the choruses are fresh and animated but the interpolated tenor solo is operatic in form and weak in invention and expression the anus day is divided between a solo soprano and the chorus the former though evidently composed for executive display is not without feeling and dignity the short choral passages are excellent both in workmanship and expression very evident also is the loving care bestowed on the orchestral score its main strength lies in the delicately elaborated string quartet but the wind instruments are also effectively made use of to produce lights and shadows the mature and harmonious beauty of the numerous motifs and characteristic passages conveys the unmistakable impression of mozart's genius of a third litany for four voices without accompaniment the opening bars of the kyrie kershaw number three hundred forty in the sancta maria in c major kershaw number three hundred twenty five and of the salus infirmorum in c minor kershaw number three hundred twenty four are unhappily all that is preserved the litany to the holy sacrament litaniae de venerabili altari sacramento has a more serious character than the litany to the virgin but appeals to the holy sacrament being of necessity abstract and dogmatic are less suggestive of a musical rendering than those addressed to the virgin mary on this account an operatic style is more avowedly employed but it is combined with solemn dignity and thoughtfulness and the two litanies of this kind by mozart are largely conceived in carefully executed compositions the first in b flat major kershaw number one hundred twenty five composed in march seventeen seventy two after the italian tour strikes throughout the tone of the heroic opera elevated by deep and earnest feeling the curie is introduced by an instrumental passage announcing the principal subject which after a short solemn adagio is taken up by the chorus in allegro molto the plan of the whole movement containing a second subject placed as contrast to the oft-repeated principal one and a running orchestral accompaniment follows the operatic mode of construction the first movement of the litany proper panis vivus is a soprano solo which might have been transferred bodily from an opera seria the chief passages are given to the word miserere the solemn chorus which follows verbum caro factum interesting from its delicate modulations and a characteristic passage for the violins serves as an introduction to the agitated ostia sancta four solo voices give the chief motif in succession with different modifications and unite at last to rise to an appropriate climax the chorus twice interposes with a short but weighty rhythmical passage giving cohesion and dignity to the whole movement a new climax occurs in the adagio where the chorus repeats the word tremendum with an expression of solemn awe the short lively passage given to the next words ac vivificum sacramentum is only to serve as a contrast to the tremendum the movement which follows panis omnipotentia verbi caro factus is again nothing but an operatic tenor song full of passages and pleasing expression the grave harmonies of a short adagio in b minor viaticum in domino morentium prepare the way for something new it was the custom to write a movement in elaborate counterpoint on the words of pinus futura gloriae and mozart was not one to shrink from such a task the bass theme answered by the wind instruments in a passage afterwards much employed is announced with the force and decision of joyful confidence and is then exhaustively worked out into a long fugue 
The one theme, hardly ever abridged or altered, runs through the whole, but it is developed with an amount of variety, especially in the modulation and in the orchestral climax, and with so much fresh tunefulness that this work alone would prove the youth of fifteen years old to be possessed of the genius of maturity. The Agnus Dei is a soprano solo, ornamented with many passages, all alike truly and simply conceived and full of grace. The chorus takes up the Agnus Dei at the third repetition, and brings the movement to a calm conclusion, making use of the solo motif, altered and simplified. The Finis, I-O-D-G, inscribed by Mozart, contrary to his custom at the end of his score, show that he set considerable store by this truly admirable work. The second litany, in E-flat major, Kirschel number 243, composed in March 1776, also a carefully worked out piece of music, displays the same arrangement. The operatic treatment of some of the parts is more conspicuous because its tinsel glitter is in more marked contrast to the mature earnestness of the work as a whole. The Kyrie, expressive of mild calm, relieved by the agitation of the accompaniment, is simple in plan and execution. Solo and chorus alternate. The principal motif recurs at the end, after a middle part of smaller motifs grouped together. The Miserere is delicately shaded and finely expressed. After such harmonious renderings of a calm and collected mood, we are surprised by the words Panis Vivus as an elaborate tenor song, altogether in the style of opera seria. In the succeeding movements, where the text seldom lends itself readily to musical adaptation, the hand of the master is visible in the admirable grouping of the larger sections and of the separate subjects, not less than in the true and beautiful expression of sentiment, and in the finely graduated and shaded unity of tone. The words verbum caro factum are used as a solemn introduction. The miserere has a fine effect, commencing without an accompaniment, as if moaned forth from an overburdened breast, then increasing in intensity to a cry of anguish, and gradually sinking back into itself. The next succeeding, Ostia Sancta, stands out against this dark background, its general tone as mild and consolatory as that of the Curie. Solemn grandeur predominates again in the Tremendum ac Vivificum Sacramentum, where the words Tremendum and Vivificum are not separated, but are compacted into a connected symmetrical movement with the words Panis Omnipotentia Verbi Caro Factus, Incruentum Sacrificium, Cibus et Conviva. The disposition of the harmonies is in strongly marked but cleverly arranged opposition, intensified by the orchestra. The stringed instruments celebrate a forcible passage opposed by the united oboes, horns, bassoons, and trombones. This noble and deeply impressive movement stands alone, both as to form and intention. The next following, Dulcissimum Convivium, a soprano solo resembling a cavatina, is soft and tender in expression and preeminently operatic. The charm of style, displayed also in the careful accompaniment, does not compensate for fundamental weakness. The viaticum in domino morentium is full of earnestness and very original in treatment. The soprano voices give out as subject the chorale of the hymn to the Holy Sacrament, Pange lingua gloriosi, as a Gregorian plain chant, accompanied by the wind instruments, oboes, horns, bassoons, and trombones, and two muted violas, while the violins are occupied with a quaver passage and pizzicato, generally in divided chords. The effect of the whole is surprisingly serious and dignified. The pinus futura gloriae follows. It is in counterpoint and of complicated workmanship. The chief subject of six bars comprises the words pinus futura gloriae miserere nobis, but in the third bar, at the words miserere nobis, the three remaining parts were added. and the subject given to them is differently elaborated along with the continuation of the chief theme. After the first working out, a second independent theme occurs. And is thoroughly worked out, together with the first. We see more of the actual workmanship in this than in others of Mozart's works in counterpoint, and the voices are treated less as such, and more as abstract vehicles for contrapuntal development. The Agnus Dei is a soprano solo. The passages for the voices and the concerted treatment of the accompanying instruments give a uniform impression of grace and elegance. This movement has a certain resemblance to many passages of Mozart's later operas. 
at the close the chorus as sometimes with hayden takes up again the principal subject of the curie and works it into a simple and appropriate ending to the litany mozart seems never to have composed an entire vesper during this period but the two final movements of one dixit and magnificat in c major crucial number one hundred ninety three written in july seventeen seventy four are preserved and are serious works in clever counterpoint the dixit is quite in the style of a short mass the different sections in counterpoint full of force and animation the gloria patri is an independent movement with a slow introduction to a short fugal movement in the words et in secula seculorum with a charming organ point the magnificat is grander in design and execution the virgin's song of praise forms a grand movement allegro moderato the theme of which from a third plain song tune of the magnificat is introduced by the tenor the bass immediately interposing a counter subject End of section 29, chapter 13, part 3. Section 30 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1 by Otto Yan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Suzique. The Life of Mozart by Otto Yan, section 30, chapter 13, part 4. These give the groundwork for the whole movement, elaborated in various forms of counterpoint and bound together by other freely treated episodical subjects. The doxology is again independently treated in two movements. The first is slow and is animated by a varied accompaniment. The second is a lively and conventional fugue. Among other minor church pieces, we may consider the Regina Celli. Two of these works, belonging to May 1771, and 1772, 108, and 127 K, are of similar plan and treatment. The first line is made into an animated chorus with the constantly recurring Alleluia as a refrain. The second is more moderate in tone, a soprano solo alternating with the chorus. The Ora Pro Nobis is an adagio for the solo soprano. The chorus chimes in at the close with the Alleluia. The character of the whole is lively and cheerful, almost merry according to the prevailing tendency of the age. Full opportunities for display are given to the solo voice, and many of the turns and passages are operatic. The earlier of the two compositions, in C major, reminds us more of the opera seria. The latter, in B flat major, is freer, and both voices and accompaniment have more independent life. A third Regina Celli, evidently of later date, 276K, in C major, combines the whole into a lively movement in which the solo voices interrupt the chorus. The claims of the vocalist are here kept in abeyance, and the work is full of life and energy, with here and there passages of a deeper significance, such as the beautiful Ora Pro Nobis. A tantum ergo in B flat major, 142k, for solo soprano, with a resounding phrase for the chorus, closing with a lively amen, is not remarkable. A second composition in D major, 197k, for a full chorus, if by Mozart at all, must have been written very hurriedly. A motet in C major, 117k, must, according to the handwriting, be ascribed to a very early date. A lively chorus, Benedictus sit Deus, without actual thematic elaboration, but with a free arrangement of the parts, forms the introduction to a soprano air, in Troibo Domun Tuam Domine, treated like a cavatina, simply although not altogether without embellishment. The conclusion is formed by a second lively chorus, Jubilate Deo, of which the second subject is the eighth psalm tone. Supported by four parts of the chorus in succession, to a florid accompaniment of the orchestra, the full chorus each time responding with a lively jubilate. An offertorium of uncertain date, Benedicte Angeli, 342k, 
is exclusively founded on the fifth psalm tone the verse is repeated in unison eight times by the whole chorus while the orchestra consisting of stringed instruments with two horns keeps the whole together and gives it intensified expression by means of a lively and varied accompaniment some smaller choral works are some of them harmonic some in more or less strict counterpoint to the former belongs the de profundis 93k in which the words of psalm 129 and the appended doxology are set to music without abridgment with little more rhythmical flow than the declamation of the words demands and in the simplest harmonic progressions a symmetrical work quiet and serious though without great depth of tone is formed out of these very simple materials the te deum 141k resembles in its first movements many of the shorter masses the words are sung once without a developed theme or well-defined passage the essential character of the work is modulatory the connection depending on the arrangement of the harmonies and the harmonic groups the voices merely sustain the harmonies without any prominent melodic peculiarities the conclusion forms an exception the words in te domine speravi non confundar in aeternum being worked into a conventional moderately long fugue issuing into a powerful and effective closing phrase a motet misericordias domini 222k which Mozart composed at Munich in 1775 as an exercise, is in counterpoint throughout. Padre Martini, to whom he sent it, September 1776, pronounced as his judgment on it that it contained all which modern music demands, good harmonies, rich modulations, moderation in the violin passages, a natural and good arrangement of the parts, and he added that he congratulated the composer on the progress he had made it was not without intention that the representative of counterpoint on the principles of the old roman school emphasized modern music the buon gusto of which did not altogether content him mozart divided the sentence misera cordias domini quintabo in aeternum psalm eighty eight the first words misera cordias domini are delivered in slow notes the second half in an agitated fugal passage without change of tempo moderato the two alternate and are developed with much originality especially the first movement where long sustained notes for the voice serve as an organ point against a passage for the violins and give rise to striking harmonic transitions and progressions the counterpoint of the second part is artistic and elaborate besides the principal subject of the fugue there are two others leading out of it treated in part independently in part in combination with the principal subject of each other the episodes are in strict counterpoint. The subject, as Stadler remarked, is borrowed from an offertory by Eberlin, Benedictisti Domini, but Mozart's treatment, as a glance at the opening will show, is thoroughly original. This admirable work has been overrated by Ulla Bikef, but very unfairly criticized by Thibault. He says, The words are capable of division into two short sections, Misericordias Domini, The Mercy of the Lord, Cantabo in aeternum, I will sing forever, but the division is not a real one, for there can be only one fundamental idea, either misericordia domini or cantabo in aeternum. If the former, then the cantabo should be subordinate. If the latter, the misericordias should be included in the exaltation. Mozart has so far given way to the love of the picturesque, to which Handel also made many sacrifices that the misericordias is to be sung softly but the cantabe in aeternum energetically and in a lively fugue passage when the last motif has been worked out the grave is repeated and then again the fugue it is evident that the law by which thoughts are expressed in speech does not altogether apply to musical expression but that with the introduction of a new element new rules are imposed since the words intelligently interpreted give the keynote to the whole conception it is the musician's task to embody the sentiments inspired by them in such forms as he has at his disposal the necessity for avoiding contradictions or inconsistencies is no barrier but rather an incentive to his creative energy but a contradiction may arise not only from a misconception of ideas but from the undue prominence of some one point which detached from the context injures the effect of the whole this would be the case here if as Thibault seems to indicate, the idea of the mercy of God and that of the praise offered to it were treated in absolute opposition and mechanical alternation one with the other. But this is not so. 
the motifs given to the words cantabo in eternum both in themselves and in the working out express nothing but firm conviction and desire to act upon that conviction we seem to view the spiritual condition of a human being who in spite of adverse fate and sorrowful experiences is never weary of praising the lord the cantabo is placed just as thibault demands that it should be as a contrast to the misericordias domini and the contrast is so harmoniously expressed and so consistently sustained as in no way to injure the musical effect of the work as a whole a very interesting composition belonging to the year seventeen seventy six is the offertorium de venerabili two sixty k venite populi for two choruses scored in eight parts it is imitative throughout less strict in form than usual the voices seem to take actual delight in their free movement the two choruses and the separate parts are clearly divided while maintaining natural relations with each other and the whole work is sharply cut and characteristic both in harmonies and in rhythm the principal movement is divided in the middle by a short slow movement having the same motif but in different combinations a sancta maria mater dei 273k for chorus composed in september seventeen seventy seven and an alma redemptoris mata two seventy seven k for solo and chorus of about the same date judging by the style are very differently conceived they are simple in design and in treatment quiet and mild in expression delicate lights and shades betray the hand of a master conscious of his power and stir the feelings and satisfy the sense of beauty of his hearers equal genius is displayed in the selection of simple means and the ease with which the right effect is given at the right moment and every now and then a delicate harmonic inflection or a charming little motif in the accompaniment leaves us in no doubt as to mozart's individuality the survey we have taken of mozart's church music will give some idea of the industry with which he strove to master the various forms of his art as well as the ease and fertility of his production and the truth of his artistic feeling remembering his activity in operatic music we are amazed at the wealth of his many-sided genius but the unceasing exercise of all his musical powers serves to explain in part the marvellous acquaintance with all the technicalities and forms of his art which not even the possession of great genius can account for in so youthful a composer external circumstances influence not only the conception and treatment of church music but the means and disposal for its performance mozart's chief dependence in salzburg was on the chorus and is shown in a letter november fourth seventeen seventy seven where he says that none of his masses can be performed at mannheim because the chorus was bad and the orchestra must be the first consideration this is confirmed by the works themselves of which the choruses are always the main substance mozart found his materials ready to hand in the carefully instructed church singers and chapel choir he had himself received vocal training even as a boy the correct delivery and good management of his voice excited astonishment and though he lost his voice on attaining manhood his intercourse with trained singers gave him an accurate knowledge of the voice and its treatment careful as mozart is to arrange each part easily and conveniently for performance yet he always reckons on well-trained singers and even exacts from the choristers where occasion requires not a little skill in taking intervals and in execution and intonation above all he demands the intelligent delivery of a singer who knows how much depends upon it the treatment of the solo voices as regards execution does not differ in church and operatic music frau haydn and meissner marie anna braunhofer and jos spitzeider had received good practical training but they were not such remarkable performers as to call forth new or original creations when the solo voices are not treated with a view to executive display they are all together in the style of chorus parts the organ as the instrument appropriate to the church invariably accompanies the singing so that in all mozart's church compositions the bass part is figured carefully sometimes by his father's hand and it is sometimes but rarely employed obligato as in the benedictus two five nine k and then treated in easy style next to the organ come three trombones essentially the support of the chorus played in virtue of his office by the stadhurmermeister and two of his subordinates 
following ancient tradition they sounded in the tutti in unison with the three lower voices of the chorus the trombones were generally left unindicated in the score and only the places marked where they were to be silent this curious prominence of the brass instruments whereby the soprano part is left unrepresented was usual at the time and could not be dispensed with in the church trombones are seldom used independently by mozart and then in the simplest manner the stringed instruments served as independent orchestra and were generally only two violins and violoncello the tenors strengthened the violoncello and went with the organ bass the stringed instruments were strengthened as far as possible and treated so as to counteract the disadvantage they were at in contrast with the chorus trombones and organ when the violins are not with the voices the passages are disposed so as to have the best effect and they frequently play in unison this explains the partiality for running passages for the violins which are not expressive in themselves but serve to amplify the rest it was a higher task to give the violins a character really independent of the chorus to make them carry out their own motif either in one part only in opposition to the chorus or in joint development in almost all mozart's masses the effort is visible at any rate in some places to treat the stringed instruments independently as his artistic sense matured they were used more freely and with more careful reference to sound effects as a variation in later works the damper was sometimes employed and more rarely the pizzicato besides stringed instruments trumpets and drums were generally used being almost indispensable for solemn high masses the constant use of trumpets as of trombones sackbuts was founded on the bible which speaks of their employment in the jewish temple worship and also careful and highly elaborated trumpet music played so considerable a part in court festivities that it could not well be dispensed with in church ceremonials in two masses one thirty nine one sixty seven k mozart has employed in addition to the two usual trumpets called clarini a tromba which has only to sound the low notes c and g and to strengthen the drums as regards other wind instruments we know that in 1757 oboes and german flutes were seldom heard in the cathedral and the french horn never this severity was afterwards relaxed until the oboe was used alone or as the principal wind instrument generally to support the voice or to strengthen the harmony it was allowed to assert its own individuality at a later time but this could only be when it retained its proper place among the different combined wind instruments flutes were only rarely used to replace the oboe in soft passages there were no clarinets in salzburg bassoons served as a rule only to strengthen the bass in various places where they like the violoncello were treated with some degree of independence it was so indicated in the score also when the tenors were associated with the wind instruments to complete the harmony they were supported by the bassoons the horns at first closely followed the trumpets but gradually attempts were made by the use of sustained notes to produce the sound effects peculiar to this instrument the freer treatment of the wind instruments passed to the church from the opera and those pieces which were altogether more freely treated than masses prepared the way for the change the orchestra of mozart's last two litanies is just as elaborate and careful as that of his operas and the later one does not only employ obligato solo instruments but in many of its sections approaches modern instrumentation we are unfortunately in considerable ignorance as to what masters were studied by mozart what has usually been said of his diligent study of bach handel and the italian masters is neither demonstrable nor probable there would scarcely be much opportunity at salzburg for the study of any but salzburg or south german musicians it is well known that some of these such as eberlin michael haydn and aldgasser were earnestly studied and highly esteemed by mozart but he first became acquainted with sebastian bach through van swieten in vienna although he may have come across detached organ and pianoforte compositions in salzburg he heard handel's oratorios as a boy in london but that was all and even at mannheim he took no great interest in the messiah it was again van swieten who led him to this master we may grant a stronger influence to the italian masters although the older italian church music was only exceptionally used at salzburg leopold mozart speaks of a gradual with which he had been much pleased as being the work of the celebrated long since deceased lotti november thirteenth seventeen seventy seven 
but we have seen with what zeal mozart studied in italy and a youth with his genius learned rapidly and could at once apprehend and retain whatever would be likely to benefit him he must also have taken home with him from italy much material for future use as we have seen in the case of the compositions of padre martini but what direction these studies took and how far they extended we are not informed it is not probable that mozart studied the old masters with the intention of forming his own style on theirs but rather that he might gain that super practice in technicalities which the tasks before him required end of section thirty chapter thirteen part four Section 31 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn. Translated by Pauline D. Townsend and others section thirty one chapter fourteen part one during the last half of the eighteenth century it had become the fashion in italy and elsewhere to perform detached instrumental pieces as introductions or intermezzi during the pauses in divine service they were written in the then customary symphony form music of a lively and secular tone not being thought out of place in churches brilliancy of effect was provided for by doubling the orchestra and other mechanical means besides forcible composition further innovations were made in allowing solo vocalists an opportunity of displaying their powers in church music and as a necessary consequence distinguished instrumental performers also were allowed to add their share to the attractions of divine worship instrumental concertos were played usually at the conclusion of the service without any regard to an ecclesiastical character we gather from dittersdorf's account of his competition with spagnoletti at the festival of st paul at bologna and its result that fine performances were thought as much of in the churches as in theatres and concerts at salzburg as mozart tells padre martini page two hundred and forty four a sonata was introduced between the epistle and the gospel until archbishop hieronymus replaced it by a gradual in seventeen sixty three seventeen compositions by mozart of this kind are preserved the earliest of certain date belongs to seventeen seventy five kerschel two hundred and twelve and others to seventeen seventy six kerschel's two hundred and forty one two hundred and forty four two hundred and forty five and two hundred and sixty three and seventeen seventy seven kerschel's two hundred and seventy four and two hundred and seventy eight but there are several almost certainly of earlier date his sacred sonatas were performed even during his absence according to his father september twenty five seventeen seventy seven after his return he composed three pieces of the kind the last in march seventeen eighty kerschel's three hundred and twenty eight three hundred and twenty nine and three hundred and thirty six they are all inscribed as sonatas, and all consist of a lively movement of moderate length in two parts, and in regulation sonata form. The church sonatas, sonad di chiesa, differ indeed from chamber sonatas, sonad di camera, in being serious, dignified, often fugued and in counterpoint but the style has nothing in it that suggests a sacred performance the tone is neither solemn nor devotional nor is the style severe the tone and treatment of the commencement remind us of the first movements of the smaller sonatas and quartets 
The subjects are small, sometimes very pretty, the treatment is free and skilful, and in the later pieces not without touches of Mozart's originality. They are usually written for two violins and violoncello, to which the organ was always added, but never obbligato, nor with any regard to executive display. It has often only its customary office of accompaniment to the violoncello, in which case a figured bass part is written. Even when the organ part is independent, it is for the most part limited to what the skillful organist can make out of the continuo. Its independence is very modest, and it never aspires to a solo or any passages. Sometimes trumpets and drums are added, Kerschel 263, as well as oboes, Kerschel 278, and horns, Kerschel 329. With the extension of the orchestra, the design and treatment became grander and more impressive, but still kept within comparatively narrow limits. Unhappily, these organ sonatas give us not the faintest idea of Mozart's much-admired organ playing. Not only were these compositions composed for special occasions, but all instrumental music at that time was in this sense occasional music. Orchestral compositions were, with few exceptions, written with a definite aim and under given conditions. Musical performances were the customary evening entertainments given by distinguished or wealthy persons in default of better, such as the theater. Those who maintained their own capella required daily performances, and in the evening, whether they were alone or entertaining company, a well-appointed concert. Sometimes noble, gentler men became so proficient on some instrument that it pleased them to take personal part in such concerts. Not to mention the noted examples of Frederick the Great and the Emperor Joseph, the elector Maximilian III of Bavaria was a performer on the bass viol and took part in the court concerts where his sister, Maria Antonia of Saxony, appeared as a singer. Sometimes also he played the violin in the symphony. The flute was an instrument much in vogue with noble amateurs, and was played by the Margrave Friedrich von Beroith, Duke Karl von Kurland, and Prince Joseph Friedrich von Hildeburghausen. The elector Karl Theodore played the violoncello, Prince Nicholas Estrahazy the baritone, Archbishop Maximilian the tenor, Archbishop Hieronymus adopted the violin as his instrument, after the example of the Emperor Peter III and the Crown Prince Karl Wilhelm Ferdinand von Braunschweig, and he amused himself with it alone after dinner. In the evening he took part in the concerts given by his choir. L. Mozart writes to his son, who had a great dislike to violin playing in court music, as a connoisseur, you will not be ashamed of the violin playing in the First Symphony any more than the Archbishop and all the cavaliers who take part in it. The distinguished amateurs did not indeed always improve the orchestra. On one occasion, the Empress Maria Theresa, having remarked in an undertone to Haydn that she wondered what would become of four noble amateurs who were performing with him if left to themselves, he played her the joke of quietly absenting himself with his next colleague and enjoyed the complete discomfiture of the gentleman brunetti who always stood at the archbishop's side used at different places quietly to take down his viola and strike in the archbishop let it pass and used even to say when he came to these places now brunetti will come in mozart had not the most favorable opinion of the archbishop's musical knowledge he writes to his father, Vienna, September 26, 1781, about the famous bass singer Fischer, who has certainly an excellent bass voice, although the archbishop told him he sang too low for a bass, upon which I assured his grace that he would sing higher next time. Public performers took the principal parts in these concerts, which fact was taken into consideration in forming the choir. 
care was taken to attract foreign artists and in the larger towns many public performers depended on the daily concerts for their means of subsistence their performances were long and included a great deal of orchestral music count fermian's musical soirees lasted from five to eleven o'clock and at one concert several symphonies by j c bach and four symphonies by martini were played dietersdorf produced twelve new violin concertos by benda on one evening at a concert given by the elector of bavaria Bernie heard two symphonies by schwindel a song by pazacci a scena by the electress of saxony a trio for bass viols by the elector a song by rosini a song by guadagni and a bass viol solo by the elector and at a private concert in dresden both parts contained a symphony a violin concerto a flute concerto and an oboe concerto the evening's amusement was generally further provided for by card-playing and conversation archbishop hieronymus limited the durations of his concerts l mozart wrote to his son september seventeenth seventeen seventy eight that they only lasted from seven to a quarter past eight and included only four pieces a symphony a song another symphony or concerto another song and then adio the court composer took the direction of the court music in turn with the kapellmeister every alternate week and the director for the time being had the choice and arrangement of the music except so far as it was directed by superior authority the position of mozart's father gave him constant opportunities to bring his son's instrumental compositions before the public the fame of the band was enhanced by the performance of works by one of the members and at every festival something new was performed dietersdorf relates that for the fete day of the bishop of grosswardein he composed not only a grand cantata with choruses and a solo cantata but also two grand symphonies at the beginning and close a middle symphony with obbligato wind instruments and a violin concerto in a similar position under prince estrahazy joseph haydn produced his incredibly numerous instrumental compositions mozart's fertility during the period of his independent activity in salzburg from seventeen seventy to the autumn of seventeen seventy seven was equally great but the merit of industry and fertility was one which these great masters shared with many contemporary lesser ones the skilful treatment of the orchestra rests mainly on the composer being so imbued with the spirit of the work as a whole as to be able to render the separate parts conducive to the general effect this can only be accomplished by continuous practical study most especially fortunate was mozart whose numerous appointed tasks not being merely abstract exercises served him as studies for his works the danger was indeed great that the influence of the schools and the force of traditional forms would tend to mechanical routine but it afforded another proof of mozart's creative nature that his unintermittent labor in mastering the technicalities of his art never interfered with the spiritual side of his genius many forms were in use for instrumental composition during the last century of which at the present day we can scarcely even distinguish the names or define the limits the so-called french symphony or overture introduced by lully and established through the school of scarlatti consists of a short slow movement preceding a longer and more varied one and repeated at the close this was opposed to the italian symphony which contained three movements an allegro at the beginning and another at the end separated by a slow movement in effective contrast to them both the first and the last allegro were however different in character the second being the quicker and more cheerful of the two it was easy to sever the slender connection between the symphony and the opera and operatic symphonies were soon performed alone as may be proved by the symphonies to the finta 
Semplice, the Sogna di Schiapone, and Lucio Silla. The continual demand for new symphonies cooperated with the increasing capacity of the instrumentalists and the fuller appointments of the orchestra in developing their importance and independence. In Italy, San Martini, commissioned by the governor, in Italy, San Martini, commissioned by the governor, Pellavicini, first wrote symphonies for full orchestra. He divided the tenors from the violoncelli, gave the second violins an independent part, and rendered service also to the technicalities of playing. In Germany, the composers of the Mannheim Capella, who were of the first rank, introduced this kind of composition with great success. But Joseph Haydn, who surpassed them all in his inexhaustible wealth of productive power, and in his thorough knowledge of his art, threw them quite into the shade, and may justly be considered as the creator of the symphony. The three movements were originally connected, but when the symphonies became independent of the opera, this was only exceptionally the case. Kirschel's 74, 181, and 184. The last symphony of the year 1773 shows that even in its maturity, an artistic mind may cling to long-established customs. The delicately elaborated Andante, full of original and tender sentiment, forms the climax of the work. The animated Allegro, which precedes it, is, with just discrimination, toned down towards the end to prepare for the Andante, whose yearning pathos leaves the mind unsatisfied, and whose subjects are arranged to favor the transition to the lively and restless concluding movement. As a rule, however, each movement was treated as a self-contained whole, which gave freer scope for the development of a definite idea. In the formation of the separate movements, the clavier sonata, in the perfect form given to it by Philip Emanuel Bach, acknowledged as a master by Haydn himself, had a very considerable influence. The first allegro was always in two parts. A short, slow movement, perhaps a reminiscence of the French symphony, was prefixed to it by Haydn, often by Mozart, rarely. A compact arrangement of well-defined subjects takes the place of the long-drawn thread of loosely connected phrases of the older symphonies. The first subject gives the tone of the movement, a second follows, contrasting in expression and structure, and generally a third is added, the connection is by means of free passages. It was long held as a fixed rule that the first theme should close on the subdominant, and that the second theme should be in the key of the dominant, in which also the first part of the movement concludes. In the second part, the elaboration of the subjects begins. The composer might please himself as to which of the subjects, or how many, or in what new combinations they were to be carried on. Nor was there any definite rule as to the method of elaboration, except that it always led back to the principal key and the first theme, which closed on the dominant and was followed by the second theme, also in the principal key. The first part might either be simply repeated with these modifications, or the change of key might be thoroughly carried out. Sometimes the second part was also repeated, and then followed the final winding up by a coda, which recurs to one or more of the chief subjects, and which was employed even when the second part was not repeated. The elements of this form had already been given in the aria, with its one main idea and its contrasting motifs, but the organic perfection of the form was first attained by instrumental music. Philip Emanuel Bach declared that the chief and best quality of music was melody, and this principle once recognized, the laws of song were adopted by instrumental music, although with many modifications, to suit the different characters of the instruments and the necessities of thematic elaboration. The chief improvement was the spirited development of one or more subjects to replace the tedious middle movement of the aria. 
the artistic development of these separate elements according to their true significance introduced both contrast and climax unity was assured since nothing foreign either to the form or the substance was admitted while the repetition of the first part like a dialectic exposition of an argument provides a clear and satisfying conclusion this working out part did not always receive its due share of honor and was often treated as a form of harmonic transition but it asserts itself more and more as the proper nucleus of the whole movement and has an important reaction on the formation and phrasing of the first part this becomes as it were the foundation prepared for the future development which first displays the whole extent of the conception the coda was usually confined to a lengthened development of the closing phrase and gathered to a point in pregnant brevity the most essential elements of the movement it had its counterpart in the cadenza of the aria after what manner great vocalists constructed their cadenzas we are unfortunately ignorant but instrumental cadenzas reproduce the principal subjects of the movement just as was the case in the coda beethoven who brought the coda to perfection has himself worked out the cadenzas in the concerto in e flat major the cadenza in the first part is identical in mechanism with the coda of one of his great symphonies the original middle movement has preserved a slower tempo and a moderate tone with simplicity both of design and composition the point of departure is the air lead romance or the cavatine of operatic creation mozart for instance took a melodious duet from his opera of hyacinthus for the andante of a symphony page ninety four there is no question here of artistic symmetry or elaboration of subjects one main subject dominates the whole often smothered with embellishments as the original stem of a tree is hidden by the creepers which grow from its roots the andante is often though not necessarily divided into two parts one or both of them to be repeated sometimes with a coda added in the second part a new statement of the subject generally takes the place of its actual development and the contrast of major and minor keys is made use of frequent repetition of a simple theme led to the introduction of variations sometimes strict sometimes free in form but in depth and originality always far inferior to thematic elaboration in the proper sense of the term the andante therefore long continued to be of minor importance both as to length form and substance it required not only the mastery of musical theory but the complete absorption of the individual in the artist before the innermost sentiments of the human heart in all their depth and fullness could be expressed in simple form as the poet expresses them in lyric verse the adagio of instrumental music is in its most perfect form essentially a german creation but it became what it is apart from the influence of the newly awakened german poetry each in its separate sphere felt the vivifying spirit of the age like the fresh breath of spring and awoke together to life and beauty as the substance of the slow movement grew in interest and importance the form also became fuller and richer without however any essential alteration the most magnificent of slow movements have all the main points that we have noticed above and are only in details freer and more full of life and significance the closing movement generally in three eight six eight or two four time has something of a dance tone though not of set purpose the rondo form very freely treated soon became paramount the impressiveness of frequent repetition of the same melody the freedom and ease with which the connecting phrases could be treated the surprises to which ingenious returns to the theme gave rise all made this easy form very appropriate to a closing movement what was demanded from instrumental music was such a pleasant sense of enjoyment as would relax the mind without straining the attention
and a cheerful conclusion was considered essential. But by a singular inconsistency, the last movement was sometimes made the field for the display of skill and counterpoint. Masters of the art required that a genuine artist should know how to render cheerfulness and whimsicality, spirit and fun, even in the strictest forms. So it is customary to this day to introduce contrapuntal work into the scherzo, the proper field for musical wit and humor. This, too, is a production of German instrumental music. To the three original movements of the symphony, the minuet was added as a fourth, suggested probably by the suite. The suite, whether for orchestra or clavier, came to perfection in the 17th century and consisted of a succession of dances in the same key, but differing in time, rhythm, and expression, and for the most part highly characteristic. Matheson enumerates them as follows. Minuet, Gavat, Bourret, Regadon, Gig, Polonaise, Anglaise, Country Dances, Ballads, Hornpipes, Passepier, Sarabande, Courant, Allemande. Others give Allemande, Courant, Gig, Passacaille, Gavat, Minuet, Chacon, the chief forms being Allemande, Courant, Sarabande, and Gig. An introduction, prelude, fantasia, or overture preceded the dances, consisting, after the French fashion, of a slow and a lively movement, the latter generally elaborated and returning to the former as a conclusion. It is evident that the suite was the foundation of the Italian operatic symphonies, not of our modern symphony and sonata forms, but much was doubtless borrowed from the long list of dances as embellishment to the symphony proper. Whether or not Joseph Haydn was the first to introduce the minuet into the symphony, it was he undoubtedly who gave it its peculiar and typical character. The minuet was the dance of good society, offering opportunity for the display of dignity, grace, and deportment. We cannot hear these minuets which best reflect the character of the dance without thinking of powder and hoops. And now that the manners it suggests have become obsolete, it can only be humorously reproduced. Haydn did not parody the minuet of his time, but he divested it of its distinguishing dignity. He took it as it was danced by the middle classes and filled it with national cheerfulness and good humor. He represented a certain amount of joviality and a rollicking fun, which would have been inadmissible in the salons of the noblesse, and he was inexhaustible in witty suggestions and surprises without any taint of vulgarity or carelessness of musical treatment. This was being popular in the best sense of the word. The spirit was genuinely national, the form truly artistic, and so the minuet took its place in the symphony and kept it the position given to it in relation to the longer movements varied in early days mozart generally places it after the andante mozart's first symphonies have only three movements and it is perhaps not merely accidentally that the minuet is first introduced in the symphonies composed at vienna in 1767 and 1768 but it is sometimes wanting in later works it is interesting to trace in his youthful works Mozart's gradual progress in mechanism and practical skill. At first there is little melodious invention, but a sense of effect and a knowledge of form always exist, and by degrees the symphonies acquire body and character. Command of the orchestra makes itself felt by degrees. First the separate parts become free and independent, a special movement is given to the second violins by characteristic passages and imitative treatment, and the basses, too, gain life and independence. They are in free imitation for the first time in a symphony in G major, no Kerschel, belonging to the year 1771. As development proceeded, the subjects became fuller, and the whole work gained in consistency and substance although it still wanted finish and elaboration the peculiar character of the string quartet became more and more prominent 
For a long time it formed the nucleus of the symphony, the wind instruments strengthening the harmonies and emphasizing some particular melody, but only very gradually contributing to effects of light and shade. Oboes and horns, trumpets too, generally without drums, are combined according to rule and gave the orchestra a sharp, clear tone, which was then admired. Flutes were employed in movements of a gentle character, usually with muted stringed instruments. It was not until later that the bassoons were made independent of the basses, and then they served, like the tenors, for middle parts. Many and diverse experiments were made in the employment of new instrumental forces before the various parts of the orchestra were successfully combined into a self-contained and living whole. End of section 31, chapter 14, part 1. Recording by John Crean, Lilburn, Georgia. Section 32 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Crean, Lilburn, Georgia. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn. Section 32, Chapter 14, Part 2. Translated by Pauline D. Townsend and others. Nothing whatever is known of Mozart's models in his instrumental music. We may take for granted that he knew Joseph Haydn's symphonies and that they were not without some influence on his genius, but few actual traces of them can be discovered, while his conception of the minuet was altogether different and remained peculiarly his own. The jovial humor and the delight in musical drollery, which are Haydn's characteristics, are never predominant with Mozart. He preserves a national tone, truly, but the interest it excites is due to the ennobling and beautifying spirit which he throws into it. This side of Mozart's nature appears even in his earlier works, and makes us the more ready to ascribe any lapse into fun and drollery to the direct influence of Haydn. The last symphony, in E-flat major, which is avowedly ambitious in conception, betrays undoubted external influence. Both the minuet and the lengthy and elaborate concluding rondo are decided imitations of Haydn. The andante is somewhat constrained and unnatural, but there is a second and later andante at the close, which is much simpler. Mozart's instrumental compositions up to the year 1772 are only interesting in so far as they show us how gradually and surely he gained possession of all the means his art could place at his command, but from this date they begin to acquire an independent interest. It is remarkable that we possess no symphonies composed by Mozart between 1775 and 1777, reflecting how carefully all the compositions of this time have been preserved, it is not probable that any can have been lost by accident. On the other hand, most of the great serenades and concertos for violin and piano fall within these years, and it is quite possible that Mozart's growing discontent with his position and the displeasure of the archbishop may have caused him to desist from writing symphonies which were primarily intended for performance at court concerts. We have further proof that Mozart wrote no symphonies during these years in a letter from his father on September 24, 1778, where he says, When a thing does you no credit, it is better that it should be forgotten. I have sent you none of your symphonies, because I feel sure that when you come to riper years and have a clearer judgment, you will be glad that they are forgotten, even though you may be satisfied with them now. Even the more important among the later symphonies are sparing in the use of means and precise in form, 
as indeed they were obliged to be considering that several symphonies were performed in one evening and yet mozart writes to his father from paris september eleventh seventeen seventy eight that he could not produce his symphonies there since they did not suit the french taste we germans like long pieces but in truth they are better short and good progress is shown in greater freedom of treatment the first movement of a symphony in d major kershaw two hundred and two and the last movement of the symphonies in g major kershaw one hundred and ninety nine and c major kershaw two hundred all belonging to seventeen seventy four are full of life and vigor these qualities presuppose more individuality in the details the interludes are developed with more independence and the loosely connected violin and violoncello passages disappear altogether many of mozart's special characteristics exist side by side with turns of expression common to the time for instance the second theme is sometimes an offshoot from the first and the introduction of a new subject at the close of the part often gives a new impetus to the movement the symphonies in g minor kershaw one hundred and eighty three and in a major kershaw two hundred and one may serve as very opposite examples of mozart's works of the kind the first has a serious tone from the first subject onwards the minuet and finale more especially being almost gloomy in tone and the andante the same only somewhat softened down the second is full from beginning to end of cheerful humor and tender grace and may serve as an example of the way in which a work of art of perfect mechanism and delicate shading may be produced from the simplest materials if the minuets alone of the two symphonies be compared it will be acknowledged that an artist who within such confined limits can produce impressions of delicate wit and humor on the one hand and of gloomy discontent and agitation on the other has a full mastery of the forms and capabilities of instrumental music the symphonies of that time do not as a rule attempt to express passion or tragic emotion they are with few exceptions intended to promote social enjoyment consequently their essential characteristics are animation and brilliancy or else calm serenity the composer concentrated his efforts on the form and mechanism of his composition to express deep feeling or the secrets of his own heart would have been alike impossible to him as an artist and contrary to the spirit of the time a sharp line of division was drawn in theory and practice between human and artistic emotions and any display of subjective emotion was discouraged in the year seventeen seventy four werther appeared the strivings and conflicts of the time which produced it had their influence on music but music had to pass through a longer and more arduous struggle before attaining to a like freedom of inspiration and expression the evident strivings of the youthful mozart to express himself and his innermost feelings in his music affords a significant indication of his development as an artist life had not taught him the lessons of passion and disappointment and his nature was too sound and healthy to attempt to anticipate or represent emotions which had not touched him he shows himself to us as he is the symphony was not then as it is now the grandest and most comprehensive form of orchestral music the first place was given to the so-called serenata a name originating in the circumstances of its composition and scarcely applied to a fixed or well-defined form the serenata was distinguished from the symphony in its narrow sense by greater variety and wealth of ideas and treatment several instruments are often grouped together in different combinations and solo instruments are variously employed also the number of separate movements often reaches as many as eight for the arrangement and manipulation of the movements the perfected forms of the symphony are employed but with numerous modifications serenades were introduced and sometimes also concluded by a march kershaw thirty nine this was concise in form and simple in treatment very often without even a trio 
it was generally lively and cheerful the detached marches by mozart which are preserved were doubtless intended for introductions to serenades they were often transferred from one to another and so were written separately the minuet is almost invariably inserted between each andante and allegro and therefore occurs two or three times in the symphony the omission of all the other forms of dance music so amply represented in the suite is a proof that this form of instrumental music was not intended for practical use at least in this juxtaposition variations were sometimes made in the character of the minuets by changes in the instrumentation more especially in the trio several trios were frequently given in one minuet with appropriate instrumentation making use of obbligato violins kerschel's one hundred and eighty five two hundred and three two hundred and four and two hundred and fifty flutes kerschel two hundred and four trumpets kerschel two hundred and fifty and sometimes the stringed instruments alone kerschel's one hundred and two hundred and fifty a grand allegro in two parts as a commencement and an allegro or presto at the close sometimes introduced by a short adagio form the main substance of the serenade as well as of the symphony and the movements are similarly treated the slow movement between them is in its turn between two minuets kerschel sixty two and there are sometimes two slow movements each with a minuet appertaining to them kerschel ninety nine and characterized by varied instrumentation as time went on an allegro was inserted between the two slow movements which however was rendered distinct from the two principal quick movements by its lighter coloring and tone the instruments too are grouped with more diversity for instance kerschel one hundred and eighty five the oboe and horn are employed obbligato in the first andante and the following allegro and in the second andante flutes are combined with the stringed instruments a singular use is sometimes made of obbligato violins in the serenade kerschel's one hundred and eighty five two hundred and three two hundred and four two hundred and fourteen two hundred and fifteen two hundred and thirty seven two hundred and thirty nine and two hundred and fifty after the first allegro the solo violins lead in three movements viz andante minuet and allegro rondo kerschel two hundred and fifty which are in a measure complete in themselves and form apart from their surroundings a complete symphony the expression finale musique which frequently occurs in mozart's letters seems to prove that these lengthy compositions with their concerted solo instruments form the conclusion of the concert the concertante symphonia of the two last serenades belonging to seventeen seventy four and seventeen seventy five kerschel's two hundred and four and two hundred and fifty are conspicuous from their peculiar instrumentation in the other movements the usual oboes horns and trumpets are used as accompaniment to the obbligato violins flutes horns and bassoons and in the last movement especially the combination and treatment are quite modern these two serenades show altogether a marked improvement on the earlier ones which do not essentially differ from symphonies the orchestra is firmly handled and the orchestral subjects freely elaborated each of the many movements of the last serenade is worked out as carefully and lovingly as if it were the only one and the ideas and motifs are so full of meaning and of jovial good humor that it is impossible not to feel that mozart has here put forth his best powers a short serenata kerschel two hundred and thirty nine consisting of a march minuet and rondo interrupted by a short adagio was written in january seventeen seventy six for stringed instruments and drums only a sort of chorus of two solo violins accompanied by violas and violoncelli is opposed to another composed of two violins viola and violoncello with the drums all treated as tutti parts such admirable use is made of the contrast and combination of the two choruses of the tutti parts and of varied sound effects such as 
pizzicato, etc., and even the drum is so skillfully employed that this little work has taken a highly original coloring. With true tact, the separate movements are made short in order that the singular charm of the piece may not suffer from the fatigue of the year. The same praise may be bestowed on a nocturne, Kerschel 286, for four orchestras, each consisting of a stringed quartet and two horns, so arranged as to represent a threefold echo. When the first orchestra has played a connected phrase, the second orchestra falls in at the last bar with the same, or with the four last bars of the same. The third follows the second at the last bar with the three last bars, and the fourth comes in in the same way with the last two bars. Then the first orchestra continues the theme. In this way, all the three movements, Andante, Allegro, and Minuet, are managed with but slight modifications. Only the trio of the minuet is played by one orchestra alone, or by all together. It need scarcely be said that the omission of the echoes does not affect the connection of the parts. The main point in such a trifle as this is to carry it out with as little visible constraint as possible. There is an especially good effect in the minuet, where short passages follow each other in rapid succession, falling in at different parts of the bars, and the way in which, in the first part, the horns alone conclude a phrase with cutting each other short in the most important manner is truly comical. Similar instrumental compositions to this are called by the name of divertimento or cassatio, which last term has never been satisfactorily explained, in which the various parts are simply arranged. The first of these, Kerschel 113, composed in Milan in 1771, Concerto Asia Divertimento, has the four movements of the symphony, the last in rondo form, and resembles the symphonies of that time also in the brevity and conciseness of its arrangement. The strings are not obbligato. The wind instruments, two clarinets and two horns, although not concertante, are more than usually independent. For a later performance, probably in 1773, two oboes, two English horns, and two bassoons were so added that the clarinets might be omitted. The stringed instruments were left untouched. The strengthening of the wind instruments was utilized for the alterations with slight and clever modifications. In the next divertimento, belonging to June 1772, Kerschel 131, Consisting of seven movements, the combination of the different instruments, four horns, flutes, oboes, and bassoons, is varied with evident care. The first adagio is for strings alone, the second for wind instruments. The first minuet is for strings. The wind instruments alternate with each other in the three trios, and all the instruments unite in the coda. In the second minuet, the four horns are especially prominent. In the third movement, an allegretto, the flute is obbligato and the horns are silent. In the first and last movements, all the instruments work together. A divertimento, singular in many respects, in six movements for oboe and two horns, together with stringed instruments, seems to have been written quickly for some special occasion in July 1776, Kerschel 54, and then to have been laid aside. The score is hurriedly jotted down on already used music paper of different shapes, with abbreviations, directions for the copyist, and various corrections. The second minuet has no trio, but is three times varied. The oboe is prominent and striking, not in passages, but in sustained notes and tuneful melodies. The stringed instruments, without being actually concertante, enliven the whole by their free arrangement of parts. The national German character of the melodies is very noticeable. They remind us, in style, of popular German songs. The alliance of the horns with the strings was a favorite one at the time, although the instruments do not readily blend. 
the freer the thematic elaboration of the string parts the more difficult it became for the horns to keep pace with them although now and then fine effects might be produced by their means the difficulty was not so to engraft as it were the horns on the stringed instruments as to leave them free play for their own natural effects and to produce a certain richness and depth of colouring not attainable without their aid in a divertimento written about seventeen seventy three or seventeen seventy four kershaw two hundred and five two horns are in union with violin tenor and violoncello strengthened by a bassoon it is short and precise but cleverly written the adagio is a duet for violin and tenor to a very simple bass the horns being silent it must be remembered that such pieces as these were always accompanied on the clavier two divertimenti or cassationi as they are oftener called in the letters for string quartet with two horns kershaw two hundred and forty seven and two hundred and eighty seven were written in june seventeen seventy six and june seventeen seventy seven for the fete day of the countess antonia lodron they are finished works of the genuine mozart type both have six elaborately worked out movements and abound in grace and fertility of invention and in skilful harmonic treatment the style is that of a true quartet that is the instruments have each their independent part but the first violin as a solo part is markedly predominant in the first divertimento in f major kershaw two hundred and forty seven it sustains the melody in every movement but is bravura and concertante only in the adagio in the second divertimento in b flat major kershaw two hundred and eighty seven which is grand in design and composition the first violin is treated as a solo instrument throughout with a strong tendency to bravura the remaining instruments cooperating in such a way as to display the creative spirit of an artist in every detail however delicate or subordinate in the very first thematically elaborated passage the solo passages for the violin occur which it is the chief concern of the second part to elaborate the second place which in the former divertimento kershaw two hundred and forty seven was given to a simple exceedingly graceful andante grazioso a kind of song without words is occupied in the latter kershaw two hundred and eighty seven by an air with variations in which all the instruments take part but the violin most prominently and with more of the executive bravura than any of the others this is most apparent in the two minuets but it is very decided also in the broadly conceived adagio where the second violin and tenor are muted the violoncello plays pizzicato while the first violin leads a melody richly adorned with figures and passages and requiring the execution of a finished performer the use of muted strings especially in slow movements was very frequent at that time in accompaniments as well as in symphonies and quartets and was intended to produce variety of tone coloring the violoncello not being muted but pizzicato afforded a contrast of tone the concluding movement is introduced by an andante with a recitative for the first violin not too long and so worked out that the whole compass of the instrument is characteristically displayed a long molto allegro follows this introduction in three eight time which keeps the violinist in constant movement and gives him an opportunity of displaying the variety of his technical skill but the movement is carefully planned and composed due consideration being given to each part in its place the recitative recurs at the end followed by a short and brilliant conclusion the tone of this movement is not as cheerful as usual it is full of impulsive haste and changeful humor and its stronger accent betrays a certain intensity even in the introductory recitative the third divertimento in d major kershaw three hundred and thirty four may be most fitly noticed here although it was not composed until seventeen seventy nine or seventeen eighty since it accords in every respect with the two last mentioned 
in breadth of conception and grandeur of composition it stands nearest to that in b flat major the first violin is perhaps less elaborately treated and the tone of the whole is somewhat calmer and more cheerful mastery of form in plan grouping and arrangement is perfect in both compositions as well as freedom and ease in the elaboration of the subject as if they sprang spontaneously forth as expressions of thought each in its proper place and degree perhaps the first movement is grander in design and has broader motifs than the later work but the adagio is deeper and more elaborate and the last movement is more original in the b flat major divertimento the remaining movements are fairly equal it was the b flat major divertimento that mozart played at munich in seventeen seventy seven as if he was the first violinist in europe so that everyone stared it is evident that difficulty of execution in his composition for the violin which is more noticeable after seventeen seventy three kept pace with mozart's progress as a violinist end of section thirty two chapter fourteen part two recording by john crean lilburn georgia Section 33 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1 by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Crean of Lilburn, Georgia. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn. Section 33, Chapter 14 part three a style of composition much in vogue at that time was the so-called harmonie music for wind instruments alone sometimes it was used as serenades sometimes people of rank had performances of six or eight part harmonie music morning and evening during meals in which they were imitated by the more pretentious tavern keepers there was opportunity enough for cultivating this branch of composition at Salzburg. In form, these compositions, which were generally called divertimenti or partita, partai, resembled those just described. They consist of three, four, or sometimes more movements, which were grouped without any fixed rule. One divertimento, Kirschel 186, closes with a contredans sans rondeau. Another, Kirschel 240, had an andante as first movement then follows a minuet and then a polonaise a third kershaw two hundred and fifty three begins with an andante and variations the first two pieces of this kind are both scored for ten parts two oboes two clarinets two english horns two french horns and two bassoons since one of the divertimenti kershaw one hundred and sixty six was composed at Salzburg on March 24, 1773, and the other probably at much the same time, and since there were no clarinets in the usual Salzburg orchestra, they must have been composed for some very special occasion. But neither the plan nor the composition are on a larger scale than usual. The work is wanting both in extent and expression, and the instrumentation is neither free nor forcible there are two striking partites one consisting of ten the other of six movements which were written for two flutes two trumpets in c and d and four drums in c g d a kershaw's one hundred and eighty seven one hundred and eighty eight about the year seventeen seventy three or seventeen seventy four apparently to employ the trumpet orchestra on some festival occasion whether the union of flutes with trumpets was founded on precedent or not i cannot say the flutes lead the melody and have allotted to them musical passages connected but short and unimportant in substance and style the trumpets seldom take part in the melody but are for the most part employed either together or separately as accompaniment the object has apparently been to preserve the effect of a body of sound in the trumpets as far as possible while aiming at giving them a definite musical form 
in the earlier and more prosperous times of the trumpeter's guild accomplished masters of horn playing would not have needed the support of flutes it is of more interest to note how a great master works within narrow limits and with small means at his command by a consideration of the first six divertimenti for two oboes two bassoons and two horns kershaw's two hundred and thirteen two hundred and forty two hundred and fifty two two hundred and fifty three two hundred and seventy two hundred and eighty nine which were composed between seventeen seventy five and seventeen seventy seven the destination of these trifling pieces as table music or such like allows neither greatness of conception nor any expression of deep feeling all must be pleasing cheerful and quickly over but mozart was not content with satisfying these conditions his harmonie music is full of delicacy and grace tender and pure in conception and touched with the firm hand of a master the details are carefully and neatly handled without any exaggeration little side touches are scattered freely about here an imitation there an original passage or turn in the middle parts making the whole interesting and full of life happy instrumental effects abound and by varied combinations and changes of tone coloring the outline of the symmetrical structure is thrown into clear relief in spite of the limited means at command just as a painter in monochrome shades his one color with such skill as to give a plastic roundness to his forms this species of instrumental composition as it developed became limited curiously enough to stringed instruments for the most part in quartets for two violins tenor and bass replaced by the violoncello more rarely in quintets with either the tenor or the violoncello doubled or in trios they were still called divertimento or cassation and did not originally differ from this class of composition either in form or in liberty as to the number and arrangement of movements the rule that the quartet as the whole species came to be called should consist like the symphony and the sonata of four fixed movements was laid down by joseph haydn it was his inexhaustibly fertile invention and his freedom in the treatment of form which nourished and developed the germ of this chamber music until it bore the most beautiful blossoms of german musical art mozart destined later to surpass in this direction his freely acknowledged example displays evident tokens of haydn's influence even in his youth on the whole however quartet music does not seem to have enjoyed much favor in salzburg mozart's not very numerous attempts fall in earlier years and were not all written in salzburg mozart's first quartet in g major kershaw eighty was composed on the first journey to italy at lodi on march fifteenth seventeen seventy at seven o'clock in the evening a circumstance of which he preserved the memory long afterwards the concluding rondo is written in a later hand on different paper and perhaps the whole consisted originally of only three movements adagio allegro and minuet a clear insight into the essential condition of quartet style freedom and independence of all the parts a concentration of the whole work into a well-defined form together with a perfection of thematic elaboration are all plainly discernible in this first attempt which unimportant and wanting in originality as it may be yet gives the impression of a well-rounded piece of workmanship the second violin is worked out independently with special care in which the tenor participates less success has attended the effort for a free movement for the bass attempts in counterpoint as for instance at the beginning of the second part are as might be expected learner-like but they show that he knew what he was about the last movement betrays a firmer hand from the very beginning three short divertimenti follow in d b flat and f major kershaw 136 through 138 each having three movements composed at salzburg in 1772 precise and fresh in treatment but evidently only meant for exercises on the journey to milan at the end of october seventeen seventy two wolfgang beguiled the tedium of the way by composing a quattro and in milan he was again february sixth seventeen seventy three busy with a quartet under his father's directions 
this no doubt belongs to a succession of six quartets in d g c f b flat and e flat major kirschel's one hundred and fifty five through one hundred and sixty which judging from style and handwriting fall within this period they consist each of three movements two closing with the minuet kirschel's one fifty six and one fifty eight while the presto three eighths with which the first begins has quite the form of a closing movement the adagio which follows it is unusually serious a simple melody with a uniform accompaniment in rich harmonies this is erased and another substituted which is longer and more elaborate with a freer movement of the parts and a lighter expression in other cases the andante begins as in kirschel one hundred and thirty seven and is followed by the allegro these quartets are not of wide scope nor are the different movements actually elaborated but greater practice in composition is evident throughout the different motifs are better adapted for elaboration and there is a remarkable increase of skill in dealing with the smaller divisions of each part on the working out of which depend the life and unity of the whole conception the opening phrases repetitions etc are freer and better fitted in two-part imitation is sometimes neatly introduced and fluently and gracefully carried out the composer's power has evidently grown as he worked and the latter quartets are by far the most original the second movement of the fifth kirschel one hundred and fifty nine an allegro three four in g minor following an andante in b flat major has through its rhythm and modulation an expression of dry humor that is quite suggestive of one of the later scherzos six quartets composed in august and september of the same year at vienna stand on a far higher level and were probably written in order kirschel's one sixty eight through one seventy five the superscription of the first shows that the whole six were planned together they were written in quick succession and their variety represented the different tendencies of the quartet style in vienna of all places the birthplace and domain of haydn's chamber music the ambitious youth would exert himself to satisfy the demand for the highest class of compositions most of them have the approved four movements and the composer's invention and execution keep pace with the more extended scope of the composition the quartets are manlier and more mature than in the earlier works of the kind but the singular beauty of form the grace and freshness of mozart in his full development only show themselves in momentary gleams of inspiration an effort to mould the raw material into form by means of skilful workmanship and to make it subservient to the spirit is apparent throughout we can see traces already of the study and preparatory work which resulted in the fine and serious compositions of the following year the masses in f and d major and the litany in d major first and foremost is apparent the effort to analyze and vary the musical materials ready to hand by means of counterpoint the first and last quartet end with the thoroughly worked out fugue complete with stretto and inversions the close of the first fugue ended abruptly mozart has therefore erased the last four bars and has substituted the subject in unison thereby producing a lengthened and very effective conclusion the second fugue is not by any means so fresh and lively as the earlier one but it is richer in artistic work nor are mozart's studies in counterpoint apparent here only an adagio in kirschel one hundred and sixty eight begins with a four-part canon and retains the same character although not so strictly carried out in tone and substance this is one of the best of the series imitation is the rule in the elaboration of the first movements and in the last quartet the whole of the first movement in d minor is built upon one characteristic motif a free movement of the parts a skilful employment of passages variety of instrumentation and other such means for giving life and animation to the music are carefully provided more especially in the minuets an examination into details will discover traces of careful and delicate handling throughout the work there were more instances of fantastic ideas generally rhythmical in form 
than are usually found in Mozart. This is owing, no doubt, to Haydn's influence. The slow movements are, for the most part, expressive of simple feeling, the andantino gracioso of the last quartet being especially tender and graceful. The closing rondos are least significant. They are not worked out, and the different parts are put together without any true connection. The demands on the instruments are increased in comparison to the earlier quartets, but there is still no bravura. The first violin leads the parts, but is not treated as a solo instrument. In fact, all four instruments are treated in essentials as on an equality, so that the tone and character of the whole regulate every detail, thus fulfilling a fundamental law in the composition of quartets. It must have been as a result of his Vienna studies that Mozart wrote a quintet, Kerschel 174, after his return in December of the same year. Perhaps the example of Michael Haydn had some influence. Mozart writes from Munich, October 6, 1777, that he had invited Herr Dubriel, a pupil of Tartini, and that they played Haydn's two quintets. Joseph Haydn declares, in answer to A. Romberg, who asked him why he has not written any quintets, that he had never been commissioned to do so. On the other hand, three quintets by Michael Haydn in F, C, and G major, dating between 1770 and 1780, now lie before me. Mozart's quintet shows unmistakable progress both the plan and execution are broader, and there is more of the true Mozart spirit in the conception of the motives. It is especially interesting to compare two different elaborations of the finale which exist. Mozart has taken the primary subject of the first work and treated it independently in the second, thereby providing a just standard of criticism against himself. The first theme in the later elaboration is quite new, and gives the key to the character of the movement. Then follows, as a contrasting motif, the chief subject of the former work with suitable alterations. Originally this consisted of eight bars, and was in three parts. Boop, boop, boop. Need to insert a wave file. Boop, boop, boop. But afterwards, the two first bars form the subject taken up by one part after the other, while the minims, which are appended to the rapid semiquavers, give an effect of rhythmical and harmonious climax. Boop, boop, boop. Insert a wave file. Boop, boop, boop. It results from this that the divisions next following are easier and more flowing while on the other hand the preparation for the third principal motif is broader and calmer. This third motif gives occasion for an especially happy modification. Originally, it ran thus. Boop, boop, boop. Insert a wave file here. Boop, boop, boop. And was then repeated entire. But now only the first four bars are retained. The four last are omitted, and the movement and expression are provided by a shake passage. The conclusion of the first part is rendered more impressive by a new and broader motif, and more homogeneous and concentrated by the recurrence of the first subject. The working out of the second part, which was confined to the elaboration of the first two bars of the original motif, is partially retained, but it is extended by the recurrence and elaboration of the principal theme. Finally, a new and important climax is introduced in the coda by the opposition of the two chief subjects. This work may be taken to prove that Mozart was a severe self-critic and was not by any means always content with his first attempts. It can only be by chance that no other example of remodeling a composition has been preserved. The earlier attempts and studies would, no doubt, be generally destroyed. The greater part of Mozart's works of this period have been preserved in carefully written fair copies. We are amazed at the vigor and ease with which he worked, but it would be wrong to represent him as able to dispense with studies and preparatory sketches even for his great works. The creative power of genius is indeed a gift of nature, but a mastery of art is only acquired by hard labor and pains. Strength to labor indefatigably and ability to make the labor bear fruit are the prerogatives of genius. 
it would be doing Mozart an injustice, to deny him the reputation of true and conscientious industry. The beauty of perfect work proves not that no labor has been bestowed on it, but that the labor has been successful. Mozart's youth was occupied with his endeavors to master the forms and materials which he found ready to hand, and he would not be likely to neglect studies and exercises to this end, though he might not think them worth preserving. There must have been little encouragement accorded to quartet music in Salzburg. After 1773, Mozart composed none until 1784, when he was in Vienna. There can be no doubt that the talent for violin playing which Mozart displayed at a very early age was carefully cultivated by his father. He performed in public on his first journey and at the beginning of the first Italian tour, but by the time they reached Rome he had ceased to play in public, though he still continued his studies regularly. It was part of his official duty in Salzburg to take the violin at court concerts. His father admired Wolfgang's effrontery in taking a violin from one of the orchestra at Vienna in 1773 and performing a concerto upon it page 146. He afterwards devoted more serious attention to the instrument and became a first-rate performer on it, but evidently more from his father's impulse than his own inclination. Not only was the violin playing at court a burden to him, but he seems to have had little liking for the instrument and no real confidence in his own powers of execution. "'You have no idea yourself how well you play the violin,' writes his father, October 18, 1777, if you only do yourself justice and play with fire, heartiness, and spirit, you may become the first violinist in Europe. But nevertheless, he practiced regularly and industriously, and his father wrote after he had left home, October 6, 1777, I feel a little melancholy whenever I go home, for as I get near the house, I always imagine that I shall hear your violin going. After 1774, Mozart's violin compositions take more of the bravura type and afford a good standard of his technical development. He had as a rival the well-established solo violinist Brunetti, favored by the archbishop as being an Italian, but considered by L. Mozart as inferior to his son. He played your concerto very well, wrote L. Mozart, October 5, 1777, but was twice out of tune in the Allegro, and once almost stuck fast in a cadenza. When Brunetti's inconvenient rival had left Salzburg, he was ready to do full justice to his performances. Brunetti cannot praise you enough, writes the father, October 9, 1777, and the other day, when I said you played the violin passablamenti, he cried out, Cosa craso, se suo nova tutto, chestro era del principe un puntiglio mal inteso col suo proprio dano. After Mozart had left Salzburg in September of 1777, he played the violin in public both at Munich and Augsburg, and was somewhat ironical over his success. They all stared. He writes from Munich, October 6, 1777, I played as if I was the first violinist in Europe. And from Augsburg, October 24, 1777, I played a symphony and one hall's concerto in B-flat for the violin with universal applause. At supper time, I played the Strasbourg concerto. It went like oil and everyone praised the beautiful pure tone. But these communications ceased later on, and L. Mozart writes in Anxiety, October 9, 1777, Have you left off playing the violin since you were in Munich? I should be very sorry. November 27, 1777. Your violin hangs on its nail, of that I am pretty sure. And so it must have been. He was obliged to play the violin afterwards in Salzburg, but after his stay in Vienna he never made proficiency on the instrument his primary object, and it was well known that in later years, if he had to take part in a quartet or other concerted piece, he selected the viola in preference. End of section 33 Chapter 14, Part 3
Section 34 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Crean of Lilburn, Georgia. The Life of Mozart, by Otto Jahn. Section 34 chapter fourteen part four mozart's most important compositions in this department are of course his violin concertos which were doubtless written in the first place for his own use according to his custom he went thoroughly into the subject from its very foundation gaining proficiency by continuous work in the one direction in 1775 he composed five concertos for the violin Kirschel's 207, 211, 216, 218, 219, to which was added a sixth, Kirschel 268, not by any means slight fugitive attempts, but carefully conceived works of considerable compass in three movements, Allegro, Andante or Adagio, and Rondo. The first movement, which was the most elaborate is more suggestive still of the aria than is the corresponding movement of the symphonies there is the same fixed alternation between solo and tutti passages the same adornment of the solo part with passages and cadenzas and indeed the whole movement is a reminiscence of the serious aria on the other hand the structure is more condensed and more animated passages grow out of the principal subjects connecting and adorning them the movement falls usually into three main divisions the middle one corresponding to the same division in the symphony passes into another key and elaborates one or more motifs more freely than in the symphony and chiefly by changes of modulation and modification of the passages whereby the repetition of the first division is effected abundant variety of detail is produced chiefly by the different combinations of the solo part and the orchestral accompaniment the solo passages are not usually of great length solo and tutti alternating often and quickly the second movement is simple and rests essentially on the tuneful and artistic delivery of the cantiline embellishments are not excluded but they are kept in the background the character of the movement is generally light and pleasing but a deeper though always a cheerful mood sometimes makes itself felt the tone is that of a romance the polonaise like rhythm of the concerto in d major Kirschel two hundred and eleven is peculiar to it while the g major concerto Kirschel two hundred and sixteen has a regular and more broadly conceived adagio an adagio in e major Kirschel 261 composed for brunetti in 1776 because another probably the interesting adagio of the a major concerto Kirschel 219 was to studiert as l mozart writes october 9 1777 maintains a kind of medium it is more serious in expression and broader in conception than the romance like andantes but on the whole it is pleasing and pretty rather than grand the last movement is as a rule in the form of a rondo in which the solo part moves more freely especially in the connecting middle passages the passages altogether have now scope for expansion the tone being light and cheerful the form easy it is not unusual for passages in different time and measure to alternate in the rondo as in the d major concerto Kirschel 218 where an andantino gracioso 2 4 and an allegro ma non troppo 6 8 alternate in the g major concerto Kirschel 216 a cheerful passage in 3 8 is interrupted by an andante in g minor
followed by an allegretto in G major. That leads back to the first subject. In the A major concerto, Kerschel 219, the chief subject is tempo di minuetto, interrupted by a long allegro, 2-4, in A minor. In both these cases, the clearly expressed popular tone of the interpolated passages is remarkable and has a striking and pleasing effect. The allusion in the letters to the concerto with the Strasbourg points to one of these passages. The Strasbourg dance, which consisted merely in graceful movements, of the arms and poses of the body was generally executed by a very youthful couple within the circle of waltzers a decided progress is observable in the concertante for violin and viola with orchestral accompaniment kerschel three hundred and sixty four which was probably written in seventeen eighty it displays perfect finish in the conception of the separate subjects and passages power and melody in the development of the orchestral accompaniments and true artistic skill in the placing of turns and phrases where they will be most effective it is in the usual three movements but a more solid foundation and wider scope than usual are given to the form in order that the two solo instruments may have free play the tutti passages are longer and more important which entails more participation by the orchestra in the solo portions this gives a symphony-like character to the whole to which the solo instruments add a peculiar brilliancy in relation to each other they are simply treated they generally relieve each other either repeating whole phrases or sharing them between them when together they are mostly in thirds and sixths and there seldom occurs a true two-part passage in which the two instruments move freely and independently in this respect the concerton composed in seventeen seventy three kerschel one hundred and ninety is more artistic in design and in workmanship here the orchestra is in contrast with two solo violins to which the oboe is added as a solo instrument the violoncello though not so freely treated as the others is also often solo the usual concerto form is given to the three movements the middle movement being romance-like but more elaborate than usual to give employment to the solo instruments the violoncello though it does not take a leading part in this movement has an independent passage as accompaniment throughout the last movement is tempo di menuetto resembling those in the violin concerto in a major kerschel two hundred and nineteen the bassoon concerto kerschel one hundred and ninety one the clavier concerto in c kerschel two hundred and forty six the triple concerto kerschel two hundred and forty two and the clavier trio in b flat kerschel two hundred and fifty four the form of the minuet with several trios is treated with some freedom and approaches that of the rondo the forcible and independent treatment of the orchestra both in the tutti and the solo passages gives to the whole of this composition the character of a symphony but the solo parts are grouped with greater variety since there are four of them and they do not as a rule repeat the same passages or join in unison sometimes the violins alternate with each other sometimes the oboe joins them or opposes them sometimes the oboe and violoncello are both in opposition to the violins and sometimes all the four instruments move independently side by side a strict and ingenious fugal structure was required to give unity to this manifold variety in the first allegro especially the motifs are chiefly imitatively treated and sometimes the varied rendering of a phrase necessitates a change of instruments the coming and going of the instruments and their combinations are carefully planned as well as the part taken by the orchestra in producing the general effect in the two last movements alternation is the predominant principle and the parts are only ingeniously interlaced here and there the work displays throughout 
more of skilful mechanism and clever elaboration than of original invention and beauty the judgment of connoisseurs on mozart's technical treatment of the violin tends to show that the difficulties even in solo parts are comparatively small but that an acquaintance with the idiosyncrasies of the instrument which could only be gained violin in hand is always apparent all is made as smooth and easy as possible for the performer at the same time that effects of striking originality are produced our idea of mozart as a violin player will gain an interest by a knowledge of his judgment on other violinists as a child he had become acquainted at mayence with the violinist esser of whom the father writes later from salzburg december seventh seventeen eighty esser is a merry old simpleton but he plays when he is in earnest with a firm and remarkable execution and has a finer adagio touch than is the case with most allegro players but when he is in a joking mood he plays on the g-string alone with the greatest ease and plays pieces with a lead pencil on the strings wonderfully correctly and quickly he plays the viola d'amour charmingly but what struck me as particularly childish was his whistling of a recitative and aria equal to any singer with all the expression flourishes shakes etc in a truly marvellous manner accompanying himself on the violin pizzicato at the same time he laments that like the rest of them he cannot play without grimaces and absurdities on this point little wolfgang unimpressed by esser's tricks and tours de force had said that he played well but made too much of it and would do better to stick to what was written of ing franzel born seventeen thirty whom he heard at mannheim he wrote to his father november twenty second seventeen seventy seven i have had the pleasure of hearing herr franzel play a concerto on the violin i was extremely pleased you know that i am no great lover of difficulties he plays difficult passages so that one does not know that they are difficult and thinks one can imitate him which is true art he has also a good round tone every note is correct and clear he has a charming staccato in one bow up as well as down and i never heard such a double shake before in a word he is in my opinion no juggler but a very good substantial violinist mozart wrote an oboe concerto for the celebrated oboist gius ferlendi of brescia who was in the salzburg band in seventeen seventy five it does not seem to have been preserved he tells his father november fourth seventeen seventy seven that he has made a present of it to the oboist rom at mannheim who was wild with delight and played it five times with the greatest applause he sent from vienna for the little book containing the ferlendi concerto for which prince esterhazy had promised him three ducats another composition of mozart's was a concerto for the flute which according to schneidenhofen was performed by kosel in a serenade arranged by wolfgang for his sister this may have been the concerto in g major three hundred and thirteen which evidently belongs to this period a certain baron thad von dumitz was an amateur on the bassoon mozart composed three concertos for him one in c and two in b flat major kershaw one hundred and ninety one short and unpretentious as the instrument required also a duet for bassoon and violoncello kershaw two ninety two although from his earliest years mozart had excited lively admiration by his clavier and organ playing it will be better to consider his performances on these instruments later on when we shall have the assistance of more direct testimony we know little more of his studies than that he practised the clavier much and diligently which indeed requires no proof compositions by wagenseil paradis bach and lucchesi are incidentally mentioned as subjects for home practice there now remains to consider only the compositions for the clavier of which there are curiously few known some may have been lost but it is a fact that after his first childish attempts mozart composed comparatively little for the clavier during his residence in salzburg 
there was little opportunity of performing clavier compositions the instrument was not used solo in the court concerts private concerts were not profitable in salzburg and in society mozart generally made use of the clavier to improvise or prelude the lessons which he gave to ladies of rank afforded him an opportunity for composing but for these pupils he could only write showpieces to the earlier authentic clavier compositions belong the variations kerschel one hundred and seventy nine on a very popular minuet by the celebrated oboist fischer a bravura piece for the time full of what were then considered difficulties he had them sent to munich in seventeen seventy four in order to make a show with them and on the journey to paris we hear that he had recourse to the fisher variations when he was obliged to play in polite society proving that he was not provided with many compositions of the kind there were some clavier sonatas written at that time too which nonerl was instructed to bring to munich december twenty one seventeen seventy four the result being a commission from baron durnitz for six sonatas kerschel's two seventy nine through two eighty four they are often mentioned by mozart on the paris journey of seventeen seventy seven and he played them frequently in munich augsburg and mannheim with great success they consist after the old fashion of free movements the fourth forms an exception to the general rule containing a long adagio two minuets the second instead of a trio and an allegro the last is another exception the first allegro being followed by a rondo en polonaise like the violin concerto kerschel two hundred and eighteen ending with variations mozart spoke of sonatas as difficult which are now given as lessons to beginners february second seventeen hundred seventy eight nevertheless it is no small praise to him that after the lapse of ninety years the judicious treatment of the instrument the healthy freshness and finished form of these compositions entitled them still to be considered as the best foundation for a musical education any one capable of appreciating a work of art will find all its essential conditions fulfilled in these simple sonatas l mozart mentions in a letter december eighth seventeen seventy seven two forehand sonatas written by wolfgang for himself and his sister one may be the well-known b flat major sonata kerschel three hundred and fifty eight which mozart wrote for from vienna june twenty seventh seventeen eighty one the form is concise and little elaborated the essential condition that each player shall contribute his independent share to the general effect is kept duly in view a second sonata is not authenticated a trio for clavier violin and violoncello kerschel two hundred and fifty four belongs to august seventeen seventy six which according to mozart's munich letters october sixth seventeen seventy seven nannerl played at salzburg with janich and reichka it displays like all the compositions of this period completeness and roundness of form with maturity and cleverness of conception and surprises us by its animation and the tender beauty of many of its turns of expression the clavier is the chief instrument then the violin more simply treated but independent the violoncella does not yet receive full justice it is only used as a bass often effectively but never overstepping its narrow province after the violin d w concerto in d major kerschel one hundred and seventy five composed in december seventeen seventy three and played with applause at mannheim february fourteenth seventeen seventy eight and with a new finale at vienna march twenty second seventeen eighty two mozart wrote no clavier music until january seventeen seventy six when he composed a clavier concerto in b flat major kerschel two hundred and thirty eight another in april in c major for the countess lutzow kerschel two hundred and forty six and in january seventeen hundred seventy seven one in e flat major for madame genomi kerschel two hundred and seventy one this industry was not the result of caprice or chance 
composition went hand in hand with his development as a virtuoso and we can measure his progress by the increasing difficulty of his works unless he was to remain in salzburg all his life a professional tour to make himself known to the world became more and more a necessity both brilliant execution as a virtuoso and a supply of original compositions would be necessary conditions for such a tour wolfgang's prudent worldly wise father took care that he should be prepared on all points to ensure the success of the undertaking the most remarkable of the clavier concertos which in form and treatment resemble the violin concertos is the last kerschel two hundred and seventy one which in its freedom of form breadth of design and passion of expression approaches very near to the divertimento in b flat major kerschel two hundred and eighty seven which belongs to the same period the very beginning is original the clavier striking in with the first bars and so giving a peculiar tone to the whole movement not less original is the entrance of the solo passage proper the clavier falling in to the last bars of the gradually expiring tutti passage with a shake of several bars length out of which the subject springs the same turn is afterwards made use of at the close of the first movement the middle movement is called adantino but expresses deep and painful emotion and the cantilina repeatedly assumes a recitative like character in one beautiful climax the violins are in imitation ending with a perfect recitative the last rondo presto a capital exercise for the fingers in its unceasing rapid movement has a far more important character than is usual with concluding movements a long cadenza leads back to the subject the second time however it does not lead to the subject but to a minetto cantabile which kept in check by an orchestral accompaniment has more and more the character of a free fantasia and at last goes back to the subject in a new cadenza which leads to a brilliant conclusion a concerto for three claviers written in february seventeen seventy six in f major kerschel two hundred and forty two displays an increase in solo powers a title page carefully written by the father announces it as dedicato al incomparable merito di s ex la segura con ladron nata cont de arco e della sue figlie le segre cont aloisia e giuseppa we must not look for the same contrapunctal independence of the three instruments which we find in box concertos but there is no mistaking the cleverness and delicate sense of effect which are displayed in the varied combinations of the instruments the doubling of parts the strengthening of the melody or of the bass the position of the accompaniment and the alternation of the instruments the main object of the first movement is to give equal and yet individual effect to each of the three claviers although the third is hardly on a level with the other two in the two last movements the third instrument is still more in the background being chiefly confined to accompaniment so that in the finale it does not even take part in the cadenzas this made it easier for mozart to arrange the concerto for two instruments the solo parts so altered are preserved in his handwriting the tone of the concerto is lively and cheerful the whole is treated in an easy and happy vein of humor which entertains the players quite as much as the audience mozart seems to have been fond of this concerto and he informs his father with some satisfaction that it had been successfully performed both at augsburg october twenty fourth seventeen seventy seven and at mannheim march twenty fourth seventeen seventy eight the orchestra has a perfectly independent part in this composition but there is no very marked distinction between tutti and accompaniment the orchestra and clavier mutually support and further each other and their union results in a perfect work of art it is easy to estimate the claims made by mozart upon the clavier player the principal are simple and tuneful delivery of the melody clearness and precision in the embellishments which were more numerous than at the present day to suit the instrument than in use skill and steadiness in the running passages and shakes technical difficulties 
such as passages in octaves thirds or sixths occur seldom or never at this period the use of the left hand is also limited rapidity is only required in accompaniment passages and independence in the execution of left-hand melodies what the composer was able to accomplish with the limited means at his command lies clear before us the life which the virtuoso threw into his works by performances full of spirit and genius cannot be reproduced by any observation of form and mechanism end of section thirty four chapter fourteen part four Recording by John Crean of Lilburn, Georgia. Section 35 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn. Section 35. Chapter 15. Part 1. Our examination of the development of Mozart's youthful genius, as it is to be traced in the multiplicity and variety of his studies, may fitly be concluded by a rapid survey of what he had accomplished, and the position which he held at his entry into manhood. At twenty-one years of age, he could hold his own with the first masters of his time as a performer on the clavier, the organ, and the violin, and his powers as an executant were far surpassed by his accomplishments in every branch of composition remembering his numerous and successful contributions to theatrical music in serious and comic operas to church music of every kind and description to instrumental music both concerted and solo we are amazed at the ease and fertility of his producing powers not less than at the steady perseverance and earnestness of his studies he never begins at random and breaks off short, never yields to chance impulses, to be abandoned before their object is attained. His will is always consciously fixed on a definite end, and to that end he bends all the force and energy of his mind. No small share of the merit of this happy development must be accorded to his father, whose careful, and well-digested educational plan, as earnest and conscientious as it was far-seeing and full of love, counteracted the son's easy and excitable nature, and concentrated his whole strength on his artistic cultivation. But the greatest share, after all, falls to the admirable organization of Mozart himself. His nature was so genuinely artistic that musical perfection was the very germ of that inner being of which his works were the natural and inevitable expression. The precocity of his talent, which had produced these works at an age when most minds are only beginning to put their thoughts into articulate form, had in it nothing forced, strained, or disturbed. He seized instinctively on what was in harmony with his genius, absorbed it completely, and made it the stepping-stone to his upward progress. We have seen how he labored to become absolute master of every kind of form in his art, and how, step by step, his labors were rewarded. But no amount of external readiness and skill would satisfy him unless he could also give due expression to what moved his innermost soul and impelled him to production and so it is that even in his earliest works we find no opposition between their form and their substance so it is that they are always a whole at first insignificant enough both in substance and treatment but still 
a whole, contained in a definite expression of artistic form. Looking back at the history of an art which has been begotten and fostered by any nation, we see how it is now favored, now hindered, by external circumstances, how it strives and struggles through the long ages, possessing itself here by fits and starts, there by easy transitions, of all the means and forms necessary for its perfect practice. When at last the spiritual and intellectual life of the nation has become free and impelled to artistic activity, the great master arises, who, disposing at will of the inheritance of knowledge and genius bequeathed to him by his fathers, accomplishes the highest task of art in his representations of ideal beauty. The glorious contemplation of the organic development of a gifted nature, turning all to good account, and rejecting what impedes its growth so soon as it has served its turn, is open for us in Mozart. To him it was given to master the external conditions of his art on every side without injury to his individuality and creative force. Artist and man grew together. The deeper the passion and the more intense the emotion, the more grand and impressive became the forms in which they were embodied. And it is in this that consists the successful cultivation of any art in youth. In this mastery of the means, whereby the man in his maturity makes his genius felt without apparent effort. Whatever study and discipline could attain, Mozart had attained before he left Salzburg. It was time that he should emerge from his narrow surroundings, that he should win freedom and independence, both as a man and an artist, by contact with the world. The position held by Mozart at Salzburg, disproportionate alike to his performances and their promise, could not but fail to satisfy him as soon as he became aware of his own powers. His life would have been simply unendurable had it not been for the healthy family life which had been from earliest childhood the foundation of his moral and social existence. He grew up in an atmosphere of conjugal and parental affection, of sincere religion and conscientious morality, and of well-ordered economy which could not fail in its effect on his character. After God, Papa comes, was his motto as a boy and as a man. It was the keynote of the whole household, and we have seen, and shall see further, how fully Leopold Mozart deserved the trust reposed in him. It was absolute confidence, not timid fear, which bound wife and children to him and candor and truth ruled all the family intercourse. Not only the parents and children, but the brother and sister were devoted to each other. The similarity of their talents, far from exciting emulation or jealousy, only bound them closer together. The sister witnessed the brilliant successes of her younger brother with pure delight, and bore his teasing with unfailing good humor, sure in her turn of his ready and hearty sympathy in her joys and sorrows, whether great or small. Such a true family life as this, in which the servants and even the pet animals had their share, became all the firmer and hardier in proportion as circumstances narrowed the circle composing it. The primary motive power was the father's earnest devotion to duty, and his example gave weight to his unsparing demands on the labor and industry of his children. He considered the accomplishments of an artist as no mere pastime for hours of recreation, no passing breath of visionary inspiration, but as the ripe food of ceaseless labor 
of untiring progress in moral and artistic self-knowledge. He was not content to recognize in the wonderful, receptive, and productive powers of his son a passport to easy indolence, but strove to make him consider them as deposits to be turned to the best account by study and cultivation. He accustomed his children to work from their youth up, and made it his first object that their outer circumstances should afford them no excuse for idle hours. Custom, said he, is an iron path. For this reason he gave up every occupation, except the duties demanded by his official position, which might withdraw him from his children, especially all lessons, thereby entailing a considerable pecuniary sacrifice, for which the profits of his first professional journey could only partially compensate. But he had so firm a confidence in Wolfgang's future, and he kept this object so clearly and continually in view, that nothing could divert him from it. In the boy himself there was no cause for anxiety. His trust in his father was unbounded, his nature was pliable, and his zeal for his art so great that it was never necessary to incite him to industry. Indeed, his father often praises his energy and laboriousness. A further proof of the father's beneficial influence is the fact that Wolfgang did not yield to the temptation common to talented and lively youth in following momentary and one-sided impulses, but that he advanced step by step in a thorough and judicious cultivation of all his powers. The great number of his compositions of every kind which we have already noticed gives us no small idea of his industry. And we must remember that these performances were only possible as the result of continuous study and exercise, of which no outward sign remains. The father insisted on Wolfgang's making clear copies on quarto music paper, both of his own compositions and of examples of other composers. A long list of such exercise books, in gray-blue covers, with every kind of composition in Mozart's handwriting, arranged and titled by his father, affords the most speaking proof of the industry and regard for order and neatness in which Wolfgang was trained. Added to this was the continual hard practice on organ and clavier, which made him the finished performer he was, then his official duties at court and church, his frequent engagements to play in private circles, and finally the lessons which he was obliged to give. One wonders in fact where he found time for it all, in a day of only four and twenty hours. Nothing but the anomalous union of extraordinary genius, with regularity and order, could have produced so anomalous a result. Then again, L. Mozart was too far-seeing and cultivated a man to be satisfied with an exclusively musical education for his son. He took care that he should attain proficiency in foreign languages. He had learnt Latin in early youth, page 61, and some knowledge of it was indispensable for sacred composition, on which account his father enjoins him, October 15, 1777, always to use a Latin prayer book. He learnt to speak French and Italian fluently on his journeys, and his father was careful to keep up his knowledge of them. No opportunity was lost of acquiring any kind of useful knowledge, as Leopold writes, December 18, 1777, in order to cultivate the understanding by the reading of good books in different languages. Unfortunately, we are not told what books Wolfgang read, nor in what direction his literary taste lay. 
it is characteristic of the father that both the children were obliged every evening to write a short account in a journal of what they had learnt and done throughout the day in order to cultivate their observation of themselves and the things around them l mozart knew well that hothouse plants fade quickly and was careful not to overtax the powers of his son but to preserve him in healthy freshness both of mind and body by means of due diversion and recreation he sought also to render him self-possessed and unconstrained in his intercourse with all classes of men which wolfgang's natural amiability rendered an easy task it was far more difficult to impress him with the necessity for prudence and reserve which not even the bitter experiences of after life could teach him tied and hampered as l mozart was in all these endeavors by the conditions of his life in salzburg one support remained of which he could not be deprived this was the beauty of the surrounding scenery true he makes no mention of it in his letters but the dwellers in beautiful neighborhoods seldom express enthusiastic admiration unless it is called forth by the observation of strangers whether consciously or not however the influence of rich and beautiful scenery must be felt by a finely organized mind and the good fortune of a youth passed amid such impressions of surrounding nature is not less to be prized than any other happy dispensation which wakens to life the slumbering powers of the soul intercourse with cultivated and art-loving men so indispensable to a liberal education was not easy of attainment in salzburg such men were few and almost exclusively belonged to the higher nobility two counts fermian brothers to the governor-general of lombardy were men of a lively interest in and appreciation of science and art while still at the university they had founded a literary society which had considerable influence in spite of the strong opposition which its free scientific tendencies drew upon it one of the brothers vigilius maria who was provost of the cathedral possessed a carefully selected library and was familiar with the literature of all the european countries the other franz lactantius lord high chamberlain to the archbishop was a connoisseur of painting and possessed an excellent collection of pictures but he seems to have had little idea of music for although he was extremely well disposed towards wolfgang the latter writes to his father july ninth seventeen seventy eight that nothing can be done for music in salzburg until it is altogether left to the kapellmeister so that the lord high chamberlain may have no power to interfere for you cannot make a kapellmeister out of a cavalier although you may make a cavalier out of a kapellmeister kane and count anton Willibald volweg had travelled extensively in order to make himself acquainted with manufactures and industries and had specially studied architecture the master of the horse count leopold joseph kuenberg was a well-read and accomplished man the bishop of chiemsee count ferdinand von zeil was as distinguished for intellect and cultivation as for nobility of disposition we may gather that all these men were well disposed towards mozart the chamberlain count george anton felix von arco the court-martial count nicholas sebastian von laudren and the captain of the bodyguard count leopold von laudren were also among his patrons he had free entry into their houses played at their entertainments and gave lessons to their daughters all the ladies old and young vying with each other in attentions to the distinguished virtuoso wolfgang sends a respectful kiss of the hand from milan february seventeenth 
1770, to Her Excellency Countess Arco, and thanks her for the kiss she had sent him, which he prized more highly than many a salute from a younger person. Differences of rank, however, and of personal circumstances rendered difficult any such friendly intercourse as would have been of advantage to Mozart, both socially and professionally. The circle was not an artistic one. Wolfgang praises Count Salem in Munich, October 2, 1777, and calls him a true connoisseur. He says, bravo when the other cavaliers take a pinch of snuff or blow their noses or cough or begin a conversation the smaller or as it was called the wild nobility lived for the most part on the numerous smaller court offices the incomes of which did not enable them to make a show in proportion to their rank they strove to indemnify themselves by pride and haughtiness although there were some few cultivated families among them. With some of these, and more particularly with their younger members, we find Wolfgang in close intercourse, but the friendship was in most instances a superficial one, which did not stand the test of years and absence. Herr von Molk, son of the court chancellor, is mentioned as a friend of Wolfgang's, and an unsuccessful suitor of his sister, Marianne. It was he who was so amazed and delighted with the performance of the opera at Munich that the Mozarts were ashamed of him, because it was evident that he had seen nothing all his life but Salzburg and Innsbruck. Mozart was more attached, at least in his early years, to Fräulein W. von Molk, to whom he sends a message that he would like the same reward from her, that he had for the last minuets, she knows what that is, that his heart was somewhat susceptible of impression in youth, is evident from the mysterious allusions which Wolfgang makes in his letters to his sister. She is to visit, she knows whom, to give tender messages. When he went to Italy in 1772, an expression in a letter from his father points to a daughter of Dr. Barassani as his reigning goddess. Other friends of Mozart's youth were Herr von Hefner, son of the town syndic, Herr von Amen, of whom he was very fond as a boy, though the intimacy afterwards died out, and Joachim von Scheidenhofen, who disgusted Mozart by marrying for money. Von Scheidenhofen kept in his youth a diary of his own doings, extracts from which, relating to the years 1774 through 1777, take note of all the visits of the Mozart family. These extracts prove that the Mozarts were on friendly terms with many other court officials. They visited each other in the afternoons and evenings, and either played cards or had music. Regular entertainments are mentioned, such as meetings for the bolt shooting, which we shall presently describe, and a card club. The friends also went to concerts and masquerades together. Intercourse with families of the citizen class, which could not fail to result from the position held by the Mozarts, and from their many years' residence in the place, was more of a recreation for idle hours than a means of intellectual improvement. Occasional allusions to Salzburg society are not of a favorable nature. Among their intimate friends was our old acquaintance Hagenauer, a merchant, and for many years their landlord. We may gather from the confidential letters addressed to him by L. Mozart on the first journey that he was not only sincerely attached to them, and always ready with advice and help, but that he had cultivation and tastes in advance of his surroundings. His wife, judging from some remarks of L. Mozart, was somewhat bigoted and fond of priestly intercourse. The closest friend of the family, however, who possessed the confidence both of father and children, was Joss Bullinger, 
a priest who had been educated at the Jesuit seminary in Munich and was tutor in the family of Count Arco at Salzburg. The faithful Bullinger was always a chief person in the Mozart's house. In Wolfgang's letters home, he not only always sends messages to his good friend Bullinger, but he begs that his letters may be read to him, and sometimes that important secrets may be told to no one but Nannerl and Bullinger. After the mother's death in Paris, Wolfgang entrusted him with the mournful task of breaking the news gently to his father, which Bullinger did with equal tact and sympathy. And when Wolfgang was forced, much against his will, to return to Salzburg, it was to his friend Bullinger that he poured out his heavy laden heart, August 7, 1778, and the attachment was mutual. When Wolfgang was on his way home from Paris, and his father and sister, anxious for news of him, confessed and communicated with many prayers for the preservation of their dear one. The faithful Bullinger also prayed for him daily in the Holy Mass, October 19, 1778. The father, too, had good cause to declare that Bullinger was his best and truest friend, from whom he had received much courtesy and kindness, and who, when he was in embarrassment during Wolfgang's journey, assisted him by a considerable loan. He placed the fullest confidence in Bullinger, shared with him all his plans for Wolfgang, and took counsel with him on many occasions. The friendship between them was well known in Salzburg, and in the efforts that were made to recall Wolfgang from Vienna, Bullinger was employed as a go-between. He seems to have had some taste for music. At least we hear of his taking part in some private concerts, which were held every Sunday at eleven o'clock, and Wolfgang writes, after his departure, October 11, 1777, begging him to hold an official discourse and give his compliments to all the members of the Academy. Opportunities for social gaiety were more freely afforded to pleasure-loving Salzburg under Archbishop Hieronymus than under his predecessor Sigismund, whose tastes were not nearly so cheerful nor so liberal. Salzburg society was characterized as follows. The country gentlemen hunt and go to church. Those next below them go to church and hunt. The next lower rank eat, drink, and pray, and the lowest of all pray, drink, and eat. The two latter classes conduct their love affairs in public, and the two former in private. All alike live in sensual indulgence. In 1775, a spacious hall, with some side apartments, were added to the town hall, and there, during the carnival, masked balls were given under the supervision of the magistrate, as well as concerts and other entertainments. Mozart, who was fond of dancing and jokes, excelled in masquerading. Scheidenhofen mentions his having amused every one as a peasant bridegroom, and another time as a young dandy. But even in Salzburg, the most popular entertainment was the play. A theater was built expressly for the court on the right bank of the Salzach, and there in winter performances were given by the Munich or some other traveling company, sledge parties and others being formed for the purpose of attending. In summer, excursions were made to the numerous objects of interest in the neighborhood, a very favorite one being to the Royal Park of Helbrun. The Mozarts rarely participated in these pleasures. End of section 35, chapter 15, part 1. Section 36 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1 by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn, Section 36, Chapter 15, Part 2. Although the father was able to write to his son, February 12, 1778, consider whether I have not always helped you to procure every possible pleasure that was harmless and sensible, often at the cost of great personal inconvenience, yet his limited circumstances prohibited any very frequent indulgence in such pleasures. The increasing expenses, which he justly ascribed to the parsimonious system of the government, necessitated the strictest economy on his part. He laid these circumstances clearly before his son. February 16, 1778 It has been very hard work for me ever since your birth, and even before, to support a wife and seven children, besides your grandmother and several others, on twenty florins a month, taking into account childbirths, deaths, and illnesses. If you calculate these expenses, you will readily believe that not only have I never had a kreutzer to spend on my own pleasure, but that it has only been by the grace of God and hard work that I have kept free from debt. I have sacrificed my whole time to you two children, in order that when the time came, you might be able both to maintain yourselves, and also provide me with the means of spending a peaceful old age, occupied only with thoughts for the safety of my soul, and preparations for a happy death. But L. Mozart's economy was judicious. Buy nothing that is bad, he wrote to his wife, October 26, 1771. There is no saving in buying bad things. The simplicity of the manners of the household and the modest nature of the enjoyments may be proved by the extreme and constant popularity among the whole circle of a game called bolt shooting. Bolzelscheisen A number of intimates formed themselves into a sort of little guild and met every Sunday at the various houses of the members. Each player, in turn, threw a bolt or quoit, and numerous were the jokes to which the game gave rise. A sort of rivalry grew up in the furnishing of each quoit with inscriptions bearing on the foibles and peculiarities of the different players, and a tendency to joking and sarcasm of the good Salzburgers, was thereby encouraged and indulged. A pleasant, sociable kind of intercourse grew out of these constant meetings. The following instance will show the kind of pleasantry that was allowable on such occasions. Leopold tells his son, November 11, 1780, how one of the lady members, who was a little bit of a coquette, happened one day to trip on the step of a shop she was entering in full daylight, and to fall in a very inelegant posture. This was duly portrayed with appropriate verses on the quoit, to the uncontrollable merriment of the whole party. The bolt shooting is never forgotten in the family correspondence. Amusing quoit pictures are forwarded to absent members, and their share of the winnings received by their proxies. Mozart writes to his sister from Vienna, July 4, 1781, Is it not about time for the shooting supper? Pray do not forget to drink the health of a faithful shooter with due honors, and tell me when it comes to my turn that I may paint a quoit. Under these circumstances, the encouragement which Wolfgang needed to render his arduous labors pleasant and satisfactory could only be looked for from the sympathy of his colleagues and the favor with which his performances were received. But unfavorable as the state of things was in Salzburg in other respects, on this point 
it was simply intolerable. Individual musicians, such as the faithful Schachner, who were free from envy, and had cultivation and industry enough to appreciate intercourse with the Mozart family, formed a close and constant friendship with them. But with the majority, intimacy was on many accounts out of the question, even when, as in the case of Michael Haydn and Adelgasser, they deserved all recognition as artists. It was in contrast to Salzburg that L. Mozart praises the orchestra at Mannheim as young men of good morals, neither tipplers nor gamblers, nor miserable blockheads, whose conduct and performances are alike admirable. July 19, 1763. Wolfgang made similar observations in after years, and wrote to his father from Paris, July 9, 1778, how businesslike everything was under Cannabich's conductorship, how implicitly he was obeyed, and what much better lives the musicians lived there than at Salzburg. One of my chief reasons for detesting Salzburg is the impossibility of associating, as an honest man, with the coarse, stupid, dissolute musicians belonging to the court. One is quite ashamed of them, and it is they who bring music generally into this favor. We can well understand how frequently the Mozart family would give offense to men of small cultivation and ill-regulated tastes. As a childish prodigy, Mozart had amused them by his childlike candor and engaging confidence, but as a growing youth his performances became an intolerable source of annoyance and envy to them, not lessened by the brilliant recognition which he met with outside the walls of his native town. Their ill-will was doubtless also increased by the reserve of the Mozarts, their claims to superior cultivation, and the justification sometimes accorded to these claims. And although the father's prudence and the mother's good nature would prevent any open rupture with their colleagues, yet a tendency to severe criticism, sometimes jokingly, sometimes sarcastically expressed, is common to all the Mozarts. If we may judge of the tone of their actual intercourse by the numerous allusions in their letters, and Wolfgang's forte was certainly not prudent reserve, then, indeed, Salzburg might well dread the sharpness of the Mozart tongue. The family were on least friendly terms with the Italians attached to the service of the Archbishop. Almost everywhere in Germany, the idea was firmly rooted that the reputation of the musical establishments could only be upheld by summoning composers and virtuosi from Italy. When Wolfgang wrote to his father from Munich, September 29, 1777, So it is, all the great people have a rage for foreigners. His father consoled him by answering, October 4, 1777, the rage for Italians is almost confined to Munich. It exists in an exaggerated degree. In Mannheim everything is German, except a couple of male sopranos. At Treves, under the elector, Prince Clement of Saxony, the maestro alone is Italian. Mayence is altogether German, and at Würzburg, the only foreigner is Signor Fracassini, a violinist, now, I believe, Kapellmeister, and that only for the sake of his German wife, a vocalist and a native of Würzburg. There are no foreigners at any of the smaller Protestant courts. Notwithstanding, however, the reduction of the operatic and court establishment of Stuttgart in 1768, by the dismissal of some of its chief members, the taste and feeling, as well as the majority of the personnel, continued to be purely Italian, and at Bonn many Italians belonged to the court establishment under the leadership of Lucchesi. 
L. Mozart does not allude to North Germany, since it lay out of Wolfgang's projected path. The natural consequence of the intrusion of foreigners was ceaseless contention between the German musicians, who saw themselves slighted and aggrieved, and the Italians, who made their superiority most offensively felt. Mozart had to suffer from foreign intrigues, not only in Milan, while composing his opera, page 130, but perhaps also in Munich, and certainly in Salzburg. Archbishop Hieronymus, who set a low value on anything belonging to Salzburg, although he paid a high price for many a native manufacture bearing a foreign stamp, introduced Italians into his band, because it had been blamed as rough and rapid in execution, and not delicate, nor in the best taste. The Kapellmeister, Lolly, having become old and incapable, was replaced by Fischetti in 1772. This was a disappointment to L. Mozart, whose claims to the office were well founded, since he was considered to have placed music on its then excellent footing. Among the soloists, Brunetti was appointed to the violin, Ferrari to the violoncello, Ferlendi to the oboe, and Ceccarelli was male soprano. These Italians were not only better paid than native artists, but the foreign asses, as Michael Haydn called them, relying on the favor of the archbishop, conducted themselves with insolence and ill-breeding. There can be no question that the annoyance to the two Mozarts was great at seeing strangers, far below them in social position and talent, preferred before them, while all the hard labor devolved upon themselves. Fischetti's compositions were few and far between. Wolfgang was always ready to compose operatic or sacred, vocal or instrumental music, as occasion arose. All this implanted a rooted dislike to foreigners in Mozart's young mind, which the experiences of his later years did much to confirm. But the artistic element of his nature was far too strong and too pure to allow personal consideration to influence his judgment on Italian music. His heart was so sound and good that he could overcome his dislike to the nation in his intercourse with individuals. It only transpires every now and then. It was not very likely that the Mozarts, father or son, would be in high favor at court. We do not know much of their dealings with Archbishop Sigismund, but the difficulty L. Mozart had in renewing his leave of absence proves that the Archbishop was not over-pleased with his repeated and lengthened stays abroad. Wolfgang received an official post and the title of concertmeister some time before 1770, but no salary, and even after the production of Ascanio and Alba, L. Mozart was in doubt as to whether the archbishop would remember his son if any vacancy occurred. Page 134. It is not known whether the salary of 150 gulden a year, which he drew as concertmeister, had been granted to him by Sigismund. In any case, it was not raised until 1777 by his successor, whose own sister, the Countess Schonborn, as Wolfgang writes, September 26, 1777, positively refused to believe that he had had a monthly keepsake of twelve florins, thirty kreutzers. Mozart's position was still more unfavorable under Hieronymus, who never forgave the inhabitants of Salzburg their strongly expressed opposition to his election as archbishop. He knew himself to be unpopular, and instead of courting popularity, openly displayed his contempt for his subjects. He was a man of acute and enlightened intellect, and carried out some important reforms in his government with a firm hand, but he was self-willed, parsimonious, and unscrupulous. 
he seldom expressed satisfaction with his officials. His disdainful mode of address to all but those of the highest nobility, and the irritable tone of his conversation, kept all about him in timid subordination. Even his appearance, although he was of mean stature and sickly complexion, the sharp glance of his grey eyes, the left eye rarely fully open, and the decided lines round his mouth, commanded respect and fear. There were other circumstances besides their German extraction and Salzburg birth, which rendered the two Mozarts obnoxious to the archbishop. Count Ferdinand von Zeil, afterwards Bishop of Chimsey, to whose generous withdrawal Hieronymus owed his election, was one of Mozart's warmest and most constant supporters, and for him Mozart, like all Salzburg, felt the deepest love and respect. This was not the way to the favor of Hieronymus. L. Mozart's independent demeanor, doing his duty, and going his way without obsequiousness or flattery, and Wolfgang's open-mouthed candor, causing him occasionally to forget his official position and the reserve it should have entailed, were so many reasons for additional tyranny on the part of the archbishop. Added to this was the fact that Mozart, with his slender figure and boyish countenance, made a poor personal impression on Hieronymus, who was singularly apt to be imposed upon by men of commanding height and appearance. He refused any recognition of Wolfgang's musical accomplishments, and was unsparing in his criticism of them, telling him, as Leopold wrote to Padre Martini, December 22, 1777, that he knew nothing of his art, and should go and study at the Naples Conservatoire, that he might learn something. A sufficiently unreasonable proposal to an academician of Bologna and Verona, to a young man who had traversed Italy in triumph as a composer and virtuoso. True, Mozart had no great respect for the archbishop's critical judgment, but in the mouth of his prince such an expression of opinion was of very unpleasant significance for in point of fact hieronymus was well aware of mozart's genius and never failed to honor him with commissions when any new composition was required for which he never paid him a penny even if otherwise those around him would have put him right on the point it was of set purpose that he gave vent to these insults he imagined that contemptuous expressions of opinion as to his performances would be the most effectual means of preventing the younger concertmeister from preferring his claim to a higher salary than one hundred fifty gulden a year. Such were the continual insults and opposition borne by the father and son, each on behalf of the other. I hope, wrote Wolfgang, that you are less annoyed than when I was in Salzburg, for I must acknowledge that I was the cause of it. I was badly treated. I did not deserve it. You naturally took my part, but too strongly. I assure you that was the chief reason that I hurried out of Salzburg. To this his father answers, November 17, 1777. You are quite right as to my extreme annoyance at the tyrannical treatment you received. It gnawed at my heart, and prevented my sleeping. It was always in my thoughts, and would in the end have destroyed me. My dear son, when you are happy, I am happy, and your mother and sister, we are all happy, and this happiness I hope for, by the grace of God, and my confidence in your own good sense. L. Mozart saw from the beginning that Wolfgang would never fill a position worthy of him in Salzburg, and he exerted himself in vain to procure a post for him at some other court. The greatest caution was necessary to keep his negotiations a secret at Salzburg, for his enemies would not fail 
to seize the opportunity of injuring him, perhaps of displacing him altogether. Aware of the folly of endangering his assured position, uncomfortable though it might be, he strove to allay the growing impatience of his son. The latter desired that the whole family should gain their livelihood by a grand professional tour, until they could find a secure and happier position in some place or other. His father, wiser and more experienced, pointed out to him, December 18, 1777, how entirely their circumstances had altered since his childhood, how hard it would be to gain subsistence for a whole family journeying about, how uncertain their means of maintenance would be. Leopold duly appreciated also the cares and dangers of a nomadic life. Nor was he more inclined to trust his son entirely alone, he knew Wolfgang's incapacity in all the concerns of practical life, particularly in traveling, since he did not know the differences of coinage and had no conception of packing up or anything of that sort. He saw the hindrances which envy and mistrust would be sure to lay in the path of a young man who was striving to win his way by surpassing talent in great doings, Above all, he feared the temperament of his son, knowing that his careless frankness and good nature, coupled with his excitability and proneness to hasty rejoinder, would make him the easy prey of any one who might wish to use or to injure him. He addresses Wolfgang in words of warning, February 16, 1778. My dear son, you are too hot and hasty in all your affairs. Your character has entirely changed since your childhood and boyhood. You were grave and earnest as a child, and when you were busy over your music, no one might venture the least jesting with you. Even your countenance was so grave that many people in different countries believe that your precocious talent and serious face betokened an early death. Now, on the contrary, it appears to me that you are far too ready to answer jestingly on every occasion, which is the first step to a kind of familiarity which one should eschew if one desires to win respect in the world. It is your good heart which causes you to see no fault in a man, to give him your full confidence provided he only extols you to the skies, whereas, as a boy, your excess of modesty made you cry when people praised you too much. L. Mozart knew also that Wolfgang would be so engrossed in his art as to forget everything else, more especially whatever would be to his own advantage. He trembled for the dangers which would beset the inexperienced youth leaving the narrow sphere of provincial life to encounter the temptations of the great world. He strove with all his might, therefore, to instill patience into his son, and represented to him that his probation in Salzburg was a necessary preparation for the tour, which would have far more certainty of success when he was somewhat maturer in age and education but even this patience had its limits. Wolfgang had not left Salzburg since he had produced the Finta Giardiniera at Munich in 1775. If he did not wish to be altogether forgotten, he must again display his powers as a composer and executant. He had prepared himself for such a tour as he proposed by prolonged study and solo compositions, the numerous fair copies in the little books we have named had been made with the same object in view. They could be readily packed and always at hand for performance or to be copied again as presents. When everything was ready, the father and son applied to the archbishop for permission to travel. This, as well as a petition for an increase of salary, was roundly refused. 
the archbishop giving as his reason that he would not have his subjects going on begging expeditions but the cup was now full to overflowing wolfgang begged leave to resign his post at salzburg and the archbishop enraged at having the tables turned upon him accepted the resignation in the most ungracious manner it was even expected that his anger would extend to the father and that he had given orders to strike l mozart's name off the list of his musicians this however was not the case with an ungracious remark the archbishop allowed him to retain his place wolfgang's resignation excited much notice in salzburg and the universal regret was shared even by those immediately round the archbishop count von fermian who was extremely fond of wolfgang was rejoicing on his return from a journey as l mozart relates october four seventeen seventy seven in the pleasure that a riding horse he had purchased for him would give his young friend when he was met by the lamentable intelligence when he paid his respects to the archbishop the latter remarked we have one musician less since you left he answered your grace has lost a great performer how so he is the greatest clavier player that i ever heard in my life he has done your grace good service on the violin and he is a first-rate composer whereupon the archbishop was silent canaan count jos staremberg too declared later june twenty ninth seventeen seventy eight that mozart's complaints were fully justified and that all visitors to salzburg had admired young mozart by whom he himself was quite captivated but this turn of affairs gave l mozart the deepest anxiety all the difficulties and objections to the journey pressed upon him with redoubled force now that it was to be undertaken under such unfavorable circumstances it was however rendered inevitable it would be incompatible with pride or self-respect to purchase wolfgang's continuance in his office at the cost of abject submission to the archbishop it only remained by energy and foresight so to make use of circumstances as to preserve their honor with the archbishop and to ensure a fixed position for wolfgang the visits must be arranged to the larger towns especially residences where concerts might cover the cost of the journey and commissions for compositions might render possible a lengthened stay ending perhaps in a settled engagement the tour was planned with these ends in view and leopold was never weary of impressing upon his son that his sole endeavor must be to win a name to make money and to obtain a position personal gratification and mere amusement must be kept altogether in the background money-making he writes october fifteenth seventeen seventy seven must engross all your attention and economy must be all your care otherwise a journey is of no profit on the contrary it brings a man into debt and again november twenty seventh seventeen seventy seven the object of the journey is was and must be the acquirement of a fixed position and the making of money his extensive connections and great local knowledge enabled him to trace his son's path out and to gain him excellent introductions and his zeal and activity were indefatigable wolfgang was enjoined to become acquainted with persons and events to grasp quickly his probable prospects in any place and either at once to turn them to good account or if unfavorable to leave the place but wolfgang had neither the experience nor the practical shrewdness of his father he felt secure of his art in which alone he lived and imagined the rest would come of itself the prospect of at last escaping from detested salzburg 
was apparently too engrossing to allow him to pay much heed to his father's warnings. The father knew all this, and knew that he must not go alone. He could not accompany him himself, and he therefore took the hard resolve of parting with his wife and sending her forth with their son. He was quite aware that, as a woman, she could not occupy the same position towards Wolfgang as he himself, and he must have felt, too, that, intense as her love for Wolfgang was, she had not the energy or superiority of intellect necessary to guide him. But she knew the world, and was an experienced traveller, and so he hoped that she would supply the carefulness and economy which Wolfgang lacked. She was specially enjoined to keep an exact account, and at once to inform her husband of any propositions that were made, that he might advise and direct. She does not seem, however, to have quite answered his expectations, partly because she could not always withstand her son's impatient restlessness, and partly because she yielded to her own inclinations, although she often declared she was ready to drop with the fatigue of packing up. But Leopold could rely on her influence on the most important point of all. The mother's presence was a guarantee that her tenderly reared and devoted son would be careful of his health. He hoped, too, that her presence would preserve him from any dangerous or immoral intercourse, on which point he gives Wolfgang the benefit of his own experience. February 16, 1778 I sought only the acquaintance and friendship of persons of the higher classes, and even among them I avoided idle young fellows, whatever their rank. I invited no one to visit me frequently, and always preferred visiting others when I pleased. For if I do not care for a man, or am busy or engaged, I can stay away. But if he comes to me, I am at a loss to get rid of him and, even if a pleasant visitor, he may hinder me at my work. You are a young man of twenty-two, so that it is not the gravity of your years which will prevent worthless fellows, old or young, from making your acquaintance and endeavouring to entice you to follow their example. One is led on irresistibly and finds, when too late, that there is no return. I will not enter on the subject of women, wherein nature herself is our enemy, and he who does not strenuously resist at first will strive in vain to escape from the labyrinth, and will find no release but death. How blindly one is often led on by jokes, flattery, etc., until returning sense awakens one to shame, you may have, perhaps, already experienced in some degree. I do not mean to reproach you. I know that you love me not as your father alone, but as your closest and surest friend. Separation from his wife was not the only sacrifice made by the father to the well-being of his son. He foresaw that the profits of the journey would hardly cover its expenses, and that he must arrange to have a sum always in hand in case of emergencies. He had no private property. The profits of the first journey had already disappeared. He was obliged to borrow, and debt was abhorrent to so conscientious a man. But his friends, Hagenauer and Bollinger, readily came to his assistance. He not only cut down to their lowest point the expenses of his housekeeping with Nun Earl, but he undertook once more the very uncongenial work of giving lessons, badly paid and fatiguing as it was. A father who made such sacrifices for his son had a right to demand, in return, not indeed filial love and the gaining of artistic fame that came freely and spontaneously, but a degree of prudence and forethought which should suffice for the demands of practical life. 
I have, my dear Wolfgang, he says, February 16, 1778, not only not the smallest mistrust in you, but I place all confidence and all hope in your future. It all depends on the sound good sense which you certainly possess, if you would only pay heed to it, and on fortunate circumstances. These last are not to be forced, but you can always take sense to your counsel, and that I hope and pray you will. Thus was everything planned and prepared. The necessary means were provided, the outfit purchased, and a carriage in readiness which would contain the two travellers and their luggage, clothes, and instruments. This was the approved method of travelling at that time, and Leopold Mozart was determined to send his son forth into the world, not as an itinerant musician, but as an artist, commanding respect and honourable treatment, even from his outward surroundings. End of section 36, chapter 15, part 2《ラフォーマーの歌詞』を読んでいるときに、私は、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに来ているときに、ここに After you had set off, he wrote, September 25, 1777, I went upstairs quite exhausted and threw myself on a couch. It was with a great effort that I had restrained myself at parting, in order not to add to our grief, and in the confusion I had forgotten to give my son the paternal blessing. I ran to the window and sent it after you both. But as I did not see you drive through the gate, I came to the conclusion that you had already passed, and that I had sat immersed in my grief longer than I supposed. Nanerl wept till she made herself ill, and did not recover till the evening, when the two consoled themselves with a game of piquet. Wolfgang, on the contrary, breathed more freely as soon as he had turned his back upon Salzburg. The feeling of relief from the galling oppression of years dispelled the sorrow of parting with his father and sister. In his former journeys, he had experienced nothing but encouragement and success, and had been shielded from all the harassing cares of ordinary life, and so he took his way with artless confidence into the wide world. He little dreamt that he had in fact made the first step along a thorny path, to be met from henceforth to the end by difficulty, opposition, pain, and sorrow. His mind was fresh and youthful enough to be diverted by all the little incidents of such a journey. When he sat down in the evening, undecima ora noctis, at Wasserburg, to acquaint his father of their safe arrival, he could think of nothing more important to tell him than of their having seen a cow all on one side. He had met a fat gentleman who remembered having seen Wolfgang a year ago during a performance of Mirabel. He was in company with Herr von Unhold of Memmingen, and they both sent their compliments to Wolfgang's father and sister. It is plain that the boy rejoiced in the feeling of freedom and independence. Viviamo come i principi, and want nothing but my dear father. It is God's will, and all will go well. I hope you will be well and as contented as I am. I am getting quite expert and, like another papa, taking care of everything. I have always to pay the postilions, for I can talk to the fellows better than Mamma. Pray take care of your health, my dear father. Their first stay was at Munich. The state of affairs there, coupled with their former failure, gave little hope of a prosperous visit. But it was necessary to make the attempt. Furnished with his diplomas of the academies of Bologna and Verona, and with recommendations from Padre Martini, Wolfgang might present himself before the elector Maximilian as a thoroughly trained musician, and might hope to gain such favor from influential patrons as would justify his undertaking new works. They took up their abode with the old acquaintance Albert, known as the Learned Host. Wolfgang's first visit was to Count Seau, the inspector of plays. He met with a friendly reception, and was advised by the Count to seek an audience of the elector without delay, and if he did not succeed, to address him by letter. There was no doubt that a first-rate composer was wanted in Munich. Wolfgang next paid his respects to the Prince Bishop of Chiemsee, Count Zeil, who was residing in Munich on a diplomatic mission. He conversed freely on Mozart's plans, and promised to do his best for him, with the elector and his consort. 
but some days later the bishop said to him very politely september twenty ninth seventeen seventy seven i do not think you will do much here i spoke privately on the subject to the elector at nymphenburg and he answered it is too soon yet let him travel in italy and make himself a name i do not refuse anything but it is too soon yet the electress promised to do what she could but shrugged her shoulders and doubted of success these unfavorable prognostics were justified when Mozart, introduced by the influential violoncellist Franz Zaver Voschitka, born 1730, presented himself to the elector, who was on the point of going hunting with his court. He gives the following account of the interview to his father, September 30th, 1777. When the elector approached me, I said, I trust your highness will allow me to lay myself and my services at your highness's feet. Indeed. Have you left Salzburg altogether? Altogether, your highness indeed why were you kept too close may it please your highness i asked permission to travel which was refused whereupon i took a step which had long been in my mind for salzburg is no place for me that is certain mein gott young man but your father is still at salzburg yes may it please your highness he lays his humble duty etc i have been in italy three times already i have written three operas and been elected member of the academy at bologna after writing a trial composition in one hour which usually takes candidates four or five hours of hard labor all this proves that i am in a position to serve any court my greatest wish is to serve your highness who is himself a great yes my dear fellow but i have no vacancy i assure your highness that i should do honor to munich no doubt no doubt but there is no vacancy this he said as he was going and i could only take my humble leave the elector being unable, as Leopold Mozart was aware, to engage any one unless there was a vacancy, no court office could be looked for at Munich. But there seemed fair prospects of an assured position in another direction. Count Siau had interest enough to retain so distinguished a composer, whose energy and productiveness promised good services. He was not only manager, but also part proprietor of the theatre. The elector paid the band and the ballet, and gave a yearly contribution of nine thousand gulden to the expenses, which was received by Siau. In return, the latter provided the opera and the play, and engaged the members of the two companies, chiefly natives of Munich, who were to be had for eight to twelve gulden a month. The Italian opera was only given during the carnival, and at great court festivals, and then generally without remuneration. German operas were the rule, that is, adaptations from the French or Italian, for as yet original German opera did not exist. What a brilliant success might be expected from the lively interest of the Munich public in all manners theatrical, if a man of Mozart's genius were to devote himself to German opera. Siao inquired of the Bishop of Kimsey if Mozart did not receive enough from home to allow him to remain there on a small salary. He should like to keep him. The Bishop doubted this. Count Siao preferred receiving a proposal and remained silent, but Mozart could perceive that he was turning the matter over in his mind. He himself was all on fire at the idea of having operas to compose. He gives his father an animated account of the impression made upon him by the performance of a German opera and by the vocalist, October 12, 1777. The prima donna is named Kizerin. She is the daughter of the cook and of a nobleman here, a pleasant girl and pretty on the stage. I have not seen her nearer yet. She is a native of Munich. I heard her the third time that she played, and thought she had a beautiful voice. Not very strong, but not weak either, and a pure good intonation. Malaysia is her teacher, and her style shows that her master understands singing as well as teaching singing. When she had to sustain a note for a couple of bars, I was surprised at the beauty of her crescendo and decrescendo. She has a slow shake, which I like extremely. It is all the clearer and purer when she wants to make it quicker, and the quicker it is, the easier it is. She is an immense favorite with the people here, and I agree with them. Mama was in the body of the theater. She went at half-past four in order to secure a seat. I did not go till half-past six, for I am well enough known to have the entree to any of the boxes. I watched Mademoiselle Cuserin with my glass, and she drew more than one tear from me. I cried, brava, bravissima, very often, remembering that this was only her third appearance. The piece was called The Fisher Girl, La Pescatrice, a good translation, with Piccini's music, but with nothing original in it. They want to have a German opera seria soon and they wish me to compose it. Among the wishers was a certain Professor Huber, whom Mozart had met at the Mesmers during his last visit to Vienna, 1771. They renewed their acquaintance at Herr Albert's, where the professor was a frequent visitor. He was the deputy manager of the theatre, and had, as Mozart expressed it, to read all the pieces submitted for performance, to improve, spoil, accept, reject them. 
this censorship was necessary since the management performed all that was sent in and was bound to put in study every native production and as at that time almost every student and official in munich was bitten with the mania for authorship they were overwhelmed with trash huber must have felt it a matter of importance to retain such remarkable genius as mozart for the munich theatre the wish indeed was generally felt baron rumling paid wolfgang the compliment of saying the theatre is my delight with good actors and actresses good singers male and female and such a capital composer as you are of this wolfgang says october second seventeen seventy seven it is only talk certainly and talk does not go far but he never spoke so to me before wolfgang played several days in succession before count josef von salem the chief director of music and the opera born seventeen eighteen he played a good deal out of his head then the two cassatione crucial numbers two hundred forty seven and two hundred eighty seven composed for the countess lodron in the final music crucial number two hundred and fifty you cannot think how delighted the count was he understands music for he cried bravo every time that other fine gentlemen take a pinch of snuff blow their noses cough or begin a conversation i said to him that i wished the elector were there that he might hear what i could do of which he knows nothing all these great people believe whatever is told them and refuse to judge for themselves it is always the way i offered him a trial he was to get together all the artists in munich and any he chose from italy france germany england and spain i would undertake to write against any of them i told him what had happened in italy and begged him if the talk turned upon me to remember all this he said i have very little influence but what i can do i will with all my heart he had some intercourse with musicians too consoli had met him on his entrance into the town and lost no time in visiting him and his old friend becca the flautist soon made his appearance albert arranged a little concert with a wretched clavier alas alas and invited a clergyman dubriel a pupil of tartini with the idea that he was a good judge and a clever performer but this turned out to be a mistake we first played haydn's two quintets but it was dreadful i scarcely heard him he could not play four bars without mistakes his fingering was bad and he left out all the sospiri he was very polite and praised the quintets but then i played my concerto clavier in c and b flat in e flat major kershaw numbers two hundred thirty eight two hundred forty six and two hundred seventy one and my trio kershaw number two hundred fifty four the accompaniment was fine in the adagio i had to play six bars of his part last of all i played the last cassation in b kershaw number two hundred eighty seven and they all stared I played as if I were the greatest fiddler in Europe. October 6, 1777 Herr Albert, who took great interest in Wolfgang, far beyond merely entertaining him, made him a proposal which might render it possible for him to remain in Munich. He promised to bring ten friends together, who should each contribute one ducat a month, or six hundred florins a year. It would be easy to get commissions from Count Siau, which would raise his income to eight hundred florins. "'What do you think of this idea?' writes Wolfgang, overjoyed. Is it not an act of friendship? And should I not accept it, if it is really in earnest? There was the immediate future to be provided for, and for this he was assured that the concerts would begin in November and last until May. One was given in Herr Albert's Hall every Saturday, and then strangers came to the town. If he only stayed now, he was quite certain of an engagement. Wolfgang's mother thought well of this proposal, but his father, as a man of the world, had many scruples. October 4, 1777 Herr Albert's proposition is indeed as great an act of friendship as one can imagine, but though it does not appear to have occurred to you, the difficulty to my mind will be to find the ten people who are to give the ducat a month. Who are these philanthropists and lovers of music? What is their connection with you, and what services will they demand in return? I do not see where they are to come from. Herr Albert would scarcely be able to speak to them all without delay. Some of them may be away from Munich. For myself, I should prefer mercantile men to noblemen. It all depends upon whether they keep their word and for how long." If the thing is feasible, well and good, it ought to be accepted. But unless it can be settled at once, you cannot stay there spending money and losing time, for no profit is to be expected in Munich, in spite of all their compliments and promises. He turned out to be right. The ten philanthropists and lovers of music did not come forward, and Wolfgang had to submit more than once to reproaches for his readiness to believe in fires of straw which burn up quickly and end in smoke. But even without such aid, Wolfgang thought he might maintain himself in Munich for the present. October 2nd, 1777 it would not be impossible for me to get on alone. I should get at least three hundred florins from Count Sial. I need not concern myself as to my board. I should be always invited out, and even if I were not, nothing pleases Herr Albert more than my taking my meals with him. 
I should contract with Count Siao, on the advice of my best friends, to supply him yearly with four German operas, some buffe, some serie. Then if I had a sera, or benefit, on each, as is the custom here, that would give at least five hundred florins, which would bring my income up to eight hundred florins, and probably more, for Reiner, a comedian and singer, took two hundred florins for his sera, and I am a great favorite here. I should become a far greater if I helped to raise the German drama by my music. Mozart had clearly some confidence in his own powers. He did not think it much to offer to write four German operas every year, and a salary of three hundred gulden did not strike him as being poor pay for the work. But Count Siao appears to have been too prudent to risk even so much as this, and Leopold Mozart was still less inclined to consent to a plan which based all of its calculations on future and uncertain profits, and would not redound to Wolfgang's honor. "'You might certainly manage to live alone in Munich,' he wrote, October 6, 1777, "'but what good would this do you? How the archbishop would sneer. You can do that anywhere else as easily as in Munich. You must not make little of your talents and throw yourself away. There is certainly no need for that.' Wolfgang's sister was of the same opinion. "'It would be no honor to you to remain in Munich without any official position. It would be better to seek one at some other court. You will soon find it.' The father desired, therefore, that they should leave Munich as soon as possible." Fine words and bravissimos pay neither the postboy nor the host. As soon as you find there is nothing to be got, you had better move on. The good friends he had made might go on working for him in his absence, and preparing the way for a future position for him. He suggested this to Count Siao, as he tells his father, October 3, 1777. I have come to explain my affairs correctly to your excellency. I have been told that I ought to travel in Italy. I was sixteen months in Italy, and wrote three operas, as is well known, what happened further, your excellency will see by these documents. I showed him the diplomas. I lay all this before your excellency, in order that if there is any talk of me, and any injustice done me, your excellency may be able to set it right. He asked me if I was going to France now. I said I should remain in Germany. He thought I meant Munich, and said with a joyful laugh, What? You are going to remain here? I said, No, I should like to have stayed, and to tell the truth, I only sought service under the elector in order that I might supply your excellency with my compositions, and that without any personal interest. I should have taken pleasure in it. Whereupon he pushed back his nightcap. This, then, was the end of all the fine promises and honors. But other prospects were open to Wolfgang during his stay in Munich, which excited his liveliest interest. Mislivicek, his Italian friend, had produced at the carnival in Munich his opera Ezio, and during Lent his oratorio Abramo di Zacco, both with astonishing success. He was engaged for the next carnival at Naples, and only kept in Munich by illness. He gave Wolfgang prospects of a scrittura in Naples, and wrote a letter on his behalf to the impresario Don Gaetano Santorio. Mozart, with his inexpressible longing to write an opera once more, wrote joyfully to his father, October 10, 1777. I have my hundred ducats certain in the carnival, and, when I have once written at Naples, I shall be in request everywhere. As you know, in summer and autumn there is an opera buffa to be picked up here and there, which will do to keep one's hand in. It is true that one does not make much, but it is always something, and one gains more honor and credit than by a hundred concerts in Germany. I am more pleased, too, because I have to compose, which is my sole passion and delight. Then, if I obtain service, or the hope of it, the scrittura will be a great recommendation. I speak exactly as I feel from my heart, and if you can prove to me that I am wrong, I shall be ready, although unwillingly, to submit. For, if I only hear the name of an opera, I am quite beside myself. But the father was not against it, and only thought that this interlude must not cause the main object of the journey to be lost sight of. He therefore corresponded with Mislivacek, but soon observed that the latter only mentioned the scrittura when he had some favor to ask for himself. In point of fact, nothing came of this proposal. The same ill success attended the father's effort to obtain for Wolfgang a commission to write an opera for the Feast of the Ascension in Venice. The impresario, Michele Dall'Agata, returned no answer to two letters addressed to him, February 12, 1778. On October 11th the travelers left Munich, and reached Osberg the same evening. Following Leopold Mozart's minute directions, they established themselves at the Lamb in the Kreuzgasse, where you pay thirty kreuzers for dinner, get nice rooms in good society, English, French, etc. Wolfgang was well received by his uncle, and contracted a close friendship with his lively cousin Marianne, which may have compensated in some degree for the coldness of his reception generally in his father's native town. In obedience to his father's strict injunctions, he waited at once upon his grace, the town councillor von Langen-Mantel, with whom Leopold Mozart had been well acquainted in former years. 
but Wolfgang gained little encouragement from this audience, of which he gives his father the following account. End of section 37, chapter 16, part 1. Section 38 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart, by Otto Jahn, Section 38, Chapter 16, Part 2. My first visit was to the town councillor, Master Longotobarro. My cousin, a dear good man and an honest citizen, accompanied me, and had the honor of waiting in the anteroom like a lackey until I came out from the archtown councillor. I did not fail to begin by presenting my father's humble respects. He was pleased to remember all about it, and asked me, "'How has the gentleman been all this time?' to which I answered, "'God be praised quite well. I hope that your health has also been good.' Afterwards he was still more polite, and said, "'Sir,' and I said, "'Your grace,' as I had all along. Nothing would satisfy him but that I should go up with him to his son-in-law on the second floor, and my cousin waiting on the steps all the while. It was with difficulty that I refrained from saying something with all my politeness." Upstairs I had the honor of playing for three-quarters of an hour upon a good clavichord by Stein, in the presence of the stiff and starched son of his long-necked, gracious lady-wife, and her silly old mother. I played fantasias, and then everything he had, prima vista, among others some very pretty pieces by a certain Edelman. They were all exceedingly polite, and I was exceedingly polite, for it is my custom to be to people as I find them. It is the best way. The next visit was to the celebrated organ and clavier-maker, George Andreas Stein, 1728-1792. The father conceived the idea that Wolfgang should present himself to Stein under a feigned name, and should pretend that he came from Innsbruck with a commission to inspect some instruments. Such a joke was quite to Wolfgang's mind, and he told his father how it had passed. During his visit to the town councillor he had expressed his intention of calling upon Stein for dinner. The younger gentleman thereupon volunteered to accompany me. I thanked him for his kindness, and promised to come at two o'clock. I came, and we set out in company with his brother-in-law, who looks exactly like a student. Although I had begged them not to say who I was, Herr von Langenmantel blurted out, I have the honor to introduce you to a virtuoso on the clavier. I protested, and said I was an unworthy disciple of Herr Siegel, of Munich, by whom I was charged with many compliments, etc. He shook his head, and at last said, Have I the honor of seeing Herr Mozart? Oh, no, said I. My name is Tretzum, and I have a letter to you. He took the letter and was going to open it. I did not give him time, and said, Why should you read the letter now? Let us go into the hall and see your pianofortes, which I am most curious to do. With all my heart, but I do not think I am deceived. He opened the door of his showroom. I ran to one of the three claviers which stood there. I played. He could scarcely take time to open the letter, his curiosity was so excited. He read only the signature. Oh! He screamed, and embraced me, and crossed himself, and made grimaces, and was altogether very delighted. Mozart, for his part, was equally delighted with Stein's pianofortes, of which he gives his father the following detailed account. Before I had seen Stein's work, I preferred Spetz's claviers to all others, but now I must give the preference to Stein's, for they mute much better than Spetz's. If I strike hard, whether I raise my finger or not, the sound passes the instant I have heard it. I may come upon the keys as I like, the tone is always the same. It does not block, it neither becomes stronger nor weaker, nor does it cease altogether. In a word, it is all equal. Such a pianoforte, it is true, cannot be had under three hundred florins, but the trouble and labor bestowed on it are inestimable. His hammers fall the instant the keys are struck, whether they are held down or not. When such an instrument is finished, he told me himself, he sits down and tries all sorts of passages, runs, and jumps, and works away until he is satisfied. He often said, If I were not such a passionate lover of music myself, and were not able to play a little on the clavier, I should long ago have lost patience with my work, but I am a lover of instruments which do not tax the player, and which wear well. And his claviers do wear well. He guarantees that the sounding-board shall not spring. When a sounding-board is ready for a piano, he exposes it to air, rain, snow, sun, so that it may warp. And then he puts on slips and glues them down, so that it is all strong and true. He is glad when it warps, because then he is sure that nothing more will happen. He has three such pianofortes finished. I have played upon them again today. The pedal, which is pressed by the knee, is better managed by him than by others. If I only just touch it, it acts, and when the knee is removed, there is not the least vibration. Mozart knew how to make the most of these improved instruments. His playing and his intelligent admiration so won Stein's approbation that the latter followed the advice Wolfgang gave him concerning the education of his daughter. 
Maria Anna Stein, born 1769, was the prodigy of Augsburg. In April 1776, she had played her first concerto to universal admiration, and had received a beautiful medal from the town nobility. Wolfgang's criticism on her playing to his father, October 24, 1777, is somewhat severe, but so important as showing his views on pianoforte playing in general, that it must be given entire. The memory of the excellent Frau Nanette Streicher will not suffer from the bold criticism of the young Mozart. Apropos of his daughter, whoever sees her and hears her without laughing must be as much of a stone, Stein, as her father himself. She sits right up in the treble instead of in the middle of the instrument, so that she may be better able to move about and make grimaces. Her eyes roll, and she simpers and smirks. If a thing comes twice over, it is played slower the second time, and if a third time, it is slower still. The arm goes high, up in the air when a passage comes, and the emphasis is given by the whole arm instead of the finger, clumsily and heavily. But the best of all is when, in a passage that ought to flow like oil, the fingers have to be changed. It makes no difference at all to her, but when the time comes, up goes her hand, and she begins again quite calmly, so that one is always in expectation of a wrong note, which makes the effect very striking. I only write all this to give you some idea of what clavier playing and teaching may be brought to. I leave you to make your own use of the hints. Herr Stein is quite infatuated over his daughter. She is eight and a half years old and learns everything by heart. She may turn out something. She has genius. But as she is going on at present, she will not turn out anything. She will never gain fluency, because she is doing all she can to make her hand heavy. She will never learn the most difficult and most necessary part of music, that is, time, because she has been accustomed from her earliest youth to play out of time. Herr Stein and I had at least two hours' talk on this point. I think I nearly converted him, and now he asks my advice about everything. He was quite infatuated in Bika. Now he sees and hears that I play better than Bika that I make no grimaces, and yet play with so much expression that I show off his pianofortes better than any one. The correctness of my time astonishes them all. The tempo rubato, in an adagio, with the left hand keeping strict time, was quite past their comprehension. They always follow with the left hand. The expressions about Bica, who was considered among the best pianoforte players, are only repetition of what was said on all sides. Count Wolfig, and several others who are very enthusiastic for Bica, said lately at a public concert that I had thrown Bica quite into the shade, writes Wolfgang in confirmation of his own opinion. Even Archbishop Hieronymus was reported to have said aside to his favorites that Bica was a charlatan and a Mary Andrew, and that Mozart far surpassed him. June ninth, 1778. He played a tolerably different sonata by Bica, Prima Vista, Miserabile al Solito. How the Kapellmeister Graf and the organist Schmidthauer crossed themselves over the performance may be better imagined than described. Mozart's organ and violin playing created quite as much astonishment as his performances on the clavier. When I told Herr Stein that I should like to play upon his organ, in the Barfuserkirche, for that I had a passion for the organ, he was greatly astonished and said, What? A man like you, a clavier player, willing to play on an instrument which has no douceur, no expression, which allows of neither piano nor forte, but goes on always the same? All that has nothing to do with it. To my mind, the organ is the king of all instruments. Well, do as you like. So we went together. I could guess by his way of talking that he did not expect me to do his organ much credit. He thought I should play clavier fashion. He told me how he had taken Chaubert to the organ according to his request. And I was sorry, said he, for Chaubert had told everybody, and the church was full. I had imagined the fellow would be full of spirit, fire, and rapidity, and that would tell on the organ. But as soon as he began I changed my opinion. I only said, What do you think, Herr Stein? Are you afraid that I shall come to grief on the organ? Ah, you, that is quite different. We went into the choir. I began to prelude, at which he laughed with delight, then followed a fugue. I can well believe, said he, that you enjoy playing the organ, when you play like that. At first I did not quite understand the pedal, because it was not divided. It began C, then D, E in a row. With us D and E are above, where E flat and F sharp are here, but I soon grew accustomed to it. He played the organ also in the monastery of St. Ulrich which had the dreadful steps, and often visited the monastery of the Holy Cross, where he was invited to dine on October 19th, and entertained with music during the meal, October 21st, 1777. However badly they may play, yet I prefer the music of the monastery to the Augsburg Orchestra. I played a symphony, in the violin concerto in B-flat, by Von Hall, with universal applause. The dean is a good, jolly fellow. He is a cousin of Eberlin's, named Zeschinger, and remembers Papa very well. In the evening at supper, I played the Strasbourg Concerto, Kershaw number 219. It went as smooth as oil. They all praised the beautiful pure tone. Afterwards, a little clavichord was brought in. 
I preluded and played a sonnet, and the Fisher variations. Then someone whispered to the dean that he should hear me play organ fashion. I said he might give me a theme, but he would not. So one of the monks did. I led off with it, and in the middle, the fugue was in G minor, I began in the major, in a playful style but in the same time, and then came back to the theme. At last it occurred to me that I might use the playful style for the theme of the fugue. Without more ado I tried it, and I went as accurately as if it had been measured for by Dazer, the Salzburg tailor. The dean was quite beside himself. I could never have believed it, said he. You are a wonderful man. My abbot told me that he had never in his life heard such correct and solemn organ playing. The abbot had heard me two or three days before, when the dean was not there. Finally someone brought a sonata which was fugued for me to play. But I said, gentlemen, this is too much. I must acknowledge that I cannot play this sonata at once. I think so too, said the dean eagerly, for he was quite on my side. That is too much. It would be impossible for any one. Still, said I, I will try it. And all the time I played, I heard the dean calling out behind me, Oh, you rascal! Oh, you young scamp! I played until eleven o'clock. They bombarded me with themes for fugues, and laid siege to me on all sides. In return for his kind reception and the pleasure expressed in his playing, Wolfgang presented the abbot Bartholomew Christa, 1760 to 1780, with several compositions, the masses in F, Kerschel number 192, in C, Kerschel number 220, and the Misericordias Domini, Kerschel number 222. He refers to them in writing to his father, as well as to the litany De Venerabili, November 20, 1777. What has become of this last we do not know. In spite of all this applause from connoisseurs, the prospects of a concert were not good. At first a brilliant reception was expected. Herr von Lengenmantel, son of the town councillor, had taken the matter into his own hands and promised to arrange a chamber concert for the Patrici only. But some days later he invited Wolfgang, and after he had played as long as the company pleased, explained to him that the concert could not take place, since the Patrici were not in funds. As if this were not enough, the Patrici thought fit to make sport of him at table. In accordance with his father's advice that he should ensure respect and consideration for himself in places where there was no reigning prince, by wearing the order conferred on him by the great Pope Ganganelli, Wolfgang wore the cross of his order at Augsburg. This was made an occasion for mockery, and one officer in particular, Bach by name, was so rude and insulting that Wolfgang lost patience, and repaid him in kind, calling him Herr von Kurzmantel. But he does not seem ever to have worn the order again. He had promised to attend, and perhaps to play at, the weekly concert given during the winter months by a society of noblemen, both Catholic and Protestant. But, indignant at the treatment he had received, he declared he would only give a concert for a few invited friends and connoisseurs. They were Catholic nobles, however, who had insulted him, and Stein set in motion the evangelical, not Lutheran, as Leopold Mozart reminds his son, nobles, who made such friendly overtures that he attended a concert given by the peasant nobles, and played one of his symphonies, taking the violin himself, and then a concerto and a sonata. Compliments and eulogies were heaped upon him, and finally two ducats were presented to him. Wolfgang's father thought him far too yielding. One thing is very certain, he writes, October twentieth, 1777, they would not have found me at their beggarly concert. In the meantime, through the exertions of his friends, a public concert was given on October 22nd. What do you think came next after the symphony? The concerto for three claviers, Kerschel number 242. Herr Demmler played the first, I the second, and Herr Stein the third. Then I played alone the last sonata in D, Kerschel number 284. Then my concerto in B-flat, Kerschel number 238. Then a fugue in C minor, and a splendid sonata in C major out of my own head with a rondo at the end. There was tremendous noise and confusion. Herr Stein made one grimace after another for delight. Herr Demmler actually laughed. This eccentric being always laughs when anything pleases him. This time he began to swear. Count Wolfig ran about the room, saying, I never heard anything like it in my life. He said to me, I must tell you that I never heard you play so well as today. I will tell your father so as soon as I get to Salzburg. Leopold Mozart's heart was rejoiced by a wonderfully fine article in the newspaper, probably from the pen of Herr von Sabnesnig, of whose charming poetry he had reminded Wolfgang. On the other hand, the receipts of the concert were small, considering that he had put forth all his powers, ninety golden, with sixteen golden, thirty kreutzers, expenses. Wolfgang was not tempted to retract what he had written to his father in anger about the behavior of the aristocrats, October sixteenth, 1777. I must say that if I had not found such good and charming cousins, I should repent ever having set foot in Augsburg. I must tell you something about my dear little cousin, but I will wait till tomorrow, for I ought to be in good spirits to praise her as she deserves. Early on the 17th I shall write and assure you that our little cousin is pretty, sensible, charming, clever, and merry. 
she knows something of the world having been in munich some time we two suit each other exactly for she is just a little wicked we laugh at everybody and have great fun defending his cousin against a slighting expression of his father's wolfgang says yesterday to please me she dressed a la francaise and looked five per cent prettier he gave her his portrait in a little medallion and made her promise to be painted in french costume a mournful parting ended this happy visit stein having written to wolfgang's father in the most eulogistic manner concerning his son's performances at the next quoit playing meeting in salzburg there appeared on the quoit a representation of the sad ado of two persons dissolved in tears wolfgang and his cousin the quoit was charming wrote the father november seventeenth seventeen seventy seven an augsburg maiden stood at the right and presented a young man in top boots equipped for travelling and in the other hand she carried a wonderful linen cloth trailing on the ground with which she dried her eyes the gentleman had a similar cloth which he was putting to the same use, and he held his hat in his other hand. Written above were six lines of poetry, expressive of the sorrowful emotions of the young couple. This good-humoured participation in the little adventures of his son stands in striking and effective contrast to the earnest care which breathes from a letter addressed to Wolfgang on his fete day, October 31st. I must wish you happiness on your fete day, but what more can I wish for you than I am always wishing? I wish that the grace of God may be with you everywhere, and ever forsake you as long as you are diligent in performing the duties of a true Catholic Christian. You know me, and know that I am no pedant, no canting hypocrite. But you will not refuse your father one prayer. This is that you will have such concern for your soul that you may cause your father no anguish on his deathbed in the thought that he has been careless of the things which concern your salvation. Farewell. Be happy. Be wise. Honor and cherish your mother, who is troubled in her old age for your sake. Love me as I love you, your faithful, anxious father. The son's answer is in the tone of reverence which it becomes children to adopt on such occasions to their parents. I kiss your hand and thank you humbly for your good wishes on my fete day. Have no concern for me. I have God ever before my eyes. I acknowledge his omnipotence. I fear his anger. But I also acknowledge his love, his mercy and pity towards his creatures. He will never forsake his servants. I submit myself wholly to his will. And so it cannot fail. I must be happy and content." I shall also be diligent to follow the commands and the counsel which you are so good as to give me. On October 26, Wolfgang and his mother left Augsburg, and proceeded by way of Dunevert and Nordlingen to Hohenaltheim, the residence of the Prince von edding wallerstein Music was held in high honor at this little court. Not only were celebrated performers, such as Janich, the violinist, Reiha, the violoncellist, Pervin, the oboist, etc., encouraged to settle there, but the whole orchestra was distinguished for its delicacy of execution. Rossetti, the conductor, had carried his observance of the most delicate gradations of tone, sometimes to the bounds of pedantry. Ignaz von Bieke, captain in a Württemberg dragoon regiment, was manager of the court music, and himself a distinguished clavier player and composer. The prince, a handsome young man, who had formerly invited Wolfgang to visit him in Naples, was suffering from an attack of melancholy and unable to bear music but the Mozarts were obliged to remain several days at Hohenaltheim on account of the mother's severe cold. A rumor reached Leopold Mozart that Wolfgang had been playing the buffoon there, that he had danced about playing the violin, and had gained the reputation of being a wild, merry fellow. He considered that this would afford Bika, who was jealous of Wolfgang, an excellent opportunity of depreciating his powers as an artist. January 26, 1778. Wolfgang gave a decided contradiction to this report. He had sat at the officer's table with all due honor, and had not said a word to any one, when with Bika, too, he had been quite serious. Bika had received him kindly, had promised him advice and support should he ever go to Paris, and had heard him play. They had talked about Vienna, too, and agreed that the Emperor Joseph was a fair executant, but not a true lover of music. Bika said that he had only played fugues and such like trifles before him, and that he had heard music in the Emperor's cabinet, which was enough to frighten the very dogs away. They also confided to each other that music gave them both the headache. Only good music had this effect with Bika, and bad with Mozart. The travelers entered Mannheim on October 30th. Their stay was longer than they had intended, and although the hopes with which it opened were not destined to be fulfilled, yet the months passed in Mannheim were fruitful in their effect on Wolfgang's development, both musical and moral. The elector, Karl Theodor, had studied in his early youth under the Jesuits, and had then visited the universities of Leiden in Leuven, displaying a great taste for science, poetry, art, and music, the last of which he practised himself. The extravagance with which he lavished on his court and on his park of Schwetzingen, the Versailles of the Palatinate, was carried also in some degree into the affairs of science and art. End of section 38
Chapter 16, Part 2. Section 39 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn, Section 39, Chapter 17, Part 1. The Palatinate Academy of Science, founded in 1763, encouraged historical and scientific research. Collections of pictures and engravings, and an exhibition of plaster casts from the antique, at that time the only and much thought of collection of the kind in Germany, served in connection with an academy to encourage the formative arts. And a German society, founded in Mannheim by the elector in 1775, proved the desire of its members to take their share in the new impulse which German literature had then received. Klopstock's presence in this year had not been without its influence. Not content with native authors, such as Gemmingen, Klein, Dahlberg, the painter Müller, the elector sought, but in vain, to attract acknowledged celebrities, such as Lessing and Weiland. His zealous cooperation was given to the plan of founding a German drama in the place of the usual French one, the National Theatre was built, and efforts were made to retain Lessing as a dramatist and Eckhoff as an actor. When this failed, the engagement of Marchand secured them at least a first-rate actor. But music was incontestably the peculiar province of Mannheim, the paradise of musicians. Here, too, patriotic feeling was supreme. Original German operas took the place of the grand Italian opera, with its appendage of translated comic opera, generally borrowed from the French. The performances of the Seiler Company of Actors, which had come to Weimar in the autumn of 1771 in the place of the Koch Company, suggested to Weiland the idea of a grand, serious German opera, in addition to the operettas, which had met with so much success. His Alcestes was intended as an important step in this direction, as is proved by his Letters on the German Opera of Alcestes, which, by their comparison of himself with Euripides, called forth Goethe's burlesque. His opera met with ready acknowledgment but at the same time with severe and deserved blame. It was thought to be too evidently fashioned after Metastasio's pattern, both in plan and treatment, and to be wanting in dramatic interest, true passion, and lively characteristic. The public found the opera tedious and trivial, and took just umbrage at the conception of Hercules as a virtuous humdrum citizen. Weiland found in Schweitzer an ideal composer, who identified himself with the poet, who could be silent when the poet wished to speak alone, but who hastened to aid him at need with all the resources of musical art, a composer, too, who thought more of producing a true impression on the mind of his hearers than of flattering their ears, inciting their curiosity, or even adhering too closely to the mechanical rules of his art. Weiland was not content with placing Schweitzer on a level with the best Italian composers. In a letter to Klein, he speaks of Gluck's Alceste as a divine work, but does not hesitate to declare Schweitzer's composition to be the best that had ever been heard of the kind. Schweitzer's music was in fact much applauded, and he was judged to have accomplished more than the poet. His efforts after a true and forcible musical expression of emotion, and after originality, are worthy of all praise, and phrases here and there, particularly in the accompanied recitative, are of charming effect, while the orchestra is carefully treated, and not at all after the usual manner of Italian opera. On the other hand, he has been justly blamed for his slavish adherence to the old form of the aria, with da capo, middle passage, bravura passages, and ritomelo. He is unequal, too, and his effects are all those of detail. What is wanting is genius, original power of creation, which forms details into one great whole, and produces something altogether new and complete. This was felt by Zelter and by Mozart, who wrote to his father that the best part of Schweitzer's melancholy Alceste, besides the beginnings, middles, and endings of some of the songs, was the beginning of the recitative, O Jugendzeit, and the worst, together with the greater part of the opera, was the overture. This consists of two movements, an adagio and a fugue, which are both unimportant and commonplace. Alceste was first performed in Weimar on May 28, 1773, and frequently repeated, always with the greatest success. This was also the case in Gotha and Frankfurt, and on August 13, 1775, Karl Theodor produced the opera with great brilliancy at Schweitzingen. The success was great, and it was considered as marking an epoch that a German opera written by a German poet, composed by a German musician, and sung by German artists, should be produced successfully by a German prince. In the following summer, Weiland received a commission to write a new opera, which Schweitzer was to compose under his immediate direction. The way being once cleared, it was easy to take further steps in the same direction. 
the elector hit upon the idea of representing scenes from the national history in German musical dramas. Professor Anton Klein, formerly a Jesuit, and always one of the most zealous supporters of the patriotic struggle then proceeding, wrote for this purpose Gunther von Schwarzberg, which was composed by Holzbauer and performed on January 5th in the magnificent opera house, with all the expenses guaranteed. Schubart had anticipated with joy the glorious revolution in taste, and the applause was great, although the success was not so deep and lasting as might have been expected. The critics found much in the text at which to take exception. Violin shrank from speaking in the Mercury about this so-called opera, for fear lest, absurd as it might appear, his criticism might be taken for envy. An evident effort is made to give the work a deeper tone than one of mere patriotic sentiments, but in spite of the exalted emotion and the passion of the words and music, and of all that could be done in the way of scenic accessories, the opera was too wanting in dramatic treatment and characterization to take very deep root. The phraseology is an imitation of Klopstock, but the effort after force and originality is so clumsily made that Weiland's contempt is justified. Of the music, it was said by the minister Hompesch that the predominant feeling and ideas were neither French nor Italian but genuinely German. Schubart praised its mixture of German feeling and foreign grace, and other critics spoke of its stamp of genius and its gentle grace. Mozart, who saw the opera the day after his arrival at Mannheim, wrote to his father, November 16, 1777. Holtzbauer's music is very fine, far too good for the poetry. I am amazed at the spirit of so old a man as Holtzbauer, for you would not believe the amount of fire in his music. The force and animation of Holtzbauer's music are still apparent, though it is wanting in elevation and true musical sentiment. He has not attained to original dramatic characterization except in single touches, more especially in the recitatives. He never deviates from the customary Italian form, but the adaptation of this form to German song was in itself considered a remarkable innovation. The most distinguished vocalists, male and female, of the Mannheim opera were, thanks to Holtzbauer's excellent school of music, almost all Germans. Among them was Dorothea Wendling, née Spumi, 1737 to 1811. Quote, the German Melpomene of Mannheim's Golden Age, unquote, who excited universal admiration by her perfect and expressive singing. According to Weiland, she surpassed even Mara, and he found in her his ideal of song as the language of the mind and the heart, every note being the living expression of the purest and most ardent emotion, and the whole song a continuous thread of beauty. Her beauty, Heinz saw in her countenance all that was caressing, soft, and feminine, combined with the glow and animation of a passionate nature, and her excellent acting, elevated her performances to a very high point. Her sister-in-law, Elizabeth Auguste Venling, née Sarzelli, 1746-1786, though less famous and hindered by continued ill health, was nevertheless a praiseworthy singer. While Francisca Danzi, 1756-1791, married afterwards to the oboist Lebrun, was an artist of the first rank, in her beauty and the compass of her voice, as well as in her thorough musical cultivation, at the time of Mozart's visit to Mannheim, she was in London on leave of absence. But the fame of these youthful singers was far surpassed by that of the now elderly tenor Anton Raff. He was born in 1714 at the village of Holzem, not far from Bonn, and was educated at the Jesuit seminary in Bonn. He had a beautiful voice, and the ease with which he sang by ear made it a great labor to him to learn his notes. The elector Clemens August, who heard him sing in church, provided for his education as a singer, and gave him a salary of two hundred dollars. After causing him to study a part in an oratorio, the elector took him to Munich, where he was engaged by Ferrandini to appear in opera. This led to his going to study at Bologna under Bemacchi, from whose severe school he came forth as one of the finest tenor singers of the century. He sang in 1738 at Florence at the wedding of Maria Teresa, left Italy in 1742 to return to Bonn, where his salary was raised to 750 florins, and sang at different German courts. In 1749 he performed in Jomelli's Didone at Vienna, to Metastasio's great satisfaction. After a short stay in Italy, he repaired in 1752 to Lisbon for three years, and from thence in 1755 to Madrid, where he lived in close friendship with his musical director, Farinelli. In 1759 they went together to Naples. Here, it is said, his singing made so deep an impression on the Princess Belmonte Pignatelli as to cure her of a deep melancholy into which she had been thrown by the death of her husband. On his return to Germany in 1770, the elector Karl Theodor besought him to enter his service, on which Raff modestly declared that he should esteem himself happy if the elector would be content with the small remnant of his powers which was left to him. His voice was of the finest tenor quality that could be heard, from the deepest to the highest notes, even, clear, and full. 
with a perfect mastery of the art of song displaying itself in his extraordinary power of singing at sight and of varying and introducing cadenzas he combined a feeling delivery that seemed but an echo of his own good heart and a clear deliberate judgment on things musical added to all this his enunciation was so distinct that even in the largest hall not a syllable was lost when mozart first heard him in gunther von schwarzberg his chief impression was that of an old man's failing strength he writes november eighth seventeen seventy seven Herr Roth sang his four songs, and about four hundred and fifty incidental bars, in such a manner as to show that it is want of voice which makes it so bad, unless one reminds oneself all the time that it is Roth, the old and celebrated tenor, who is singing, one cannot help laughing. As for myself, if I had not known it was Roth, I should have died of laughing. As it was, I took out my handkerchief and blew my nose. He never was, they tell me, anything of an actor. He should only be heard, not seen. His presence is not at all good." In the opera he has to die, singing a long, long, slow air. And he died with a smiling mouth, his voice falling so at the end as to be quite inaudible. I was sitting in the orchestra next to Venling, the flute player, and I remarked that it was unnatural to expect a man to go on singing till he fell down dead. "'Never mind,' said I. "'A little patience, and it will soon be over.' "'I think it will,' said he, and laughed." After hearing him oftener, Mozart did more justice to Roff's artistic skill, but he always thought his style wanting in simplicity. In a letter from Paris, June 12, 1778, he pronounces a more detailed judgment, true to his convictions, yet anxious not to wrong the excellent man of whom he was extremely fond. At his debut in the Concert Spirituel, here he sang Bach's Schena, Non so donde viene, which is my favorite song. I never heard him sing it before, and he pleased me. His style suits the song— but the style in itself, that of the Bernacchi school, is not at all to my taste. There is too much in it of cantabile. I grant that when he was younger and in his prime the effect must have been sometimes quite startling. I like it, too, but there is too much of it. It is often ludicrous. What really pleases me is his singing of certain little things andantino, which he does in his own style. Everything in its place. I imagine that his forte was bravura singing, which gives him still, in spite of age, a good chest and a long breath. His voice is fine and very pleasant. If I shut my eyes when he is singing, I hear considerable resemblance to Meissner's, only Roff's voice is the pleasanter of the two. Meissner, as you know, has the bad habit of endeavoring to make his voice tremble. Roff never does this. He cannot bear it. But, as far as true cantabile is concerned, I like Meissner better than Roff, though he, too, according to my judgment, makes too much of it. In bravura passages and roulades, and in his good distinct utterance, Raff bears off the palm. All who saw Raff on the stage pronounced him to be no actor, but only a singer. In private he preserved the serenity and moderation of an estimable and genuinely pious character. His moral conduct was faultless, his opinions earnest and severe. He had occasional fits of passion, but was for the most part good-humoured and benevolent, a true and self-denying friend. No wonder that Mozart conceived a strong and lasting attachment to such a man as this. The most distinguished tenor singer in Mannheim, after Raff, was his pupil Franz Hartig, born 1750. Church music in Mannheim did not stand on the same high level as the opera. Schubart complains that little attention was paid to the true church style, and that the old masses were despised and the new ones introduced in the most effeminate and mincing operatic style. Even Holzbauer's sacred compositions were far inferior to his operas. Mozart heard a mass by Holzbauer, written twenty-six years ago but very good as he writes to his father, November 4th, 1777. He writes well, in good church style, with fine passages for the voices and instruments. Notwithstanding, he was far from pleased with the Mannheim church music on the whole, and did not care, as he writes in the same letter, to have one of his own masses performed there. Why? On account of their brevity. No, for everything here is short. On account of their church style? Not at all. But only because, under present circumstances, it is necessary to write principally for the instruments, since nothing more wretched than the vocal department can be conceived. Six soprani, six alti, six tenori, and six bassi to twenty violins and twelve basses stand just in the proportion of zero to one, do they not, Herr Bullinger? They have only two male sopranos, and both old. Just dying out. The soprano prefers singing the alto part, because his upper notes are gone. The few boys that they have are wretched, and the tenors and basses are like singers at a funeral. The organ was still worse provided for, and Mozart pulls out the full measure of his scorn on the two court organists. They have two organists here, for whose sake alone it would be worth taking the journey to Mannheim. I had a good opportunity of hearing them, for it is the custom here to omit the Benedictus, and for the organist to go on playing instead. The first time I heard the second organist, and the next time the first. But I have a better opinion of the second than of the first. 
When I heard him, I asked, who was at the organ? Our second organist. He plays wretchedly. When I heard the other, I asked, who was that? Our first organist. He plays more wretchedly still. I suppose if they were shaken up together, the result would be something worse still. It makes one die of laughing to see them. The second goes to the organ like a child to the mud. He shows his trade in his face. The first wears spectacles. I stood at the organ and watched him for the sake of instruction. He lifts his hands high up at every note. His tour de force is the use of the sext stop, but he oftener uses the quint or the octave stop. He often playfully lets fall the right hand, and plays only with the left. In a word, he does as he likes. He is so far completely master of his instrument. But Mannheim was distinguished most particularly for its instrumental music, the orchestra being unanimously considered the finest in Europe. It was more numerous and better appointed, especially as to wind instruments, than was customary at the time. It was here that Mozart first became acquainted with the clarinet as an orchestral instrument. Oh, if we only had clarinetti, he writes, December 3rd, 1778, you cannot think what a splendid effect a symphony makes with flutes, oboes, and clarinets. Bernie had only one fault to find, a fault common to all orchestras of the day, that is, the occasionally defective intonation of the wind instruments. The Mannheim Orchestra was not only well appointed and strong, but uniform and certain in execution, with delicate gradations of tone, until then unknown. Piano and forte were rendered in the most varied degrees. Crescendo and diminuendo were first invented at Mannheim, and for a long time other orchestras made no attempt at imitation. Other means, too, such as the skillful blending of the wind and stringed instruments, were made the most of to produce a well-arranged, finely gradationed whole. The excellence of the Mannheim Orchestra, whose performances excited as much admiration among contemporaries as those of the Paris Orchestra under Habeneck's conductorship in our own time, gained for it the honor of taking a regular share in the elector's concerts. The band contained some of the first artists and virtuosi of the day, such as Kanabich, Toschke, Kramer, Stamitz, and Franzel among the violins, Wendling as a flute player, Lebrun and Ram as oboists, Ritter as bassoonist, and Lang as horn player. But its fame rested chiefly on the excellent discipline of the orchestra, which, among so many first-rate artists, it was no easy task to maintain. The Kapellmeister at the time of Mozart's visit was Christian Kanabich, 1731 to 1798, who had succeeded Stamitz in 1775. His compositions were doubtless overrated by his contemporaries, but he was admirable as a solo violinist, and still better as an orchestral leader, besides being an excellent teacher. The majority of the violinists in the Mannheim Orchestra had issued from his school, and to this was mainly owing the uniformity of their execution and delivery. Kanabich, who was more of an organizer than an originator, had experimented with every condition and device for producing instrumental effects, and he laid special stress on technical perfection of execution, in order to ensure good tutti players. Uniting, as he did, intelligence and a genius for direction to, quote, a true German heart, unquote, and a moral and temperate life, he possessed the confidence and esteem of his musicians, and was therefore the better able to bring their performances to the highest excellence. End of section 39, chapter 17, part 1. Section 40 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn. Section 40, Chapter 17, Part 2. The many-sidedness of musical performances in Mannheim had helped to form a very original taste, and Karl Theodor himself was careful to encourage composers and virtuosi of all kinds. The groundwork both of thought and instruction was Italian, certainly, but the fact that the care of musical affairs was instructed to German musicians had an influence of its own, even before the national element had asserted its supremacy in Germany. French influence, too, made itself felt side by side with the Italian. The connection maintained by the elector Palatine with the court of Versailles was profitable in every way to his musicians. Finally, the partiality for instrumental music, which we have already noted, must have tended to give an independent impulse to musical production in Mannheim. His stay in a town so thoroughly and genuinely musical must have had a more abiding effect upon Mozart than was exercised by Salzburg, Augsburg, or even Munich. He came to Mannheim at a time when the minds of men were full of fresh and eager aspirations after artistic and literary excellence, and fortunately for him the interest was mainly centred on his own peculiar province, the drama. 
We cannot imagine, however, that he was dazzled or abashed by the wealth of musical knowledge, or by the accomplishments of the noted musicians with whom he came in contact. His confidence in his own powers preserved him from any feeling of constraint or distrust. At first he was surprised at the small amount of attention which his presence excited. On the day after his arrival he made the acquaintance of the violinist, Christian Danner, born 1745, and went with him to rehearsal. I thought that I should not be able to keep from laughing when I was introduced to people. Some of them, who knew me, Père Renemui, were polite and respectful, but the rest, who did not know anything of me, stared at me in the most ludicrous manner. They think because I am little and young that there can be nothing great or old in me, but they shall soon see. Mozart always resented, even in later years, any reference to his small stature and unimposing appearance, even when it was made by way of contrast to his great performances. His predictions were verified. It was not long before he gained the esteem and admiration of the Mannheim musicians, the ready good will with which he placed his talents and services at their disposal, and his cheerfulness and good breeding in society, rendering him a universal favorite. His spirits rose in proportion as the memory of his position at Salzburg faded from his mind. Even from Munich he wrote to his father, September 26, 1777, I am always in the best of spirits. I feel as light as a feather since I left all that chichanery behind. I am fatter, too, already. At Mannheim, in daily intercourse with cultivated artists, he must have felt completely at his ease. The members of the band were well paid and well treated. Carl Theodore's love of music and general affability gave them considerable freedom of position, and intercourse with their circle was liberal and pleasant. Schubert declares that the houses, tables, and hearts of all the musicians were open to him during the whole of his stay, and that he had his share in their practicings and their festivities. Mozart's experience was the same, although, his stay being longer, he could not fail to observe that the superficial frivolity of court life had affected the tone even of the artistic circles. His friendly reception by Cannabich led to an intimate friendship and daily intercourse with the whole family, in which Wolfgang's mother was included. He often dined with them, and no long time elapsed before he found himself al solito at supper and spending the evenings with the Cannabichs. They chatted, played a little sometimes, or Wolfgang used to take a book out of his pocket and read. Occasionally the party became merrier and not quite so decorous, as the following mock confession made by Wolfgang to his father will show, November 14, 1777. I, Johannes Chrysostomus Amadeus Wolfgangus Sismundus Mozart, do hereby confess that both yesterday and the day before, and on various other occasions, I remained out until twelve o'clock at night, and that from ten o'clock until the above-named hour, I was at Cannabich's house, in company with Cannabich, his wife, and daughter, Herr Schatzmeister, Herr Ram, and Herr Long, making rhymes and perpetuating bad jokes in thought and word, but not in deed. But I should not have conducted myself in so godless a fashion had not the ringleader of the sport, the above-named daughter, Liesel, incited and abetted me therein, and I must acknowledge that I found it extremely amusing." I bewail all these my sins and transgressions from the bottom of my heart, and, hoping to confess the same thing very frequently, I make an earnest resolution to amend my former sinful life. I therefore beg for a dispensation, that is, if it is an easy one. If not, it is all the same to me, for the game is not like to come to an end very soon. That Mozart was always ready when music was wanted we cannot doubt. On one of his first visits to Cannabich, he played all his six sonatas one after the other. Cannabich was not slow to recognize his extraordinary talent, nor to make use of it on occasion, as when Wolfgang made good clavier arrangements of his ballets for him. But self-interest had no share in the feelings with which he came to regard Wolfgang. Both he and his wife loved him as their own son, threw themselves zealously into all that concerned his well-being, and watched over him as true friends. The magnet which attracted Wolfgang to the house at first, and kept him chained there for a time, was Cannabich's oldest daughter, Rosa, who was then thirteen, a pretty, charming girl, as Wolfgang writes to his father, December 16, 1777. She has a staid manner and a great deal of sense for her age. She speaks but little, and when she does speak it is with grace and amiability. 
the day after his arrival october thirty first she played something for him he thought her playing good and began to compose a sonata for her as a mark of attention to Kennebec. the first allegro was ready on the same day young danner asks me he continues what i meant to do for the andante i mean to make it exactly like mademoiselle rose herself when i played it they were all wonderfully pleased young danner said afterwards you were quite right the andante is exactly like her on november eighth he wrote the rondo at cannabix consequently they would not let me away again mademoiselle rose's talent gained an in interest for him when on studying the sonata with her he found that it had been neglected the right hand is very good but the left is utterly ruined if i were her regular master i would lay aside all music cover the keys with a handkerchief and make her practice passages shakes etc first with the right hand and then with the left slowly to begin with until the hands were perfectly independent after that i believe i should make an excellent player of her the regular lessons followed in due time he gave an hour daily to the young lady and was very well satisfied with the result yesterday she gave me indescribable pleasure he writes december sixth seventeen seventy seven by playing my sonata most beautifully the andante a slow one was full of feeling she enjoys playing it her father thought the sonata wonderfully good december eleventh seventeen seventy seven there was a little of the mannheim affected taste in it but not enough to spoil wolfgang's own good style another musician with whom mozart entered into very friendly relations was the distinguished flute player johann wendling Kanevik introduced him every one was as polite as could be he informs his father the daughter augusta who was at one time the elector's mistress plays the clavier well afterwards i played i was in an excellent humor and played everything out of my head and three duets with the violin which i had never seen before in my life and the name of whose author i did not even know they were all so delighted that i was obliged to kiss the ladies i had no objection as far as the daughter was concerned for she is not by any means ugly he composed a french song for this mademoiselle gustel of whom Wieland said that she was so like one of raphael's or carlo dolce's madonnas that he could hardly refrain from addressing a salve regina to her she had given him the words and her delivery of them was so charming that the song was called for every day at venling's and they all raved about it he promised to compose some more for her and one at least was begun at a later time an aria with a recitative was also sketched out for dorothea venling the mother as she herself selected the words from metatestio's didone ah no le charme no bel idol mio and she as well as her daughter went wild over this song it was mozart's custom in sketching his songs to write out the bass entire and even some indications of the accompaniment so that the song could be sung and in some measure accompanied from the sketch whether this particular song was ever completed we do not know mozart did not forget wendling himself we are told that a concerto of his was rehearsed at cannabix to which mozart had arranged the instruments november twenty second seventeen seventy seven he had a dislike to the flute and a mistrust of flute players but he made an exception in favor of wendling when wendling's brother teased him for this he said yes but you see it is quite another thing with your brother he is not a piper and one need not always be in terror for fear the next note should be too high or too low he is always right you see his heart and his ear and the tip of his tongue are all in the right place and he does not imagine that blowing and making faces is all that is needed he knows too what adagio means wolfgang presented his oboe concerto to the oboist friedrich Rahm, born seventeen forty four whom he met at cannabix and who went wild over it november fourth seventeen seventy seven he made it his cheval du battel playing it five times during the same winter february thirteenth seventeen seventy eight with great success although it was known to be by me mozart soon became universally liked and admired as well for his readiness and good nature in composing as for his performances on the organ and clavier but we hear nothing more of his violin playing he gave a humorous description to his father of the effect made by his organ playing soon after his arrival in mannheim november thirteenth seventeen seventy seven last sunday i played the organ in the chapel for a joke i came in during the kyrie and played to the end of it 
and after the priest had given out the gloria i made a cadenza nothing like it had ever been heard here before so that everybody looked round especially holzbauer he said to me if i had only known i would have chosen another mass yes said i in order to do for me altogether old tishy the concertmeister and wendling stood near me the people were inclined to laugh because every now and then when i wanted a pizzicato effect i gave little bangs to the notes i was in my best humor a voluntary is always played here instead of the benedictus i took the idea of the sanctus and carried it out as a fugue there they all stood and made faces at the end after the misa est i played another fugue the pedal is different from ours and puzzled me a little at first but i soon got used to it when the new organ in the lutheran church was tried december eighteen all the kapellmeisters were invited and wolfgang's mother writes how a distinguished lutheran came and invited him also he admired the organ both in pino and in its single stops but he disliked vogler who played it he would not play much himself only a prelude and a fugue but he arranged to go again with a party of friends and then he meant to have some rare fun on the organ in the reformed church also where the organ was considered a remarkably fine one he played once to a friend for an hour and a half the great admiration he excited as a clavier player is described by his mother december twenty eighth seventeen seventy seven wolfgang is made much of everywhere but he plays quite differently from what he does at salzburg for there are nothing but pianofortes here and you never heard anything like the way he manages them in a word every one that hears him declares that his equal is not to be found although becca has been here as well as schubart they all agree that he surpasses them both in beauty of tone in gusto and delicacy and what they most admire is his playing out of his head whatever is laid before him clavier playing was less esteemed in mannheim than proficiency on an orchestral instrument and peter winter a true representative of the mannheim band could not play the clavier at all and could not abide such jingling noise as he used to tell his friends but mozart had plenty of opportunity for comparing himself with other clavier players the abbe johann francis xavier sterkel seventeen fifty to eighteen seventeen one of the most celebrated performers of the day came from mayence where he was pianist and chaplain to the elector during mozart's stay at mannheim last evening but one he informs his father december twenty sixth seventeen seventy seven i was all solito at cannabix and sterkel came in he played five duets but so quick as to be unintelligible and neither distinctly nor in time they all said so mademoiselle cannabix played the sixth and she really did it better than sterkel the same fault that he found with sterkel viz the endeavour to make an effect by rapid execution and playing at sight in reality a mere device to hide imperfect execution mozart also found with the playing of vogler seventeen forty nine to eighteen fourteen the solitary clavier performer resident at mannheim he tells his father january seventeenth seventeen seventy eight of his meeting vogler at a large party after dinner he had his two claviers brought which were tuned together and also his tiresome printed sonatas i was obliged to play them and he accompanied me on the other clavier i was obliged at his pressing request to have my sonatas brought also before dinner he had stumbled through my concerto the litzau one two forty six k prima vista the first movement went prestissimo the andante allegro and the rondo really prestissimo he played almost throughout a different bass to the one that was written and sometimes the harmonies and even the melodies were altered indeed this was inevitable owing to the great speed the eye could not see and the hand could not grasp the music but what kind of playing at sight is that the hearers those i mean who are worthy of the name can only say that they have seen music and clavier playing they hear and think and feel just as little as the performer himself you can imagine that the worst part of it to me is not being able to say much too quick after all it is much easier to play fast than slow notes can be dropped out of passages without being noticed but is that desirable the rapidity allows the right and left hand to be used indiscriminately but should it be so in what does the art of playing at sight consist in playing the piece correctly in strict time giving the proper expression to every passage and every note so that it might be imagined that the player had composed the piece himself 
Vogler's fingering is atrocious. His left thumb is like Aldgasser's, and he makes all the runs for the right hand with his first finger and thumb. Mozart's antipathy to Vogler shines through this description, and is equally apparent whenever he has occasion to mention him. Personally, he had nothing to complain of in Vogler. Herr Vogler positively insisted on making my acquaintance, he writes to his father, January 17, 1778. After plaguing me very often to go to him, he puts his pride in his pocket and paid me the first visit. No assurance will be needed that the rivalry of the two in composition, organ, and clavier playing would not lead Mozart to disparage great merit where it existed. It might have contributed to sharpen his judgment, which, however, was essentially the same as that passed on Vogler by the whole orchestra, from the highest to the lowest. He was regarded as an interloper, who had usurped an important position in Mannheim, and had intrigued against such men as Holtzbauer for the purpose. The violet stockings which he wore as papal legatee were thought absurd, and his habit of taking a prayer-book into society, together with his music, and of frequently keeping visitors waiting while he performed his devotions, was considered mere affectation. Many complaints were made of his haughty and depreciatory manner, and his own performances fell far short of the expectations excited by himself. End of section 40, chapter 17, part 2section forty one of the life of mozart volume one by otto jan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by marianne the life of mozart by otto jan section forty one chapter seventeen part three but apart from all influence of partisanship or gossip it is quite conceivable that two such diverse natures should exercise a mutual repulsion on each other. Fogler was no doubt an original and striking character. The very fact that his contemporaries were either his enthusiastic admirers or his sworn enemies affords proof of this. He possessed musical talent, intellect and shrewdness, together with much energy of character, so that his attainments were extensive both in the arts and sciences but these qualities, uncombined with creative genius, could not reach the highest beauty and truth, either in art or science. We find Vogler, therefore, in whom creative genius did not exist, seeking for effect in the technicalities of his art, and as a consequence, in something outside the art itself. He prided himself especially on his program music, which was full of purely sensuous effects, and on his playing, which was crowded with theoretical difficulties. The principal charm in both cases imported from without, not an essential product of the art itself. Vogler was the first to give this direction to musical activity, striving to hide a deficiency in creative power under general cultivation of mind, and, as a necessary result, hampering the natural development of true art. His celebrated pupils, Weber and Meyerbeer, have rendered the same tendency fruitful in consequence to modern music. A consistent endeavor after what is true and beautiful in art presupposes a singleness of mind in the artist which cannot exist with inordinate ambition and a calculating spirit. In truth, the contradictions in Vogler's moral nature, which were remarked even by his adherents, were as striking as those in his artistic nature. If we consider the impression such a man must have made on Mozart, whose creative genius was its own measure and law, penetrating the very essence of his being, and elevating even the drudgery of his profession to the freedom of high art, we can comprehend how he would instinctively recoil from Vogler, and how his own severe education, which had elevated and refined his nature, without injuring his healthy love of truth, would prevent his doing full justice to his rival's merits. There can be no doubt that Mozart's opinion of Vogler, which he took no pains to conceal, gave great offence to the latter. But there is no evidence that he plotted against him, as the father conjectures, nor does Wolfgang himself make any such accusation. Among Vogler's adherents in Mannheim was Peter Winter, 1755-1826, to who was almost the only friend, that is, the only intimate friend, that Vogler had. His daily offerings to Vogler's vanity were much to be regretted. He objected, however, in after days, to be called Vogler's pupil. He seems to have taken a dislike to Mozart, which the latter had caused to feel very sensibly. 
the remaining members of the orchestra however were only the more attracted to mozart by the position which he assumed in regard to vogler wendling and Rahm mediated a journey to paris during lent and ritter the bassoonist was to precede them thither they intended to give concerts together and wendling proposed to wolfgang to accompany them since such a composer and virtuoso as he would immeasurably strengthen their company wolfgang was strongly inclined to consent and wrote to his father december third seventeen seventy seven if i stay here until lent i shall accompany wendling Rahm, the oboist and a very fine one and lotchery the ballet manager to paris herr wendling assures me that i shall have no cause to repent it he has been twice in paris has only lately returned and says it is the only place where fame and money can be made you are a man says he who can do anything i will show you how to set about it you must compose operas serious and comic oratorios and everything whoever has written a couple of operas in paris is a made man at once then there are the concerts spirituels and academie des amateurs where you get five louis d'ors for a symphony if you give lessons it is at the rate of three louis d'ors for twelve sonatos trios and quartets are printed by subscription Kennebec and toshi send a great deal of their music to paris wendling is a man who understands travelling pray write me your opinion on the subject it seems to me a good idea i shall travel with a man who knows the paris of the present day thoroughly for it has altered very much i should spend little indeed i think not half so much as now for i should only have to pay for myself mamma would remain here and probably stay with the wendlings herr ritter who plays the bassoon very well sets out for paris on the twelfth instant Ram is a right honest merry fellow of about thirty-five he has travelled much and knows the world well the greatest and best musicians here like and esteem me i am always called herr kappelmeister wolfgang's mother was not opposed to the project she writes to her husband december eleventh seventeen seventy seven about wolfgang and his journey to paris you must consider what is right nowadays paris is the only place to get on herr wendling is an honourable man well known to all he has travelled much and has been in paris thirteen times so that he knows it thoroughly our friend herr von grimm is his best friend also and has done much for him so you must decide as you like i shall be ready to agree herr wendling has assured me that he would act as wolfgang's father he loves him as his own son and will i am sure take as good care of him as i do you can well imagine that i am adverse to parting from him and if i have to come home alone the long journey will be a great trial to me but what can be done the journey to paris would be more fatiguing and too expensive for one does not spend a fourth part travelling alone if this plan was to be carried out wolfgang must remain at mannheim through the winter his first endeavour therefore was to obtain a situation in the band from the elector and his friends eagerly seconded his efforts holzbauer had taken him soon after his arrival to the manager count savioli november fourth seventeen seventy seven where Kennebich chanced to be present herr holzbauer said to the count in italian that i wished for the honour of playing before his highness the elector i had been here fifteen years before when i was eight years old i was now older and taller and my music had improved also ah said the count that is young somebody or other for whom he mistook me then Kennebich began to speak i pretended not to listen and talked to someone else but i noticed that he spoke very earnestly then the count said to me i hear that you play fairly well on the clavier i made obeisance the elector happened to be holding court at the time and count savioli at once presented wolfgang to the electress who received him very graciously and remembered his being there fifteen years before though she would not have recognized him on november sixth there was a grand state concert at which mozart played a concerto and before the closing symphony a sonata and something out of his head the elector and his wife and all the court were pleased with me at the concert every time i played she and the elector came quite near my clavier after the concert Kennebich intimated that i might speak to the elector i kissed hands and he said i think it is fifteen years since you were here before yes your highness fifteen years since i had the honour you play remarkably well when i kissed the hand of the princess she said monsieur je vais assurer on ne peut pas jouer mieux 
the electress informed him that she should like him to play to her alone and they were obliged to remain until the command to do so should arrive some days after count savioli handed him a present a beautiful gold watch ten gold caroli would however have been more useful to him than the watch which was valued at twenty i have now with your permission five watches i have a great mind to have a pocket made on each side and to wear two watches which is the fashion now so that it may not occur to any one to give me another in his father's opinion wolfgang would do wrong to remain in mannheim any longer than necessary unless he had certain prospects of a situation there his good friends could watch over any future interests in his absence and he ought not to lose the opportunity of making himself known in different places and of earning money according to intelligence received from frankfurt there was nothing to be made there but at mayence with the support of the concertmeister george cruiser concerts might be arranged both in private before the enthusiastically musical elector and in the town something too might be made at koblenz out of the elector clemens between whom and the elector wolfgang had sat at table and composed with a pencil in munich when they were returning from england page forty eight nothing could be done in bonn they might return to mannheim after such expeditions as these if there was any prospect of remaining there over the winter paris must only be thought of as a last resource it would be a difficult and risky undertaking to l mozart who was continually revolving schemes in his mind it seemed in no way right that the travellers should have settled themselves so comfortably at mannheim wolfgang finding himself for the first time in a congenial professional atmosphere and in familiar intercourse with cultivated minds was only too ready to hearken when every one said to him where can you go for the winter the season is too bad for travelling stay here and then the prospects which so many good friends opened to him appeared to him in no wise uncertain his mother allowed herself to be led by her son and his friends and was easily persuaded that to stay in mannheim would be most advantageous for wolfgang the elector had ordered mozart to be conducted before his natural children whom he visited for some hours every afternoon taking great interest in their studies mozart who was accompanied by cannabich thus describes the interview november eighth seventeen seventy seven i talked to the elector quite familiarly he is both gracious and good he said to me i hear that you wrote an opera at munich yes your highness i humbly crave your grace it is my greatest wish to write an opera here i pray your highness not to forget me i can write german too god be praised well that may happen he has one son and three daughters the eldest and the young count play the clavier the elector consulted me quite confidentially about his children i spoke quite openly but without blaming their master cannabich was of my opinion too when the elector left he thanked me very politely some days after he went again and played with his whole heart three times at the request of the elector who sat by him motionless a certain professor gave him a subject for a fugue this seemed the surest way to the favor of the elector at cannabich's instigation he tells his father who counted on cannabich's friendship his interest being concerned on his daughter's account he asked count savioli whether the elector would not keep him there during the winter and he would engage to give the children lessons cannabich promised to propose and support this plan to the elector but he must wait until after the gala days and then the best results might be expected but a thing like this must not be hurried and patience would be required as wolfgang informs his father and admonishes him not to lose time in speculations which generally prove useless in the meantime he had drawn on the banker for one hundred and fifty gulden for the host would rather hear the jingle of money than of music this did not in any way please wolfgang's father who delivers a sharp reproof for his thoughtless expression as to the father's speculation being useless Gerechter Gott, he writes, you tell me not to speculate when I am in debt already on your account four hundred and fifty florins, and you think you will put me in good humor by writing all sorts of absurd nonsense. He shows them how little use they have made of their time so far, and scolds them for not announcing their plans beforehand, so that proper preparations could be made. I beg you, my dear Wolfgang, to be more thoughtful, and not to wait to write about things until they are past, otherwise all will go wrong he points out how they have been living hitherto almost entirely on hope leaving him to the care of the money which they required he had not even received the accounts which his dear wife had promised him and they had drawn money without giving him proper notice a journey like this is no joke 
you have not felt it hitherto you must have something more serious in your head than nonsense you have to foresee to consider to calculate or else you will find yourself in a mess without money and no money means no friends even if you give lessons a hundred times over and complete sonatas and play the fool every night from ten to twelve o'clock ask those dear friends of yours for credit all the jokes will come to an end and the most jocular countenance will turn grave on a sudden hereupon followed a very vague money account from the wife december eleventh seventeen seventy seven my dear husband you wish to know what we have spent on our journey we sent you albert's bill and the ausberg one was thirty-eight florins wolfgang has told you that we were twenty-four florins short but he has not included the expenses of the concert which were sixteen florins nor the hotel bill so that when we came to mannheim we had not more than sixty gulden and if we had left there in a fortnight there would not have been much over for travelling costs more since things have grown so dear it is not what it was you would be surprised the irritated and somewhat despondent tone in which wolfgang replied to his father's reproaches november twentieth seventeen seventy seven shows that he felt their truth and that the easy-going comfort of his life at mannheim was disturbed by the first indications of his duty if you consider the cause of my inaction to be laziness and want of care then i can do nothing but thank you for your good opinion and lament from my heart that my father does not know me better i am not careless i am only resigned to everything and so can wait with patience and bear all provided my honour and my good name of mozart do not suffer well if it must be it must but i pray you beforehand not to rejoice or to be sorry before its time for whatever happens it is all right if one is healthy happiness consists in the imagination november twenty ninth seventeen seventy seven but his father was not satisfied with all this moral philosophy and calmly criticizes the saying that happiness consists in imagination as being worthy only of a wild herb he calls upon his son to realize the situation of being asked to pay and having no money my dear wolfgang that is a saying fit for those who are satisfied with nothing the negotiations with the elector continued and wolfgang sought to enlighten his father concerning cannabich's intentions and behavior november twenty ninth seventeen seventy seven in the afternoon after the first interview with savioli i was at cannabich's and as it was by his advice that i had gone to the count he asked me whether i had been i told him all he said i should be very glad if you remained with us all winter but it would be still better if you could take service here altogether i said i could wish for nothing better than to be always with you but i do not see how that is possible you have two kapellmeisters already and i could not consent to come after vogler nor need you said he no musician here is under the kapellmeister nor even under the manager the elector could appoint you his chamber composer just wait a little i will speak to the count about it the following thursday was the state concert when the count saw me he apologized for not having spoken but he said he was waiting for monday when the court would be over i let three days pass and then as i heard nothing i went to inquire he said my dear monsieur mozart this was friday that is yesterday to-day the elector went hunting and i could not possibly ask him but to-morrow at this time you shall certainly have an answer end of section forty one chapter seventeen part three Section 42 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Life of Mozart, by Otto Jahn. Section 42, Chapter 17, Part 4. I begged him not to forget truth to tell i was a little annoyed when i came away and i determined to take my easiest six variations on the fisher minuet one seventy nine k i had already copied them out for the purpose to the young count that i might have an opportunity of speaking to the elector myself when i brought them the governess could not contain her delight i was politely received then i produced the variations and said they were for the young count she said oh you are very good but have you nothing for the countess not at present said i but 
If I remain here long enough, I shall. Apropos, she said, I'm glad that you are to remain the winter here. Indeed. I did not know. That is curious. I am surprised. The elector told me himself. Well, if he has said it, I suppose it is so, for, of course, my staying here depends on the elector. Then I told her the whole story. We agreed that I should come to-morrow at four o'clock and bring something for the countess. She would speak to the elector before I came, and I should meet him there. I have been to-day, but he has not been there. I will go again to-morrow. I have a rondeau for the countess. Now, have I not enough reason to remain here and await the issue? Ought I to leave now that so important a step is taken? I have an opportunity of speaking to the elector myself. I think I shall probably remain the winter here, for the elector likes me, thinks much of me, and knows what I can do. I hope to be able to give you good news in my next letter. I beg you again not to sorrow or rejoice about it too soon, and to tell the affair to no one but Herr Bullinger and my sister. But the affair was not so easily settled. In his next letter, December 3, 1777, Wolfgang could only tell his father of the many incidents which seemed to promise a good result. Last Monday, after three successive attempts morning and afternoon, I was fortunate enough to meet with the elector. We all thought that our trouble was again in vain, for it was getting late, but at last we saw him coming. The governess at once placed the countess at the clavier, and I sat near her, giving her a lesson. The elector saw us so when he arrived. We stood up, but he told us to continue. When she had finished playing, the governess remarked that I had written a charming rondo for her. I played it, and he was highly pleased. Then he asked, But will she be able to learn it? Oh, yes, said I. I only wish that I could have the happiness of teaching it to her myself. He took snuff and said, I should like it, but would it not do her harm to have two masters? Oh, no, your highness, it only signifies whether she has a good or a bad one. I hope your highness will have no doubt, will have confidence in me. Oh, certainly, said he. Then the governess said, Monsieur Mozart has also written variations on Fisher's minuet for the young count. I played them, and he was again very pleased. Then he began to play with the children, and I thanked him for the presentation watch. He said, well, I will think about it. How long shall you remain here? As long as your highness commands. I have no engagements elsewhere. And that was all. This morning I was there again, and was told that the elector had said several times last night that Mozart would remain all winter. Now that it has gone so far, I must wait. Today I dined at Wedling's for the fourth time. Before dinner, Count Savioli came in with a Kabelmeister Schweitzer, who arrived yesterday. Savioli said to me, I have spoken several times to the elector, but he has not yet made up his mind. I told him I should like to say a word to him, and we went to the window. I told him the doubts of the elector, complained of being kept waiting so long, and begged him to induce the elector to engage me. Only I feared, I said, that he would offer me so little that I should not be able to remain. Let him give me work. I wanted work. He promised to do as I asked. It may be this evening since he does not go to court to-day. But to-morrow he has promised me a decided answer. Now, let what may happen, I shall be content. If he does not keep me, I shall ask for a parting gift, for I do not intend to make the elector a present of the rondo and the variations. I assure you I take the affair quite composedly, knowing that all will be for the best, as, come what may, I have resigned myself to the will of God." But for several days yet no answer could be obtained from the elector except a shrug of the shoulders, and I have not made up my mind. At last Mozart was able to acquaint his father with the result of all these negotiations. It was such as L. Mozart had expected from the first, December 10, 1777. There is nothing to be done with the elector at present. The day before yesterday I went to the concert at court to get my answer. Count Savioli avoided me as long as he could, but I went up to him, and when he saw me he shrugged his shoulders. What? said I. No answer yet. A thousand pardons, said he, but, unfortunately, nothing can be done. Eh bien, I answered. The elector might have told me that sooner. Yes, said he. He would not have made up his mind now if I had not urged him to it, and represented to him how long you have been waiting already, and spending your money at the hotel. That annoys me most of all, I answered. It is not at all well done. 
but I am exceedingly obliged to you, Count, he is not called Excellency, for your endeavours on my behalf, and I shall be obliged if you will thank the Elector in my name for his gracious, though somewhat tardy, intelligence, and assure him that, if it had pleased him to engage me, he would not have repented doing so. Oh, said he, I am more sure of that than you believe. The unexpected turn of affairs made quite as unpleasant an impression upon the Mannheim circle of friends as upon Mozart. He went at once to Cannabix, and he being out hunting, related the whole story to his wife. When Mademoiselle Rose, who was three rooms off and busied with the linen, had finished, she came in and said to me, "'Is it your pleasure that we begin?' For it was time for a lesson. "'I am at your service,' said I. "'We will have a good steady lesson to-day,' said she." We will indeed, I answered, for it will not last much longer. How so? Why? She went to her mamma, who told her, What? she said. Is it really true? I do not believe it. Yes, yes, quite true, said I. She played my sonata through quite seriously. Believe me, I could not refrain from weeping, and before it was ended there were tears in the eyes of the mother and daughter, and of Herr Schatzmeister, who was present, for the sonata was a favorite with the whole house. You see, said Schatzmeister, when Herr Kappelmeister, they always call me so, goes away, he makes us all cry. I must say that I have made good friends here, and one learns to know them under such circumstances. Wendling was specially concerned at the intelligence. When Mozart communicated it, he grew quite red, and said very hastily, We must find some way of keeping you here, at all events for the two months before we go to Paris together. When Wolfgang went to dine with him next day, he made him what seemed a very satisfactory proposal. A Dutchman, de John or de Camp, nicknamed the Nabob, who lived on his means, and had been a friend and admirer of Wolfgang, offered to give him two hundred florins for three short and easy concertos and two quartets for the flute. Then Cannabich would guarantee at least two well-paying pupils, and Mozart was to have duets for clavier and violin printed by subscription. Wendling offered him board, and he could have free quarters at the house of the chamberlain, Sororius. Mozart was rejoiced at the prospect of being able to remain in Mannheim, and thought he should have enough to do for all winter in composing three concertos, two quartets, four or six clavier duets, besides a grand mass, which he intended to present to the elector. The following day he set himself to find small, cheap lodgings for his mother, which was not an easy matter. It was a satisfaction to Wolfgang's father, who was not surprised that Wendling should seek to retain so excellent a fourth party for the expedition to Paris, to have the state of affairs laid clearly before him. He stipulated only that the journey should not take place during the cold of winter, and thought the plan feasible, provided the Dutchman could be relied on. If not, they must at once proceed to Mayence. But on no account were the mother and son to separate. As long as your mother remains, you must remain with her, he writes, December 18th, 1777. You must not think of leaving your mother to the care of others so long as you and she can be together. The small difference in rent was not worth considering, and it was impossible for her to go home at present. Be most careful to remain with your mother and care for her, even as she has cared for you. It was not only physical care that he had in his mind, but watchfulness over his son's moral and religious behavior. He expresses some anxiety on these points. December 15th. Let me ask you whether Wolfgang has not forgotten to go to confession lately. God before everything. From him alone can we expect earthly happiness and eternal safety. Young people are apt to be impatient when told this. I know it, for I have been young myself. But, God be praised, I never failed to come to myself in time after any youthful folly, to flee from all danger to my soul, and to keep God and my honor, and the dangerous consequences of sin, always before my eyes. His wife reassured him by saying that Wolfgang had confessed at the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and that they had heard Mass regularly on Sundays, though not always on weekdays. Wolfgang justified himself, not without a touch of irritability, December twentieth, 1777. I have written that your last letter gave me great pleasure, and that is true, but one part of it vexed me a little, the question whether I had not somewhat neglected confession. I have nothing to reply to this, except to make you one request, which is, not to think so ill of me again. I am fond of fun, but be assured that I can be serious on occasion. Since I left Salzburg, and even before, 
I have met with people whose speech and actions I should have been ashamed to imitate, although they were ten, twenty, or thirty years older than myself. So I beg you earnestly to have a better opinion of me. Under these circumstances, the offer of Serarius to afford lodging, firing, and light to both mother and son came opportunely. Wolfgang was to give lessons to his daughter in return. The mother was especially pleased at the change, having been somewhat lonely at the hotel during Wolfgang's long absences. They had good beds, careful attendance, and she supped and spent the evenings with her hostess, chatting with her often until eleven o'clock. Wolfgang does not seem to have been particularly struck with the talent of the daughter of the house. Teresa Perignon, who had played the clavier since she was eight years old, he seldom mentions the house nymph. Nevertheless, she practiced one of his concertos and performed it at a large musical party at home, and afterwards she played the third and easiest of his concertos for three claviers at a concert. Before his departure from Mannheim he composed, March eleventh, 1778, a clavier sonata with violin accompaniment for her, 296K. He gave lessons in composition to young Danner, in return for which his mother dined there every day. He himself boarded at Wendling's. Wolfgang, writes his mother, has so much to do with composing and giving lessons that he has no time to pay visits to anybody. So you see that we can comfortably stay here during the winter. And it is all Herr Wendling's doing. He loves Wolfgang as his own son. Wolfgang himself gives his father the following account of his daily life, December twentieth, 1777. We cannot rise before eight o'clock, for our room, being on the ground floor, is not light until half-past eight. Then I dress quickly. At ten o'clock I set to work composing until twelve or half-past, when I go to Wendling's and write a little more until half-past one, when we dine. At three I go to give lessons in gallantry and thorough bass to a Dutch officer, de la Potrie, for which, if I do not mistake, I shall have four ducats for twelve lessons. At four I return home to give a lesson to the daughter of the house, but we never begin before half-past four, because we are waiting for lights. At six I go to Cannabix and teach Mademoiselle Rose. I stay there to supper, and then we talk or play a little, or sometimes I take a book out of my pocket and read, as I used to do at Salzburg. His mother had reason to say that Wolfgang was so busy he did not know which way to turn, and she might well add that her husband could not conceive how highly Wolfgang was esteemed for his music and other things, so that everyone said that he had not his equal, and his compositions were literally idolized. At the same time the father was informed that Wolfgang's beard has to be removed, and on his question as to whether it has been cut, burnt, or shaved off, the answer is duly given. The beard has not been shaved yet, only cut with scissors, but it cannot be done so any more, and next time the barber must be called in. The great musical event which was engrossing public attention at this time was the approaching production of Wieland and Schweitzer's Rosamunda. As the result of flattering overtures made to him during the summer of 1776, Wieland set to work on his text in the spring of 1777. The subject, a curious one to choose for Mannheim, where the elector had many Rosamunds, and the electress took little pains to conceal her chagrin thereat, facts of which Wieland had no suspicion, inspired him with the greatest enthusiasm. This called him to be all the more unpleasantly surprised when Jacobi and Goethe declared the opera a failure and the minister, Hompesch, pressed for a revision of the last act. He wished to withdraw it altogether, although Schweitzer had already composed three acts of great beauty. But Hompesch would on no account consent to this, and he was obliged to undertake the revision. Wieland was far from being satisfied with his own share of the opera, but he declared that Schweitzer had produced a work which would attract people for miles round to hear it. Wieland was invited to assist in person at the production of the opera, dissatisfaction with the work and domestic and economical considerations caused him some hesitation but the wish once more to enjoy music to the full finally prevailed and he looked forward with pleasure to a meeting with old friends jacobi sophie laroche and her daughter and max brentano promised to come to mannheim for the occasion the production of the opera had been first fixed for the fete day of the elector november fourth seventeen seventy seven but owing to the delay caused by the revision it did not appear until January 1778. When all the preparations, the splendid scenery and costumes were completed, Schweitzer came to Mannheim to conduct the final rehearsals himself. 
Mozart, who made his acquaintance at once, found him a good, honest man, but dry and positive, like Michael Hayden, only that his language is more refined. December 3, 1777. There are beautiful things in the new opera, and I doubt not that it will succeed. Alceste was a success, and is not half so fine as Rosamunda. Certainly, its being the first German opera had much to do with the success, and now that the novelty has worn off, it has ceased to make the same impression. The opera was rehearsed daily, and it affords proof of the esteem in which Wolfgang was held by the band that, when Schweitzer was unwell, he had to take his place and conduct the opera with several of the violins at Wendling's, December 18, 1777. Repeated hearing of the opera did not increase Mozart's admiration for it. Wolfgang does not care for the new opera, writes his mother, December 18, 1777. He says there is no nature in it, and much exaggeration, and that it is not well written for the singers. We must wait to see what effect it will produce. He writes himself, December 10, 1777. Rosamunda was rehearsed at the theatre today. It is good, but nothing more. And if it were bad, could it not be performed just the same? End of section 42, chapter 17, part 4. Section 43 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Life of Mozart, by Otto Jan, Section 43, Chapter 17, Part 5. Later on, September 11, 1778, he pities... Aloysia Weber, on account of her poor part in Rosamunda. She has only one song, which might be made something of, but the voice part is a la Schweitzer, like the barking of dogs. She has a kind of rondo in the second act, which allows her to sustain her voice and display it a little. Woe to the vocalist, male or female, who falls into Schweitzer's hands. He will never acquire the art of writing for the voice. The Arrival of Wieland who was esteemed before all German poets at Mannheim, was eagerly looked for by the public, and Wolfgang looked forward to making his acquaintance. Wieland arrived on December 21st, and was equally delighted with his reception by the elector, and with the homage of the populace. Everyone is anxious to have me, and each day is distinguished by something which makes the remembrance of it pleasant, he writes on December 26th, to Sophia La Roche, and to Merck on the following day. I can say nothing more than that I am well both in soul and body, for the reason that I have to play no part but the one natural to me, and that my affairs, so far as it appears, are prospering. God grant that I may not grow too happy among these people, but that is provided against. Mozart was not carried away by the universal enthusiasm for the celebrated poet, and sends his father the following impartial description, December twenty seventh, 1777. I have made the acquaintance of Herr Wieland, but he does not know me as well as I know him, for he has not heard me play yet. He is not at all what I had expected to find him. His speech seems to me somewhat affected. He has a childish voice, a fixed stare, a certain scholar-like bluntness, and yet sometimes a stupid condescension. I am not surprised at anything in his behavior here, whatever it may be in Weimar or elsewhere, for the people look at him as if he had come down from heaven— Everyone yields to him. And there is silence directly he opens his mouth. It is only a pity that he keeps people in suspense so long, for he has a defect in his utterance, and has to speak very slowly, and stop every six words. He is extremely ugly, covered with pockmarks, and with a very long nose. His height is somewhat greater than your own. After Wieland had learnt to know Mozart also, he writes, January tenth, 1778, Herr Wieland, after hearing me twice, is quite enchanted. The last time he paid me all manner of compliments, ending up with, It has been a real happiness to me to meet you here, and a squeeze of the hand. Wieland was delighted with Wendling, and all the preparations for the opera were found satisfactory. The first performance was fixed for January 11, and he hoped to obtain much honor for his Rosamunda in Mannheim, if only the illness of the Elector of Bavaria did not frustrate all his hopes. But this fear was unhappily realized. The elector Maximilian died on December 30th. The intelligence reached Mannheim as Karl Theodore 
was attending a religious service for the new year and the following evening he set out for munich all the festivities came to an end the death of maximilian joseph writes wieland to baron von gebler december fifth seventeen seventy eight has disappointed both myself and the public my opera rosamunda set to admirable music by herr schweitzer was to have been given for the first time on the eleventh and repeated eight times during the carnival i had every prospect of as great a success as perhaps an opera ever had when the death of the elector of bavaria brought about an alteration on the stage of public events the lugubrious decorations of which have quite suppressed mine the opera was rehearsed once more in his honour and then he travelled back to weimar content with the result of his visit though his main object was defeated the change of government had more lasting effects for mannheim and especially for the musicians there than a mere temporary suspension of gaiety the patriotic inhabitants of the palatinate could not indeed believe that their elector would transfer his capital to munich but the prospects of the future were uncertain and alarming owing to the threatening turn taken by political events if mozart had felt himself moved to write german operas in munich the impulse must have been vastly strengthened by his stay in mannheim he had offered his services to the elector with this object when the offer was declined a new prospect was opened to him in vienna with which he acquaints his father january eleventh seventeen seventy eight I know for certain that the emperor is thinking of establishing opera in Vienna, and that he is seeking everywhere for a young Kappelmeister, a German and a genius, who is capable of producing something new. Benda is seeking in Gotha, but Schweitzer has more influence. This would be just the thing for me, well paid, of course. If the emperor gives me one thousand florins, I will write him an opera, and if he does not pay me, it is all the same." pray write to all imaginable friends in vienna that i am in a position to serve the emperor if needs be he may try me with an opera and what he does after i really do not care adieu i hope you will put the affair in motion at once or some one may be beforehand with me l mozart was not the man to let this opportunity slip he applied at once to hufeld who had formerly been well disposed towards them and whose knowledge and influence could be relied upon begging him to exert himself on wolfgang's behalf letters from mesmer pages eighty six and one hundred and forty five had just arrived from vienna asking why wolfgang did not come to vienna where there was always room for true talent he should have board and lodging with him as long as he liked and his friends would see to his interests but the prospects so far as the opera was concerned were not very promising l mozart was of the opinion january twenty ninth seventeen seventy eight that the emperor was like the archbishop he wanted a good thing at a very cheap rate a letter from hufeld was definitive january twenty third seventeen seventy eight it is true that his majesty the emperor to whom his mother has quite resigned the care of the theatre wishes to establish german opera all orders come through the high chamberlain count van rosenberg to the company among whom there is a sort of council for the regulation of the pieces and parts at the opera which is now combined with the national company the additional singers are mademoiselle cavalieri and schindler's daughter married to langen with a bass whose name i forget fuchs to-day was the first rehearsal of the first opera die bergknappen of which herr weidmann has finished the words and herr umlauf who plays the viola in the orchestra the music the performance will take place shortly all this is only an experiment to see if anything can be done with the germans in this line it is certain that no composer will be engaged at present, particularly as Gluck and Salieri are in the Emperor's service. To recommend any one at present would be the surest way to failure, and no advocate can be employed to reach the Emperor's ear, since he arranges everything himself according to his own ideas and inclinations. Everyone knows this, and no one ventures on a proposal or recommendation. His Majesty has sought out Gluck and Salieri, and most of those who are now in his service, in the same way. I could give you several examples of people who have applied indirectly to his majesty and have failed in their suit. The way in which you propose approaching him seems to me far from good, and the reason I decline presenting a petition is my certain conviction that it would be useless, and indeed, prejudicial to your interests. There is another more creditable and more certain way open to first-rate talent, and that is the production of some work, for which there is every opportunity. Let your son take the trouble of setting any good German opera to music, and submitting it to the supreme pleasure of the emperor and then let him wait the event and follow in person if his work is well received 
In this case, indeed, his presence will be necessary. Your son may be without any apprehension with regard to Benda and Schweitzer. I can answer for there being no trouble from that quarter. Their fame is not so great here as elsewhere. Perhaps even Wieland's great opinion of these gentlemen has somewhat abated since his stay at Mannheim. I have a letter of the fifth instant from him, in which he acknowledges to having received altogether new ideas upon music in Mannheim. When this letter reached Mozart, he was in a very excited state, the reason for which will be presently noted, and the effect it produced was greater than mere disappointment. His self-love, which had been raised to so high a pitch by the appreciation of his Mannheim admirers, was wounded by the proposal that he should write a comic opera on approval, like a beginner. Even the condescending good nature of Heufeld, to his dear Wolfgang, increased his annoyance. His father was full of plans and cares for his son's advancement. An opportunity which offered for a settlement in Salzburg was little likely to please Wolfgang. The city had been thrown into consternation on December 21, 1777, by the paralytic seizure of Ad Glaser while he was playing the organ. His death followed the same evening. It soon became clear that Wolfgang's return and application for the vacant post would not be unacceptable to the authorities, and his father informs him of several hints he had received to that effect. January 12, 1778 his Excellency, the Lord High Steward, apprised me that His Serene Highness had commanded him to inquire from Hayden and myself if we knew of a really good organist. He must also be an excellent clavier player, of good appearance and manners, and able to give lessons to the ladies of the court. What, said I, did His Serene Highness mention me? Yes, you in particular, he said, and laughed. I said, I know nobody with all these qualities. If there is such a one in Mannheim, he may make his fortune. But even if his father had been willing to take these hints, Wolfgang would have had no ear for them. With the idea that a longer stay in Mannheim might yet result in a permanent engagement, L. Mozart wrote to the Padre Martini in December 1777, sending him Wolfgang's promised portrait, and begging him to use all his influence with the elector. With his usual good nature, the Padre promised to write to Raff, authorizing him to say to the elector, in his name everything imaginable in Wolfgang's favor, and to praise him according to his deserts. Even if the political situation should operate unfavorably at the moment, the appeal would certainly bear fruit at a future time. No such letter, however, reached Raff from the Padre Martini, but Wolfgang made it the occasion of forming a closer acquaintance with Raff and advancing his own claims. He writes, February 28, 1778, Yesterday I took Raff a song which I had just written for him. The words are, Si al labro mio non credi, bella nemica mia, etc. I do not think they are metastasios. The song pleases him greatly. One has to go carefully to work with a man like this. I selected the words with care, because I knew that he had sung them before, and that they would come easier and more pleasantly to him. I asked him to tell me candidly if he did not care for them or like them, and I would alter the song to his pleasure, or write it over again. Heaven forbid, he said, let the song remain as it is, for it is very fine, only I must beg you to shorten it a little, for I have lost the power now of sustaining my voice so long. Willingly, said I, as much as you please. I took care to make it long, for it is much easier to curtail than to lengthen a song. After he had sung the second part, he took off his spectacles, looked hard at me, and said, Beautiful, beautiful, that is a charming second part, and he sang it three times. When I went away he thanked me cordially, and I assured him in return that I would arrange the song to his satisfaction. I like a song to be fitted to the singer, like a well-made garment. The aria, 295k, without the introductory recitative, has the following words. Si al labro mio non credi, bella nemica mia, aprami i petto i veti, quai se lamante cor. E cordialente afflitto, madonna colpa privo, si pur non è delitto, un innocente ador. The treatment is more strictly orthodox than had latterly been usual with Mozart, apparently out of consideration to the singer. The first part is an elaborate adagio, full of simple melody and fervent expression. The tone of deep sorrow given to the words, a primi il petto, is very impressive, melodious and pleasing, with few passages and those not florid. The second part, Allegretto, 3-8 in G minor, 
is especially rhythmical and original in its harmonies, animated and full of expression. Although the arrangement of this part is not quite in the old style, it has decided individuality, and contrasts so effectively with the adagio, that one can easily understand the delight with which it inspired the old singer. The song does not exceed the compass of and keeps to the position of the tenor voice proper, full opportunity for display being afforded to the singer. The free and finely colored accompaniment never obscures the voice, and the whole song is not inferior to later and better known works. The time had now arrived for the expedition to Paris, and Mozart's anxious father was unsparing in thought and wise counsel. He advised them to prepare in good time for the mother's journey from Mannheim to Ausburg at the beginning of March, and he impressed upon Wolfgang that his stay in Paris was not to be limited by weeks or months, but was to last until he had gained both fame and money. He must therefore wind up all his affairs in Mannheim before he left. His father also gave him circumstantial rules for his guidance in society. He was to avoid intimacies, especially with other composers, such as Gluck, Pacini, and Gretry, whose rivalry might be feared. De la politesse et pas d'autre chose. He was above all to observe the greatest prudence in his dealings with the female sex, who were always on the watch for young men of great talent whom they might dupe and entangle, or even marry. That would be my death, says his father, and he sends him a long list of their patrons during their former stay, whom he was to seek out immediately on his arrival. He is especially assured of the tried friendship of Grimm, and of his own studies and duties. Think daily what you owe to God, who has given you such extraordinary talents. To L. Mozart's astonishment he received a letter from Wolfgang, February 4, 1778, informing him of his intention of giving up the journey to Paris, and of the reasons which had led to this determination. Mama and I have talked it over, and agreed that the life which Wenling leads does not suit me. Wenling is a thoroughly honest, good man, but he and all his household are totally without religion. His daughter's relations to the elector sufficiently prove this. Rom is good at heart, but a libertine. I know myself, and know that I have so much religion that I should never commit an action that I could not proclaim to the whole world, but the mere thought of travelling with people whose way of thinking is so opposed to mine, and to that of all honourable men, frightens me. They may do as they please, but I have no wish to accompany them. I should not have a happy hour. I should never know what I was saying, for, in one word, I have no confidence in them. Friendship without a religious basis is not lasting. I have already given them a little pregusto. I have told them that letters have reached me, of which I can say nothing further than that they interfere with my journey to Paris with them. I may be able to follow, but perhaps I shall have to go elsewhere, and they must not depend on me. The mother corroborates all this, and declares she had never approved of the society of Wenling and Rom, but that she had said nothing, for she was never listened to. In her next letter she asserts that it would certainly be dangerous companionship for Wolfgang, and tells her husband, it is true that Herr Wendling is the best-natured man in the world, but neither he nor his family have any idea of religion, nor care for it. Neither the mother nor the daughter enter a church all the year round, nor do they ever confess nor hear mass, but they are always going to the play. They say church is not healthy. L. Mozart was not a little surprised that his wife and son should so suddenly discover this lack of faith at the end of a long acquaintance. "'You are quite right not to travel in undesirable company,' he answers." February 16, 1778. But you must have been aware of the bad qualities of these men for a long time, and you have had so little confidence in your anxious father that you have never written to ask his advice on the subject, and, shocking, neither has your mother done so. There was not much to be said in answer to this, except that they had allowed themselves to be deceived by the universal praise of Venling and by his really good qualities, and had overlooked his want of religion. End of section 43 Chapter 17, Part 5。Section 44 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1 by Otto Jahn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dorr. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jahn. Section 44, Chapter 17, Part 6 Wolfgang gave his father other reasons against the expedition. 
February 7th, 1778. I have already given you my chief reason for not going with these people to Paris. The second is that I cannot quite see what I should have to do in Paris. My only means of advancement would be lesson-giving, and that work is distasteful to me. I have had a striking example of that here. I might have had two pupils. I went to each of them three times. Then I found one of them out. Consequently, I did not go again. I will gladly give lessons as a favor particularly to anyone who shows genius and a real wish to learn. But to be obliged to go to a house at a certain hour, or to be obliged to wait at home for a pupil is what I cannot do, even if it were to bring me some profit. I leave that to those who can do nothing but play the clavier. I am a composer, a born Kappelmeister. I ought not to bury my talent for composition which a merciful God has so richly bestowed upon me. I may say it without pride, for I feel it now more than ever. And pupils are most distracting to the mind. I would rather, so to speak, neglect the clavier than composition, for the clavier is only a subordinate affair, only, God be praised, a very powerful subordinate. He had said the same to Vendling, and told him that if he would only put something certain in his way he would gladly follow to Paris, especially if it was an opera. Opera writing is my chief idea and object, French rather than German, but Italian rather than either French or German. Vendling and his friends are all of opinion that my compositions would be wonderfully successful in Paris, for as you know I can adapt myself to every sort and style of composition. All things considered, we cannot but feel that Wolfgang's father was justified in writing as follows. February 23rd, 1778. So you intend only to give lessons as a favor, do you? And you mean to leave your old father in his present straits? For a young fellow like you, lesson giving is far too much trouble, even when it is well paid. It is more fitted to your old father to run from house to house for a wretched pittance in order to support himself and his daughter, and to send the little that remains to you instead of paying his debts, and all that you may amuse yourself by giving lessons to some silly girl for nothing. My son, reflect and give ear to your own good sense. Reflect whether you do not deal more hardly with me than our prince himself. God has given you an excellent judgment, and two things only hinder you from employing it on your own affairs. First, a trifle too much of conceit and self-love and secondly, an inclination to be over-confiding and to open your heart to every one you meet. He made him easy as to lesson-giving in Paris. February 16, 1778. In the first place, no one will discharge his master at once in order to take you, and in the second place, no one would venture to engage you, nor should you take any one except a lady now and then, who plays well already, and has a fancy for learning from you, for which she is willing to pay well. Such lady pupils as these will take endless trouble to collect subscriptions for your compositions. The ladies in Paris are omnipotent. They are great amateurs of the clavier, and many of them play extremely well. They would be your best allies for getting commissions, and you will be able, by their help, to make both fame and money with clavier pieces violin quartets, symphonies, and such collections of French songs with the clavier as you lately sent me. Then, at last, you will arrive at an opera. Why do you hesitate? But you always want things done in a moment, before you have been either seen or heard. Look down the long list of our former acquaintances in Paris. They are all, at least the greater number, the best people in the town. They are all most anxious to see you again, and if only six of such persons, nay, a single one would suffice, were to take you by the hand, you might do as you pleased. All this notwithstanding, however, we cannot but feel that Wolfgang's consciousness of his true vocation and his lively protest against any sort of pressure from without did honor to him. 
far more honor than the insinuation of unbelief against his true friend Vendling, to whom he was already deeply indebted. Not that Mozart was insincere. He was a faithful son of his church, but other feelings were at work here, which obscured his judgment. Vendling was inconsolable at Wolfgang's refusal to join the party, and the latter endeavored to persuade himself that motives of personal interest had a share in the regret of his friend. Be it as it may, Vendling and Ram set off for Paris on February 15th, leaving Wolfgang at Mannheim not quite free from compunction. If I thought, he writes to his father, February 14th, 1778, that you were really annoyed about my not going to Paris with them, I should repent having remained here, but, after all, the road to Paris is not closed to me. L. Mozart was not altogether displeased at the turn of affairs. What really angered him was to hear from Wolfgang, February 4, 1778, I am getting on at my ease with the music for Monsignor de Gênes, for which I am to have two hundred florins. I can stay here as long as I like, for neither my board nor lodging cost me anything. His father had warned him before, December 11, 1777. If you examine your conscience, you will find that you have a strong tendency to procrastination. And now he writes, February 12, 1778. I am astonished to hear that you are finishing Monsignor de Gênes' music at your ease. Can it be that you have not already completed it? And you were thinking of leaving Mannheim on the 15th, and have been making expeditions to Kersheim? Well, never mind, only beware that Herr Wendling and Monsignor de Gênes do not play you false, for the proposal was only made with the intention of enabling you to go with them. Let me have an answer by the next post that I may know how the matter stands. The information which Wolfgang furnished, February 14th, 1778, was not consolatory. Herr de Gen, who also goes to Paris tomorrow, has paid me only ninety-six florins, miscalculating the half by four florins, because I had written only two concerti and three quartetti. But he will be obliged to pay me the whole, for I have arranged with Vendling to send the music after them. It is not extraordinary that I should not have been able to finish it. I never have a quiet hour. Night is my only time for writing, for I cannot even get up early. Besides, one is not always in the humor for writing. I could certainly scribble away the whole day, but when a thing is to go forth to the world bearing my name, I am determined that I will not be ashamed of it. You know how stupid I am when I have always to compose for one instrument, and that one which I dislike. I have written other things from time to time for a change, such as a clavier's duets and portions of masses. But now I have set to work in earnest on the clavier duets so that I may have them printed. In a letter from Paris, July twentieth, 1778, he mentions only two quartets for the flute, and October third, 1778, he speaks of the flute concerto, two quartets for flute, violin, viola, and violoncello are known. One of them, Kerschel 281, is inscribed Mannheim il twenty fifth december seventeen seventy seven and must therefore be the same which is mentioned in the letter of december eighteen as being almost finished it is in d major in the usual three movements the middle one an adagio three dash eight being accompanied throughout pizzicato the flute leading the melody the whole piece is easy both in style and composition the flute kept mainly in the foreground and the accompanying parts firmly and skillfully handled without any actual elaboration. The second quartet, Kerschel 298, according to a notice appended by a strange hand to the original manuscript in the Imperial Library at Vienna, was composed in Paris in 1778. It is in A major and begins with variations on a simple theme in which each instrument in succession comes in obligato, then follows a minuet and as a final, a rondeau, the heading of which testifies to Mozart's merry humor. It runs, 
allegretto grazioso ma non troppo presto però non troppo adagio così così con molto garbo ed espressione it is likewise easy in every respect shorter and somewhat fresher than the first movement a flute concerto in d major kershaw three fourteen bears much the same character and was composed for the true philanthropist the indian dutchman it is lively and cheerful without laying claim to deeper significance the accompaniment although kept well in hand betrays in little touches the practised hand of a master an andante in c major for the flute with orchestral accompaniment has also been preserved kershaw three fifteen the original is not dated but the handwriting the mannheim paper and the well-founded assumption that mozart never wrote for the flute except by commission point to this time Furstenau, however remarks that mozart treats the flute with a perfect knowledge of the instrument its technique and easily attained effects nothing is known of the mass on which he was engaged at mannheim unless a detached curie in e flat kershaw three twenty two serious and dignified in expression original and free in treatment may be referred to this period he writes on the twenty eighth february seventeen seventy eight that he has still two clavier sonatas to write but i am not in a hurry with them for they cannot be printed here nothing can be done by subscription it is beggary and the engraver will not take the risk on himself unless i promise him half the profits i would rather have them printed in paris where the publishers are glad of something new and pay capitally and where much also can be done by subscription one of the sonatas kershaw three o four was according to the inscription finished in paris all the six were published there in seventeen seventy eight by sieber and were dedicated to the electress kershaw's three o one to three o six wolfgang's dilatoriness was a hard blow to his father who had counted on the price of these compositions to cover the cost of the mannheim visit and of the journey to paris he saw plainly that he must not only defray these himself but must also provide for the future and he found himself in great perplexity he writes in troubled strain february sixteenth seventeen seventy eight we have tried every means to make you happy and ourselves through you and at least to set your future career on a firm foundation but fate has willed that we should not succeed our last venture has sunk me very low indeed and as you know i am now seven hundred florins in debt knowing not how i am to support myself your mother and sister on my monthly pay not a kreutzer can i hope for from our prince you cannot but see clearly therefore that the future fate of your old parents and of your good devoted sister is in your hands the sister an ever-present witness of the cares and perplexities of her father at a loss to know how the new year's bills were to be met or how he was to procure the new clothes he needed grasped the state of affairs very thoroughly she practised the clavier with redoubled zeal and had made great efforts thoroughly to master thoroughbass and the art of preluding she foresaw that after her father's death her music would be her mother's and her own sole dependence she was deeply grieved at the bad news from wolfgang and had her full share of weeping wolfgang wrote crossly that she should not cry for nothing february nineteenth seventeen seventy eight but he must have felt ashamed of himself when his father's answer to this came february twenty sixth seventeen seventy eight she did not cry over nothing when she cried over your letter but nevertheless she said when she heard that you had not got the two hundred florins thank god that it is no worse although she has considerable interest in the matter and knows that in order to go on helping you her own just claims must be laid aside and why was it the father must have asked himself that wolfgang was so suddenly blind to his own interests and forgetful of his duty to his family it required no great skill in reading between the lines to find the answer in his son's own letters the stay in mannheim influenced his artistic life through the intellectual atmosphere of a capital in which flourished german science and german art but beyond and above this 
it was there that he was seized by the passion which sways the innermost being of man and blunts for the time every other feeling we have seen how susceptible he always was to female charms and how he delighted in intercourse with agreeable women whose attractions often threw a favorable light on his opinion of their musical acquirements now for the first time there awoke in his heart a passionate attachment to a young singer of extraordinary talent the beauty of her voice as it developed under his loving tuition coupled with the unhappy circumstances of her life increased the young man's generous ardor and aroused his lively sympathy aloysia weber the second daughter of a man in a subordinate position at the theatre was fifteen years of age and of great beauty his letters outwardly expressive only of his admiration for her singing are not the less indicative of the state of his heart artistic delight and loving passion are charmingly and unconsciously blended in every sentence the view which it is permitted us to take of the innocent heart of a youth who could feel as warmly and tenderly as he could judge impartially and artistically is the more striking since it helps us to apprehend how much was torn away with this bud destined never to unfold into blossom wolfgang first mentions her in an account of a little professional tour january seventeenth seventeen seventy eight next wednesday i am going for a few days to kirchheim poland to the princess of orange page forty three i have heard so much that is good of her that at last i have decided a dutch officer and my very good friend was dreadfully scolded by her for not bringing me with him when he went to pay his respects at the new year i shall get at least eight louis dieu for she is a great musical amateur and i have had four songs copied for her i shall give her a symphony too for she has a nice little orchestra and gives concerts every day the copying of the songs will not cost me much for it has been done by a certain herr weber who is going over with me he has a daughter of fifteen who sings extremely well with a beautiful pure voice she only wants action to be fit for a prima donna on any stage her father is a good true-hearted german who has brought up his children well which is the reason that the girl is persecuted here he has six children five daughters and one son for fourteen years he supported himself and his family on two hundred florins a year and because he has always faithfully fulfilled his duties and has provided the elector with a first-rate singer he has now actually four hundred florins she sings my song for Demichis with the fearful passages excellently well she is going to sing it at kirchheim poland after his return he narrates the particulars of this holiday trip february second seventeen seventy eight we sent a note at once to the castle and next day the concertmeister rothfischer waited on us in the evening we went to the court it being saturday mademoiselle weber sang three songs i pass over her singing with one word excellent i spoke to you of her merits in my last letter and i shall not be able to close this without saying more as i am now learning to know her better and to appreciate her full powers afterwards we supped at the officers table sunday and monday we dined at court there was no music on sunday evening there never is so that they have only about three hundred musical evenings in the year we might have joined the gaming table but much preferred remaining at home we would willingly have dispensed with the dinner at court since we are never so happy as when alone together but we looked at it from an economical point of view having spent enough already on monday there was music and again on tuesday and wednesday mademoiselle weber sang in all thirteen times and twice played the clavier which she does very well what surprises me most is her correctness only imagine she played my difficult sonata slowly but without missing a note prima vista upon my honor i would rather she played my sonatas than vogler i have played in all twelve times and once by desire on the organ in the lutheran church and i have waited on the princess with four symphonies for all this i have received seven louis d'or in silver money and my poor dear weber five 
Basta! We have lost nothing by it. I have clear forty-two florins profit, and the inexpressible pleasure of having made the acquaintance of true-hearted Catholic and Christian people. Apropos, you must not be surprised that my seventy-seven florins have been reduced to forty-two florins. It was a true pleasure to come together with good, sympathetic people. I could not do otherwise than pay half the expenses, but that will not happen on any other journey. I have said already I shall only pay for myself. Afterwards we stayed five days at Worms, where Herr Weber has a brother-in-law, the dean of the monastery, who stands in fear of Herr Weber's sharp-pointed pen. We were very merry and dined and supped every day with the dean. I can truly say that this little journey has been good practice on the clavier for me. The dean is a very wealthy, sensible man. Now it is time that I conclude. If I were to write all that, I think I should run short of paper. End of section 44 Section 45 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Mozart, Volume 1, by Otto Jan, translated by Pauline D. Towson and others. Section 45. After his return to Mannheim, he devoted almost his whole time to the Webers, and to the musical education of their gifted daughter. He studied with her all the songs which he had brought, and begged his father to send him from Salzburg an aria cantabile, cadenzas, and anything else suitable. Then he procured her an opportunity of being heard. He writes, February 14, 1778, Yesterday Konovic gave a concert, and everything performed, except the first symphony by Konovic himself, was mine. Mademoiselle Rose played my concerto in B-flat, Gershel 238. Then, by way of a change, Herr Ram played, for the fifth time, my oboe concerto for Ferlandi which has made a great sensation here. Ram makes it his cheval de bataille. Afterwards, Mademoiselle Weber sang de Michi's Aria de Bravoura, quite charmingly. Then I played my old concerto in D, Kirchel 175, because it is such a favorite here. Then I improvised for half an hour. And afterwards, Mademoiselle Weber sang, with great applause, Pato Mafretto, Lucia Cilia, Kirchel 135. My overture to the Re Pastore was the finale. He had the satisfaction of hearing from Raff, who certainly never flatters when asked his true opinion. She sang like a professor, not a learner. As an expression of his feelings for Lucia, Wolfgang composed the song, Kirschel 294, which comes more direct from his heart than any other of his compositions. February 28, 1778 I have taken the aria, non so don de vine, etc., as an exercise in composition, just because it has been so beautifully done by Bach, because I know and admire his rendering so much that it is always in my ears. I wanted to try whether, in spite of this, I could not write a song which should not be like Bach's. It is not at all, not in the least like. I intended the song for Raff at first, but the beginning was too high and it pleased me too much to be altered. Besides, the instrumentation seemed to make it more fitted for a soprano. I therefore decided to write the song for Mademoiselle Weber. I laid it aside and set to work on Se al for Raff. But it was of no use. I could write nothing else while the first song was in my head. So I finished it, and set myself to make it exactly suited to Mademoiselle Weber. It is an andante sostenuto, followed by a short recitative, in the middle comes the second part, Nel seno a destrami, then again the sostenuto. When it was finished, I said to Mademoiselle Weber, Learn the song for yourself, sing it according to your own taste, then let me hear it, and I will tell you candidly what pleases me, and what does not please me. In two days she sang it to me, and accompanied herself. I was obliged to acknowledge that she sang it as well as I could wish, and just as I would have had it done. It is the best song which she has, and will gain her applause wherever she sings it. 
This assertion was justified at a concert given by Cannabich, at which Rose Cannabich, Mademoiselle Weber, and Mademoiselle Perron Serrarius, after three rehearsals, played the concerto for three claviers very well. Mademoiselle sang two of my songs, Air Tranquillo, from the Re Pastore, Kirchel 208, and the new one, Non so donde vine. The dear creature did herself and me infinite honor. Everyone said that she surpassed herself in this song. She sang it just as it should be sung. Cannabich called out aloud when it was finished, Bravo, bravissimo maestro, veramente scritta la maestro. This was the first time I had heard it with the instruments. I wish you could have heard it as it was sung then, with such accuracy of taste, such piano and forte. Who knows, you may hear it yet. I hope so. The orchestra have not left off yet praising and talking of the song. And he himself cannot leave off talking of it. Well, I do certainly wish you could hear my new song sung by her. I say by her, for it is just made for her. You, who know what is meant by singing with portamento, would find rare satisfaction in her singing of it. He proceeds to beg his father not to allow the song, which he sends him, to be sung by anyone else, since it was written only for Mademoiselle Weber and fits her like a garment. In truth, this song is very beautiful, the simple and natural expression of what he felt and wished to imply to the singer, original in form and treatment. Strikingly original are the short violin passages between the phrases of the recitative. The chief movement is adagio, cantabile throughout, in its calm, steady progress beautifully expressive of alternate doubt and resolution. A very effective contrast is formed by the animated allegro agitato, which leads back to the adagio in an unexpected but charming manner. The adagio is not simply repeated, but the important points are accentuated, partly by the harmonic treatment, partly by stronger emphasis, and the grouping and connection are varied. The loving care of the composer is displayed again in his management of the orchestra. The stringed instruments are accurate in detail and written with a view to effect. For instance, when the voice in its highest, sharpest tones is accompanied by the violins in a far lower position, the effect is excellent. The second violin part is well thought out, and the accompaniment rich without being overpowering, as wind instruments, the flutes, clarinets, horns, and bassoons, are so combined as to give intensity and brilliancy to the coloring of the whole. They are employed with a full mastery of effect, either alone or in varied combination. The following is the original situation in Metastasio's Olympiad. Glistenes, king of Sion, has doomed to death an unknown youth, as afterwards appears, his son, because he has attempted to assassinate him. But in the act of delivering him to death, he feels himself wonderfully moved by the aspect of the youth, and turns to his confidant with the words, Alcandro, lo confesso, stupisco di me stesso, il vostro, il cligo, la voce di costui nel cor mi desta, un palpito improvviso, che lo risenti in ogni fibra e song, fra tutti i miei pensieri la cangion, ne ricerco e non la trovo, che sarà gusti dei questo ch'io provo, non si donde vine, quel tenero affetto, quel moto, che ignoto, mi nasce nel petto, que gel, che la vine, scorrendo mi va, nel seno a destarmi, si fiereri contrast, non parmi che basti, lo sol da pieta. Mozart describes graphically how the voice and singing of Mademoiselle Weber floated before him, and inspired his composition, but he does not tell us how Mustacio's words, released from their dramatic connection, became the soliloquy of a young heart, feeling with amazement the first stirrings of love, and scarcely venturing to realize the depth and intensity of its passion. For pity is assuredly not enough to excite such expressions of emotion. This was the condition of his own heart, and what he felt himself that he also placed in the heart of his beloved, and, being an artist, on her lips, certainly without analyzing his feelings or hers. The song expresses purely and beautifully the emotions of a maiden who stands in doubt and perplexity at the innocent impulses of her heart, incomprehensible even to herself. 
but her budding inclination has not yet become a dominant passion, and she feels that she stands at the turning point of her whole existence. There reposes, therefore, on the whole song the calmness and purity of innocence, together with intense warmth and deep agitation, and Mozart has lent to these emotions the inexpressible charm of melody. The charm is not broken by the occurrence of sharper discords than are usual with Mozart, but they are both appropriately placed and in full harmony with the tone of the whole. The song gives a favorable indication of the powers of the singer. The style is simple and sustained throughout, varied by original and expressive embellishments, and at the close by a couple of quick runs going up to... It excites no small astonishment to find such capabilities of voice, execution, and delivery in a girl of fifteen. Mozart composed the same song again for the bass singer Fischer in March 1787, Kirchhoff 512. The construction of the song is, as the words require, the same, but the treatment is as different as possible. This time, the true sense of the dramatic situation is grasped. A man, a ruler, who has a long life's experience behind him, feels his strong mind moved to a tenderness which he cannot understand, and which therefore troubles him. He seeks to resist it, but falls ever again under its irresistible sway. The sense of surprise and passionate resistance is powerfully rendered, and many passages, Quel gel che sorrendo la vine mi va, for instance, are of wonderful power and beauty. In fact, the song presupposes the union of strength and softness, flexibility of voice and cultivated delivery, which existed to perfection in Fisher. It might be said as truly of him as of Mademoiselle Weber, that the song fitted him like a garment. Mozart's change of determination with regard to the Parisian journey is easily explained by the light of his love for Mademoiselle Weber, though he was far from acknowledging this, even to himself. No doubt he was sincere in writing to his father, February 4th, 1778, It is out of the question for me to travel with a man who leads a life of which the youngest among us would be ashamed, and the thought of assisting a poor family without doing harm to myself pleases me to the very depths of my soul. He longed ardently to liberate the Weber family from their trying position, but love for his Alicia was the most powerful, although the secret, motive. The direction of his thoughts may be gathered from his remarks on the wealthy marriage made by his friend Herr von Scheidenhofen, February 7, 1778, it is a mercenary marriage, and nothing further. I could not marry in that way. I should like to make my wife happy, and not expect to make my fortune through her. So I will let it alone for the present, and enjoy my freedom, until I can afford to support a wife and family. It was necessary for Herr von Scheidenhofen to choose a rich wife for the sake of his title. The nobility could never marry from inclination or love, but only from interest and various considerations. It would not become such high personages to love their wives when once they have brought into the world a fat little son and heir. But we poor common folk, not only may we take a wife whom we love, and who loves us, but we ought, can, and will take such a one, for we are not nobly born, autocratic or rich, but lowly, mean, and poor. And so, not needing a rich wife, our wealth dies with us, for it is in our brains, and no one can take it from us, unless he cut off our head, and then we should not want anything more. The father must have shaken his head at this diatribe. Wolfgang's wish, at least, to live in the neighborhood of Alicia, until he could call her his own, was joined to his irresistible impulse to compose operas. In order to attain both these ends, he had conceived a project which would, he supposed, be of equal advantage to her family, and his own. The Webers were quite ready to fall in with what was clearly to their advantage, and it only remained to obtain the consent of Wolfgang's father to his remaining in Mannheim and completing the compositions he had undertaken. At the same time, Herr Weber will be exerting himself to get concert engagements for himself and me. We shall travel together, too. Traveling with him will be just the same as traveling with you. In fact, the reason I like him so much is that, excepting in appearance, he resembles you entirely. His temper and turn of mind are identical with yours. If my mother were not, as you know, adverse to much writing, she would say the same thing. I must acknowledge that I enjoyed traveling with the Webers. We were happy together, and merry, and I had the satisfaction of conversing with a man like yourself. I had no need to trouble myself about anything. If anything was torn, I found it mended. In fact, I was treated like a prince. This oppressed family has become so dear to me that it is my greatest wish to make them happy. 
which is perhaps in my power. My advice is that they should go to Italy. You would be doing me a great favor if you would write as soon as possible to our good friend Lugiati and inquire from him as to what is the greatest sum paid to a prima donna in Verona. The higher the better, for it is easy to lower one's terms, and perhaps she could get a better engagement afterwards in Venice. I will stake my life on her singing, and I know that she does me honor. She has profited much in my instruction, even in this short time, and I have not much doubt as to her acting powers. If all this takes place, we, that is, Monsieur Weber, his two daughters, and I, shall have the honor of paying a passing visit in a fortnight or so to my dear father and my dear sister, and my sister will find a friend and companion. She enjoys the same reputation here on account of her good bringing up as my sister does in Salzburg. Her father is respected as mine is, and the whole family is like the Mozart family. This arouses envy in the same way, of course, but when it comes to the point the most envious are obliged to speak the truth, honesty is the best policy. I cannot tell you how pleased I should be to bring them to Salzburg, only that you might hear her. She sings my songs written for De Amicus, the Bravrora songs, as well as Pato Me Fretto and Dalla Sponda Taborosa, quite superbly. I beg that you will do your best to help us to go to Italy. You know my greatest ambition, to write operas. I would gladly write an opera for thirty sequins at Verona that she might gain reputation by it, for if I had not written it, I fear she would be sacrificed. In the meantime, I shall make so much money by the expeditions I shall make with them that I shall not be in any way injured. I think we shall go to Switzerland, perhaps also to Holland. Write to me soon about it. If it all comes to pass, the other daughter, who was the elder, will be very useful, for she cooks well, and we can keep house for ourselves. I only beg you not to delay answering me. Do not forget my wish to write operas. I am jealous of every one who writes one. I would weep for vexation when I hear or see an aria. But Italian, not German. Sararia, not buffa. Now I have laid open my whole heart to you, and my mother is quite of my way of thinking. I kiss your hand a thousand times, and am, till death, your obedient son. In a later letter, he repeats his pressing request. February 14th, 1778. I earnestly entreat you to do what you can for Weber. I have his success very much at heart, a man and his wife, five children, and an income of 450 florins. Remember my request to go to Italy, and also about myself. You know my ambition and my passion. I hope it will all go right. I put my trust in God, and he will not forsake me. Now farewell, and do not forget my earnest petition and recommendation. End of section 45 Recording by Todd Section 46 of The Life of Mozart, Volume 1 by Otto Jan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katrina Huang. The Life of Mozart by Otto Jan. Translated by Pauline D. Townsend and others. Section 46. Chapter 17, Part 8. Wolfgang's mother was not quite so much of his opinion as he imagined. This is apparent from her postscript, which shows also that she was entirely without influence over her son. My dear husband, you will perceive from this letter that when Wolfgang makes a new friendship, he is ready to sacrifice his life and all he holds dear for the object of it. It is true that she sings divinely, but one should never so entirely set aside one's own interests. I have never approved of the companionship with Wendling and Rom, but I dared not make any objection, and I am never listened to but as soon as he knew the Webbers, he altered his mind altogether. In fact, he prefers being with other people to being with me. I object to this thing and that which does not please me, and that annoys him. So you must decide for yourself what is to be done. I write this in the greatest secrecy while he is dining. And what said the father? 
the letter was a greater blow than any which had yet befallen him and wolfgang's romantic project almost bereaved him of reason he did not indeed doubt that much persuasion had been brought to bear on wolfgang to induce him to prefer a vagabond life to the fame which could be acquired in a city so celebrated and so ready to welcome true talent as mannheim but he was horrified to find that the influence of strangers could so deprive him of consideration for himself and others your kind heart leads you to see no fault in any man who praises you loudly and exalts you to the skies and to bestow all your love and confidence on him when you were a child on the contrary your modesty was so excessive that you wept when you were openly praised sharp remedies seemed in this case necessary and these l mozart applies with all the authority of an experienced man and the severity of a conscientious father he lays before his son in an exhaustive letter how far he has hitherto been from attaining the main object of his journey and how much he is in danger of forgetting his duty to his family and himself for the gratification of a senseless passion it was not difficult to show that the idea was immature and impracticable to produce a young girl who had never sung in public nor appeared on the stage before an italian public which would be certain to condemn her even if she sang like a gabrielli herself l mozart goes on to show how with war threatening the present was not the time for a professional tour and how a wandering life with a stranger and his daughters would deprive him of his reputation ruin his prospects and bring disgrace on his family it lies now in your own power alone to raise yourself to as high a position as a musician has ever attained you owe all to the extraordinary talent bestowed upon you by the all-gracious god and it depends upon your own sense and behavior whether you become an ordinary musician forgotten by the world or a celebrated kapellmeister whose fame shall be handed down to posterity in books whether you heard all together in a room full of squalling brats on a heap of straw or spend a christian life full of honor pleasure and profit and die respected by all the world leaving your family well provided for l mozart felt that immediate action was necessary all his former objection to the journey to paris vanished before the necessity of extricating his son from his present dangerous entanglement away with you to paris and that soon he cried put yourself at the side of great man out kaiser out nihil the mere thought of seeing paris should have preserved you from all passing distractions the name and fame of a man of great talent goes through all the world from paris the company of vendeling and rom was not as important to him as he was to them but his mother must go with him in order to arrange everything properly they were not to limit their stay to a few months but were to remain as long as was necessary to gain renown and money the more so since paris was the safest place to live in during war hard as it was upon him the father undertook to provide money and letters of credit for the journey in making this appeal to the conscience the ambition and the better judgment of his son l mozart was wise enough not to allude directly to his attachment to aloysia weber although he must have been well aware of its existence wolfgang had not openly expressed it and his father was careful not to oppose a sentiment which was invincible because inaccessible to reason but as a proof that he was not indifferent to the misfortunes of those with whom wolfgang had so much sympathy he did not withhold the advice for which he had been asked the man who could best help them was raff 
wolfgang should endeavor to interest him in mademoiselle weber and his influence would be all-powerful with the impressa he further advised that she should make her debut on the mannheim stage were it only for the sake of practice the effect of this letter was what he anticipated wolfgang was brought to the knowledge of the fact that he has nearer duties to fulfil to which his dreams and aspirations after an uncertain future must give way he yielded with a heavy heart but with childlike submission to his father's will and answered february nineteenth seventeen seventy eight i always anticipated that you would be against the journey with the webbers for i never seriously entertained the idea myself that is under our present circumstances but i had given my word that i would write to you about it herr weber does not know how we stand i have told no one and so because i wanted to be free from care for any one and to be happy together i forgot the present impossibility of the affair and also to inform you of my true opinion of it what you say concerning mademoiselle weber is all true and as i wrote before i know as well as you do that she is too young and wants the power of acting and should therefore recite in the theatre as often as possible but one has to proceed cautiously with some people the good webbers are as tired of being here as some one else you know was elsewhere and they are inclined to think everything possible i had promised them to write to my father but even before my letter had reached salzburg i had been advising them to be patient that she was a little too young etc they take everything well from me for they have a high opinion of me the father has spoken by my advice to madame toscany an actress about giving his daughter instruction in acting all that you say of mademoiselle weber is true except one thing that she sings like a gabrielli i should be very sorry if she did every one who has heard gabrielli says she was nothing but a passage and roulade maker in a word that she sang with art but no understanding page one thirty five but mademoiselle weber sings from her heart and cantabile by preference i am now making her sing passages in the great aria because it is necessary if she goes to italy that she should sing bravura songs she will not forget her cantabile because it comes natural to her now you know all and i recommend her to you with my whole heart but it was a hard struggle that he had to make with himself it affected his health and he was for several days confined to his room his father's warnings had struck chords in his innermost being which vibrated painfully the thought of having forfeited his father's full confidence rendered him inconsolable believe whatever you please of me only not that i am wicked there are people who believe it is impossible to love a poor girl without having evil intentions i am no brunetti and no miss Levesque. i am a mozart a young but an honourable mozart gradually however his loving trust in his father regained its old supremacy god first and then papa that was my motto as a child and i am true to it still he and his mother began to prepare in earnest for their departure and the father was ready with instructions and good advice nor did he withhold the parental blessing from his well-loved son how deeply i feel the wider separation that is about to take place between us you can partly imagine but i cannot expect you to feel the intensity with which it oppresses me if you will only reflect seriously on all that i did for you two children in your early years you will not certainly accuse me of timidity but you will do me the justice to acknowledge that i am and always have been a man with courage to venture anything 
at the same time i used all possible prudence and foresight against accidents no one can provide for god alone sees into the future i have not my dear wolfgang the least mistrust in you on the contrary i have perfect confidence and hope in your filial love everything now depends on the sound understanding which you certainly possess if you will only listen to it and upon fortunate circumstances these last are not to be controlled but i hope and pray that you will always take counsel of your understanding you are now about to enter a new world and you must not believe that i am prejudiced in considering paris so dangerous a place all contraire my own experience gives me no cause to think it at all dangerous but the circumstances of my former and your present stay there are as widely asunder as heaven and earth after explaining this in more detail and giving wolfgang minute directions as to the position he should take in paris l mozart concludes with these words i know that you look upon me not only as your father but as your truest and firmest friend and that you are well aware that our happiness and misery nay more my long life or speedy death are under god so to speak in your hands if i know you are right i have nothing to look forward to but that pleasure which will be my only consolation in your absence and i must resign myself to neither seeing hearing nor embracing you live like a good catholic christian love god and fear him pray to him sincerely and devoutly and let your conduct be such that should i never see you again my deathbed may be free from anxiety from my heart i bless you and remain till death your loving father and firmest friend it was only when mozart's departure from mannheim drew very near that the loss on both sides was fully realized the farewell concerts which he arranged as displays for himself his compositions and his pupils impressed his extraordinary talents on the public mind regrets at his departure were heard on all sides not only from musicians but from all men of cultivation who had the fame of mannheim at heart among them the author of the deutsche hausvater march twenty fourth seventeen seventy eight before leaving mannheim i made copies for herr von gemmingen of the quartet eighty k which i wrote that evening in the inn at lodi also of the quintet one seventy four k and of the fisher variations one seventy nine k he wrote me an extremely polite note expressing his pleasure at the remembrance and sent me a letter to his very good friend herr von zickingen adding i am well assured that you will do more to recommend this letter than it can possibly do to recommend you and he sent me three louis d'or to cover the cost of copying the music he assured me of his friendship and begged for mine in return i must say that all the cavaliers who knew me the court councillors chamberlains court musicians and other good people were vexed and disappointed at my leaving there is no mistake about that he was in some degree consoled by the prospect of finding opportunities for a composition in paris february twenty eighth seventeen seventy eight what i chiefly look forward to in paris is the conseil spirituel for which i shall probably have to write something the orchestra is so good and strong and my most favorite compositions choruses can be well performed there i am very glad that the parisians are so fond of them the only fault that was found with piccini's new opera roland was that the choruses were weak and poor and the music altogether a little 
monotonous otherwise it was very well received the parisians were accustomed to gluck's choruses rely upon me i shall do all that is in my power to bring honor to the name of mozart i am not afraid the parting from mademoiselle weber had still to be gone through he describes it candidly to his father march twenty fourth seventeen seventy eight Mademoiselle Weber very kindly netted me a purse as a remembrance and small acknowledgment of my services. Her father copied all that I wanted for me and gave me some music paper and Moliere's comedies, which he knew I had not read, with the inscription, Ricevi, amico, le opere del Moliere e signor di gratitudine e qualche volta ricordati di me when he was alone with mamma he said we are losing our best friend our benefactor yes there is no doubt that your son has done much for my daughter and has interested himself in her so that she cannot be grateful enough to him the day before i left they wanted me to sup with them but i could not be away from home so refused but i was obliged to spend a couple of hours before supper with them and they never left off thanking me and wishing they were in a position to testify their gratitude when at last i went away they all wept it is very foolish but the tears come in my eyes whenever i think of it he went down the steps with me and stood at the house door till i had turned the corner when he called for the last time adieu this time the father painted no leave-taking on the quoits but thanked god in his heart that his son had escaped a great danger wolfgang did not openly declare that his love for mademoiselle weber was heartfelt and sincere and that he believed it to be returned that he went forth with the full determination of winning a position and being able to call her his own but he was little careful to conceal these hopes from his father as to hide from him the correspondence which he carried on with the webbers the father with full confidence in the honourable character of his son was content to leave this connection to the future so soon as he saw the first step assured in wolfgang's professional career our glance must needs linger with approbation on the picture of a youth glowing with ardent passion yet with self-mastery enough to listen to the first warning of his good and wise father and so sure of the constancy of his feelings as to be willing to yield his warmest wishes to the fulfilment of his moral duties in the love and confidence existing between father and son we rejoice to acknowledge the best and truest ornament of a german artist life end of section forty six chapter seventeen part eight end of the life of mozart volume one by otto jan translated by pauline d townsend and others